Today, the head of the General Services Administration answered questions about allegations of improper conduct. The GSA is an independent agency in the U.S. government created to help manage and support federal agencies. This House Oversight and Government Reform Committee hearing is about four and a half hours. Meeting of the committee will please come to order. Today's hearing has been called to investigate allegations of misconduct at the General Services Administration. There are probably plenty of Americans who have never heard of GSA, but it is the government's premier contracting agency. It focuses on the nuts and bolts of government's logistics. GSA manages nearly $500 billion in federal assets, including federal buildings, courthouses, and other facilities. And it handles the purchase of billions of dollars worth of services on behalf of other government agencies. The administrator of GSA is Loretta A. Doan, and she is with us today. Also with us is Brian Miller, the Inspector General of GSA, and we're pleased to have as well Senator Charles Grassley, who has been following these issues closely, joining us as well. We welcome all three witnesses and look forward to their testimony. One of Congress's most important oversight goals is to ensure that our government serves the interest of the American taxpayer, not the interest of favorite contractors, a particular federal agency, or a single political party. The American people expect government officials to uphold a public trust. That's what the taxpayers are paying them for and nothing else. Over the past several months, however, multiple allegations have surfaced about actions by top GSA officials that do not serve the interests of the taxpayers. These are the allegations we will investigate today. The first issue we will examine is a political briefing that took place at GSA on January 26th of this year. This briefing was conducted by Scott Jennings, Carl Rove's deputy at the White House. Mr. Jennings has been in the news for his involvement in the firing of the U.S. attorneys and is one of the White House officials that both the House and Senate have asked to testify. Also at this briefing were Administrator Doan and 40 other political appointees at GSA, some of whom participated by video conference. The briefing was held in GSA facilities during the workday but there were no career GSA officials allowed at the briefing. We have obtained the PowerPoint presentation that Mr. Jennings gave to the GSA officials that day. This is the White House Office of Political Affairs. It would be perfectly appropriate for a meeting at the Republican National Committee or with campaign operatives, but it's the last thing taxpayers would expect at a government agency like GSA. Here's uh, one of the slides. I think we have it uh, on the screen. And this is from Mr. Jennings' presentation. In this slide, Mr. Jennings identified by name the 20 Democratic members in the House that the White House is targeting for defeat in 2008. And we have another slide. This one identifies by name 20 Republican members that the White House considers most vulnerable in the upcoming election. The White House briefing was partisan. It was strategic. And it had absolutely no connection with GAA, GSA's government mission. And when the White House presentation was over, Ms. Doan asked her staff, how can we help our candidates in the next election? Well, here are the facts as we know them. One, GSA's top political appointees were assembled to hear a confidential White House briefing on the Republican campaign strategy for 2008. Two, they were asked to consider how GSA resources could be used to help Republican candidates. And three, they did this in a federal building during work hours at taxpayer expense. This appears to be a textbook example of what should never happen at a federal agency. 
Unfortunately, the January 26 briefing may not be the only example of politicization of the government's pre premier procurement agency. Inspector General Miller will testify today that GSA's Administrator Doan and her, sta her top staff intervened in a contract with Sun Microsystems to reverse the judgment of three career contract officers. According to the Inspector General, the Administrator's personal intervention resulted in a sweetheart deal for Sun Microsystems that will cost taxpayers tens of millions of dollars. I want to read one a sentence about the Sun contract from the Inspector General's testimony. Quote, as a direct consequence of her intervention and in breach of GSA's fiduciary duty to the U.S. taxpayers, the pricing concessions made to Sun means that the U.S. taxpayers will inevitably pay more than they should, end quote. That's a remarkable finding. But it appears to be corroborated by evidence received by our committee, including the statements of contracting officers involved in the negotiations. Perhaps even more disturbing, the information we received appears to directly contradict statements that Ms. Doan made to Senator Grassley about her involvement in the Sun contract. Ms. Doan wrote Senator Grassley that, and I quote, I had no knowledge of the negotiations or basis for decisions me made regarding this contract, end quote. But as will become apparent today, there is a written record documenting Ms. Doan's personal involvement in reversing the position of career contracting officials. A third issue we will explore is the no-bid contract that Ms. Doan gave to her former business associate and friend, Edie Fraser. According to the Inspector General, this is a serious violation. In his testimony, he states, we are talking about the violation of a key contracting principle, promoting open comp competition and avoiding any appearance of personal favoritism in awarding government business by the leader of government's premier civilian contracting agency. On this issue, too, there is a troubling question about Ms. Doan's candor. The Inspector General found, and again I quote, the record paints quite a different picture than what Administrator Do Doan told the OIG investigators, end quote. In our own investigation, we also found that striking discrepancies between the assertions of Ms. Doan and the evidence we gathered. Well, there are a number of documents that I'd like to make part of this hearing record. These documents include the White House PowerPoint presentation, the briefing memos prepared by the staff, the documents citing in, cited in the briefing memos, the transcripts and depositions the committee has received, the audit and investigative reports provided to the committee by the Inspector General, and the documents that members will be referring to today in their questioning. Without objection, they'll be part of the remainder of the record. There is a common thread that ties together the allegations we will be exploring today. There are basic rules that are supposed to apply to federal officials. You can't engage in partisan politics while you're on government time. You can't give no-bid contracts to your friends and business partners. And you should put the taxpayers first when negotiating contracts. The question the committee needs to examine is whether Ms. Doan and her team at GSA violated these bedrock principles. American, Americans want a government that works. They don't want basic government services politicized, and they don't want their tax dollars squandered. Today we'll have an opportunity to explore how well Ms. Doan is meeting the standards at GSA. I want to now recognize Mr. Davis for his opening statements, and then we will proceed right to the witnesses. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know how much I respect you and how much I value our work together. But your description of this investigation brings to mind what Mark Twain said about flawed science. One gets such wholesome returns of conjecture out of such a trifling investment of fact. For that is what we are dealing with today, accusatory conjecture based on the selective and biased interpretation of very few facts. The title of today's hearing pretty much says it all, allegations of misconduct at the General Services Administration, not facts not findings, not even credible complaints, 
just allegations picked up from hostile media reports based on unvetted sources. And we'll see at the end of the day these allegations will still be, as the dictionary defines the term, assertions unsupported and by implication regarded as unsupportable. Sadly, this hearing represents the fullest expression yet of the modus operandi adopted by the new majority. Citing yesterday's news clips, release an accusatory conclusory inquiry letter. Through amplification and repetition of mere allegations, seek a conviction in the court of public opinion and call a hearing. First the verdict, then the trial. This process renders hollow the promise of collegiality and consultation with the minority. Only after the facts are we told witnesses have been threatened with subpoenas unless they submit coercive transcribed interviews never anticipated by committee rules. And these non-deposition depositions, the prior notice and other procedural protections otherwise due to witnesses in the minority can be ignored. Future witnesses be advised. When the committee expresses their hope to proceed without a subpoena, volunteer for a deposition. That way we'll all have time to prepare and we'll all know how and when the transcript can be used to support official committee business. In this case, the committee has expended significant resources searching for anything to support their a priori conclusions but they found virtually nothing. We received and reviewed over 14,000 pages of documents from the General Services Administration. Without consultation with the minority staff or the ranking member, the majority staff, largely through the threat of subpoena, conducted 14 transcribed interviews securing the voluntary attendance of current and former GSA officials from as far away as Boston and Denver. Two GSA officials flew from Boston to Washington, D.C. for interviews regarding the Hatch Act violations. The Boston officials were questioned for as little as 30 minutes in one instance and 40 in another. No reason was supplied why these interviews couldn't take place telephonically. Agency counsel was not permitted to be present at these interviews. Personal counsel was said to be permitted. However, four witnesses stated for the record they were not told they were permitted to retain personal counsel for these transcribed interviews. Nevertheless, one interviewee did bring personal counsel. Not surprisingly, this flawed process has produced an equally flawed product. As discussions at length in the staff report we are releasing today, the accusations leveled against the GSA Administrator, Mrs. Loretta Doan, are either flat out wrong or based on a distorted and myopic view of the management responsibilities of the head of a major Federal aid agency. And I would ask unanimous consent at this point that our minority uh, report to our members be included in the record. Without objection, we will put it in the record. Loretta Doan is a talented, motivated professional. Born in New Orleans, she was one of the first African-American children to integrate the city's private schools. She was only seven. That first day, she was knocked down, kicked, and hit with a brick. But she persisted. She earned her undergraduate degree from Vassar and a master's degree in Renaissance literature from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. A self-described unabashed entrepreneur, she started a successful technology business which she sold before entering public service. She and her husband of 22 years have two daughters. Perhaps the saddest, most reprehensible aspect of this defective oversight was the attempt to drag one of Mrs. Doan's daughters into the web of circumstances being spun to ensnare her mother. That a business friend of Ms. Stone provided her daughter a reference for an unpaid Capitol Hill internship application is offered as evidence to support alleged misconduct in dealings between two professional women years later. It is as implausible as it is inappropriate. Even the IG report refers to that. It is it, it, it's, it's just sad and it shows how, bad, how low this has gone. The breathlessly described no-bid contract hardly turned out to be the elaborate scheme to enrich an acquaintance alleged by the majority. We found only that Administrator Doan wanted very much to acquire a study of GSA's use of small businesses, particularly those owned by minorities and women. It is a topic about which she knows much and cares deeply. She was understandably embarrassed and dismayed that the agency she just took over had received an F from the Small Business Administration for small and minority business utilization. She was determined to improve GSA's image and score. The evidence supports the conclusion her motives were clear, if her methods a bit overzealous. She wanted to engage the services of a well-regarded diversity consulting firm, Diversity Best Practices, to help fix the problem. The administrator erroneously believed that she had the authority to acquire these services for $20,000 on an expedited sole source basis. When she learned otherwise, the arrangement was called off, no work was ever performed, no money changed hands. She has expressed regret that it happened, but continues, as is her way, 
to advocate forcefully to improve GSA outreach to small minority and women-owned businesses. With regard to the contract extension to Sun Microsystems, there is simply no evidence to support the allegation that Ms. Doan acted improperly. Ms. Doan never spoke to or pressured any of the contracting officers to exercise the Sun uh, option. In the end, the contract extension terms were judged by the contracting officer to be fair and reasonable. Similarly, there is no evidence to support the allegation that she intervened in the suspension and debarment process. She merely asked her chief of staff for a briefing on a matter which could have resulted in a government-wide prohibition against awarding any contracts to most of the major national accounting firms. Can you imagine debarring the big four accounting firms from doing business with the government without the administrator even knowing? That is the alternative. Such an inquiry was ordinary and appropriate. It would have been negligent not to be apprised about the ramifications of so significant an action. And I sat up here several months ago when we were going over security clearances and the deputy head of OMB said he wasn't informed about it and we gave him the devil for not being informed of what was going on underneath him. We expect people to at least know what is going on beneath him. The agency suspension debarment official stated, at no time did I receive any direct or indirect instruction or comment from the Office of the Administrator. He said he processed and concluded the matter as directed by the factual record in accordance with the prescribed process. Then there is the alleged Hatch Act violations. It appears that on January 26, 2007, remember that date, at the conclusion of a staff luncheon, this is during lunch, attended by GSA political appointees, called by the administration, this is not Mrs. Doan's meeting, this was a meeting called by the administration, something they routinely do in executive agencies. Mrs. Doan didn't put out the White House political affairs home, she just simply attended the meeting. The administrator made an offhand comment about helping our candidates. That comment has somehow been connected to other conversations about inviting public officials to GSA building dedications, efforts to invite Speaker Pelosi to an event in her district, and to include Senator Mel Martinez in a similar event in his home state of Florida are anecdotally relayed, not that she said anything, relayed as evidence of prohibited partisan activity on Federal property. Such comments may be impolitic, but several factual realities defeat the effort to make them evidence of unlawful political activities. What candidates? What election? In January of this year, neither Representative Pelosi nor Senator Martinez was a candidate for any public office. No other candidates are mentioned. Based on the evidence before us, the only politics at GSA appear to be intramural, and it is a tough sport. Administrator Doan has, done, has had some disagreements with the GSA Inspector General. She thought him needlessly adversarial in assessing the inevitability of the uh, subjective judgments of contract officers. That, it seems, is where her problems began. The IG, a former Federal prosecutor, takes issue, often publicly, with current GSA leadership on the reach and role of his office. That is his right. But the statement provided to the committee by the IG for today's hearing is an extraordinary narrative. Apparently, hell hath no fury like an IG scorned. Rather than audit results or investigative findings, he brings us anecdotes, conjecture, innuendo and invective to impugn the judgment and character of the GSA administrator. His statement mischaracterizes information provided to this committee, and it appears his office provided information to the majority and others that was not made available to us. We will have more than a few questions for the IG today. Finally, I want to bring to the committee's attention an email that was sent last night by Mrs. Shauna Budd, the GSA contract officer uh, who finalized the Sun Microsystems contract extension. She takes issue with the majority's attacks on her integrity and her work. And it is important for members and the public to understand the demoralizing professional and personal toll of the investigative tactics being used by the majority in this instance. This was an unsolicited email. This wasn't under threat of subpoena from us. This is an unsolicited email that came in last night from a GS-13 career civil servant doing her best for the government. It is the kind of professionals we want in to serve in government. Here is what it says. Pat, have you seen this? My words and sentiments have been twisted so badly that it is to the point where they are making false statements about what I said. The author of this memorandum, meaning the majority's memorandum, is committing a crime by handpicking small phrases and comments out of the broader context of the interview, which obviously destroys the reader's ability to comprehend the true meaning of my statements. The author is dramatically twisting my words for the purpose of meeting his ends. I am astonished. I am dumbfounded. This is destroying my well-deserved good name and reputation. It is also attacking my ethics, procurement integrity and business judgment, all of which are upstanding and highly regarded. It seems to me I would be well served in consulting with a private attorney in order to protect the previously mentioned assets, which are priceless. 
how very, very disturbing that something like this can happen in this country that I love and believe in. I am an honest citizen and hardworking, talented professional who has dedicated my life to civil service in dedication to the American people. I possess impeccable procurement integrity and excellent business judgment. I remain immensely proud of the work I did on the Sun Microsystems contract because I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that every action I took was in the best interest of the government and the American taxpayers, of which I am one. To think that actual Congress people would level these charges against me brings tears to my eyes and a squeeze of my heart. It is shattering my image of the American electorate as people who stand up for what is right, do the right thing, and most certainly protect honest, conscientious public servants. I lived in Northern Virginia for many years, and the U.S. Capitol was always my favorite place to take visitors. <laughs> to take visitors I love what I thought I stood for. Now I don't know what I still think. Next time I see it. Who would have thought that doing my job, going the extra mile and taking a stand for what is right would lead to this? I am honored and proud to serve my country in the capacity of contracting officer. I am proud of the warrant that hangs on my wall. And I am supremely confident that I perform my job with utmost integrity in an honorable, truthful, level-headed, sensible, quality-oriented, professional manner that serves the public very well. This is unjust and unfair. How ironic that the very people who are accusing me of having poor integrity are themselves the ones who possess poor integrity. I believe that there is a term for this very behavior used by mental health professionals. It is called psychology projection. The encyclopedia defines it as follows. Psychology projection or projection bias is a defense mechanism in which one attributes, projects to others one's own unacceptable or unwanted thoughts and or emotions. Projections reduces anxiety by allowing the expression of the unwanted subconscious impulses and desires without letting the ego recognize them. And it is time for the con Congressional Committee to do its job right and they can start by not attacking good people. I will not just sit back and accept these unjust and undeserved insults. I will fight this to the bitter end for myself and for every average honest American citizen. Shauna Budd, Contracting Officer, GSA Region 8, Denver Federal Center. And let me just ask, we got her permission uh, to read this in the record. She's not a Schedule C. She's a career professional. And um, uh, you know, I look forward to today's hearing and the asking Administrator Doan to allow to, to clear her name and reputation as well. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, we will let the facts for, speak for themselves. I do want to point out that uh, Shanna Budd's testimony in her interview will be made public and people can see what she said in that interview and then judge whether uh, her comments in the email are justified. Let me also just point out two other procedural things without getting into the facts. One, we issued no subpoenas. If people came and volunteered to talk to us because they knew we might issue subpoenas, well, that is just the way it works. But we did not issue any subpoenas. And secondly, the Republican staffs were present at every interview. So uh, keep that in mind as well. We are pleased now to have with us uh, Senator Grassley. We are delighted you took the time to come from the other side of the Capitol because of, of your involvement in this issue. And we welcome you here today. We are eager to hear uh, what you have to say about the matter because I know you have been involved in this question far longer than any of us. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just a point before we get to Senator Grassley. Are we doing opening statements? Uh, no, we are not going to do opening statements. We have the witnesses and then we will proceed right to the question. So there will be no opportunity for any of the members to, uh, to comment? That is correct, until they get to their well, five minutes. I, I would like an exception to that. I, I um, am the ranking member of uh, Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, and we have uh, responsibility, legislative responsibility over GSA, and uh, we have also worked on this particular issue since you've raised the point. And uh, uh, I would like uh, uh, time for an opening statement. I'd be glad to defer first to uh, uh, the senator, but uh, we've spent a lot of uh, our my personal time and staff time. To investigate this matter, so uh, well, I, I certainly will uh, want Mr. to. Mr. Chairman, the general rule of the committee, as I understand, is that members get opening statements, and in this case, I would ask that uh, we follow the rules of the committee. Allow Mr. Mike to make an opening statement. Well, Senator Grassley does have a time well, schedule. Would you allow him to go first, yes, and yes. then you make your statement? Yes, I think that would be uh, that. That would be fine. Thank you, Senator. We're pleased to have you. Yeah. I thank the members of this committee for their commitment to oversight one of our most sacred responsibilities as a Congress. Today's hearing focusing on a number of issues related to decisions of GSA and other uh, senior officials and ultimately their impact on the American taxpayer. 
My concerns began last year when I learned that the relationship between GS Inspector General uh, Mr. Brian Miller and GSA Administrator Ms. Doan was strained and deteriorating. Uh, I hope you know that I had a long history of looking into wasteful government spending and, a very, and the very important role that's played by inspectors generals. Uh, and I hope that you understand that it doesn't matter to me whether we have Republican or Democrat administrations. Uh, I try to do the job of oversight equally the same. Uh, I believe that the IG in any agency is our first and main line of defense against waste, fraud, and abuse of taxpayers' money and misconduct by government officials. Uh, the IGs quite simply are watchdogs, and I've been and will continue to watch the watchdogs. It's uh, incumbent on Congress to ensure that the IGs are doing their job, uh, that uh, they have the resources to do their job, and that there's no undue influence, interference with uh, IG's ability to do mission. Currently, GSA holds contracts with thousands of contractors worth billions. Someone has to ensure that these contracts yield the best deal possible and that contractors involved honor all terms of each contract. The uh, GSA, uh, in the GSA, this is a team effort involving GSA contract officials and IG. Uh, this is a delicate balance, but one that has proven to work, proven by millions and millions of dollars of savings. When I learned that the relationship between GSA administrator and the IG was becoming more and more strained, I decided to uh, get it to the bottom, and I'm not pleased with our, what I found. I can certainly accept the agency heads and their IGs may not always see eye to eye. However, I cannot accept any move by an agency head to undermine the independence of the IG. Uh, that independence is the heart and soul of the uh, IG uh, Act. Uh, it's uh, what allows the IG to present objective findings in their investigative reports. When it was brought to my attention that the administrator intended to remove the reimbursable fundings that the GSA IG depends on for audits of contracts in their pre-award phase, I immediately looked into the impact that it would have on the Inspector General's work. In the end, the money for the reimbursable audits was restored in fiscal year 2007, but the entire situation provided insight into the flawed budgeting concept that has the unintended effect of encroaching on the independence of the IG. So on February the 23rd, 2007, I asked the Senate Appropriations Committee to fix the problem by providing a direct appropriation for GSA IG's pre-award audits. Uh, the uh, reimbursable audits cost the GSA only $5 million per year, but have been responsible for saving more than $2 billion in the last two years alone. I think $10 billion in and $2 billion out sounds like a pretty good deal. I've asked uh, Administrator Doan about her relationship with the IG. And she has assured me that she understands and accepts the importance and necessity of the IG's independence. She says that she is trying to bring fiscal discipline to the entire agency, including the office of IG. I accept that because that's a worthy goal. But despite her assurances to the contrary, though, her actions and words have not convinced me that she is committed to utilizing the GSA office of the Inspector General to its maximum potential as intended in the law. She has indicated privately and publicly that the IG has been heavy-handed in dealing with GSA employees. She has even suggested that, that the IG officials have intimidated other GSA employees and contractors. These are very serious allegations against federal law enforcement officers and accredited auditors, and if true, they deserve the highest level of investigation by both Congress and the executive branch. Despite numerous attempts to get details, though, on these allegations, from the administrator, I have received nothing but innuendos and unspecified allegations. During the course of my investigation, I discovered that there was one specific allegation relating to a contract involving government vendor, Sun Microsystem. The GSA IG conducted a very thorough investigation of the matter and could find no one in the GSA's regional office that felt intimidated by IG officials. However, during the course of that investigation, I did learn some very interesting facts about this particular Sun Microsystem contract, which may be the root cause of the dispute with the IG. The first piece of information that caught my attention was this. 
in spite of repeated warnings by senior GSA officials in 2006 that Sun Microsystem had allegedly committed civil and or criminal fraud on two of these contracts, GSA, with Administrator Doan's blessing, proceeded to reaward the contract uh, to Sun on September the 8th, 2006, with no conditions, strings, or precautions regarding alleged fraud. The IG began post-award audits of these contracts over two years ago. Those audits were finally completed yesterday. The scope of the alleged fraud has been established and verified. Uh, the allegations of fraud by Sun will now be referred to the Department of Justice for further consideration. By August 26, 2006, several GSA contracting officials uh, all the way up to the administrator were fully knowledgeable about the alleged fraud, yet uh, none took appropriate corrective action to address alleged fraud. Why? Well, the alleged fraud on these contracts involving defective pricing, unauthorized charges, unpaid discounts, is valued at uh, 10 millions of dollars. Even Sun Microsystem had admitted to GSA that they had been negligent in providing proper pricing and discount information to GSA. Sun has provided a corrective action plan to prevent this from happening in the future. Whether this corrective action plan is effective remains to be seen, but that doesn't wipe out years of negligence by this government contractor. The second piece of information that concerned me was that this new Sun contract, which will go through 2009, was negotiated on terms that are extremely unfavorable to the government. The terms were so unfavorable, in fact, that immediately upon signing, taxpayers lost millions of dollars due to improper discounting and pricing calcul calculations. The lost savings could be as high as 20 to 30 million dollars based upon IG uh, investigation. Uh, this was the very same issue that the GSA IG was investigating before the contract was renewed. It seems that everyone involved, the IG, the contracting officer, senior GSA officials, was aware that the new contract was bad for the GSA, bad for government, and of course bad for the taxpayers then. GSA's first response to the allegations of fraud developed by the IG was to grant another in a long line of contract extensions to Sun on August 30, 2006. This brought a little time. Then a new contracting officer was installed on August 31st, a contracting officer with no previous experience with this very complicated contract. Finally, on September the 8th, just eight days later, a GSA awarded the contract to Sun. This contract that is even worse for the government than the one previously negotiated over the past year by the two previous contract officers, both of whom were replaced between February and August 2006. To make matters worse, the administrator told me in a letter dated March 13, 2007, that she was made aware of the potential criminal fraud by Sun on August 29, 2006 which was two days before the new contract officer was appointed and nine days before the new co contract was awarded. After the IG informed her of the alleged fraud on the Sun contract, she reportedly told the IG, quote, it is essential for GSA to sign the contract with Sun, end of quote. That was on August the 29th. Two days later, Federal Acquisition Service Commissioner Williams told the contract officer that he and Administrator Doan, quote, considered the Sun contract strategically important, important and wanted it awarded, end of quote. What is even more shock shocking is that the FSA staff, the arm of the General Service Administration uh, responsible for negotiating this contract, were made aware of Sun's alleged fraud as early as February 12, 2006, and possibly earlier, but at least seven months before the contract was awarded. Well, what was the rationale for going ahead with this contract? Was it GSA's fear of losing the contract to another agency like NASA? Was it the loss of income from the fees or simply a desire to continue doing business with this contractor for some other still unknown reason? Hopefully continued investigation such as this hearing today will eventually re reveal what went wrong and answer these questions. I want to close by making a very important point. 
It was teamwork of the IG and the contracting officials that uncovered both the potential fraud and the problems with the new contract. And it was the IG's Brian Miller, uh, outstanding leadership that created an environment where these good things could happen. Yet despite their very best efforts, their warnings fell upon deaf ears at the highest levels of GSA. The message this sends to government contractors is very clear. It doesn't matter how poorly you manage the government's money or how badly you violate the government's contract, the doors of the U.S. Treasury are wide open. Help yourself to what's in the coffers. Take what you need. GSA will do business with you on your terms. So, Mr. Chairman, let me make one point crystal, crystal clear, uh, in, including uh, my duties. The government coffers are not open. We're watching the activities of government contractors, senior agency officials, the perpetuation of fraud and violation of law should not be tolerated, period. There are systems in place to prevent this, like the IG Act and what you're doing here, congressional oversight. When money is lost due to a flawed contract, negligence or fraud, we must remember that the money is not the GSA's, it's not Congress's money, that it's money out of the pockets of hardworking American taxpayers and among our most important responsibilities is to ensure that it is spent responsibly, wisely, and according to law. If fraud occurred on this contract and Sun owes the taxpayers money as the IG reports, then the money must be recovered. Those responsibilities, uh, those responsible must be held accountable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Grassley. I appreciate your being here. You have been legendary as, a, 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 as an advocate and also for your tenacity in looking out for the taxpayers of this country, and I appreciate your insights into this issue. I know you have to go, so uh, what we're going to do is um, Mr. Davis has a few questions, I have a few questions, and then we're going to excuse him. Okay. Mr. Davis. Senator, I appreciate you being here, and I, too, as chairman of this committee, uh, we would go where the facts took us, and Mr. Waxman and I together went after the administration when we thought they were wrong. And we defend them when we think they are right, and we, we all want savings. Uh, and Mrs. Doan is a, a big girl. She can take care of herself on the questions to follow up to explain her role in this. There is no evidence that she negotiated directly with Sun Microsystems that you can find, is there? You don't have any evidence that she negotiated directly with Sun Microsystems, do you, uh, Senator? What, what, I, uh, what I have evidence of is that, uh, that there, was, uh, to the t uh, there was questions raised about alleged fraud over a long period of time that should have been taken into consideration by anybody doing business yeah. with this company. Right. But you don't have any evidence that she negotiated this contract. At this with point, somebody. everything is alleged. Right. Exactly. Uh, yeah. she'll, I think she can answer those questions. Uh, I just add that in, uh, I spent my year, my career before I came here as a government contracts attorney. Uh, in most agencies, the IG doesn't do the pre audit report. This is done by the uh, contracting auditors or the DCAA. This is kind of the exception to the rule where the IG does. But let me just say this. Let's assume that GSA allowed the Sun schedule contract to lapse. Let's just assume for a second we'd reached an impasse. They'd been through three contracting officers. If the contract lapsed, what would happen then to agencies that require needs for Sun products to purchase them under individual acquisitions? If they're not on the GSA schedule well, and an agency needs it, how, how do they get it? You know, I'm not doing the business of the GSA, but it seems to me when there's questions about fraud that come up, that if there was a necessity to go one more day or two more days or ten more days to keep government functioning, uh, that you would do it with a complete openness, that there's very much questions yeah, I about. agree with you. Well, Senator, but the only thing I'd, I'd note here is this had gone on for weeks and months with its extensions that were far more costly uh, to taxpayers than getting this resolved. And also getting it on the schedule is just a license to hunt. Once you're on a schedule, doesn't guarantee you one contract. That's why it's so difficult to understand uh, for people to make these statements about it's cost millions of dollars. What happens, as I understand the process, is ordering agencies, uh, 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 in, in this case, that it's a license to hunt. You're on, a, you're on the GSA schedule, but for an agency to then buy your product, they have to compete it off the schedule against competing companies who also have to uh, uh, um, negotiate their prices. And the price that was negotiated here is just kind of a starting price. They generally go down from there. And that makes it difficult to measure it. 
But I think you're right that we need to take a look at this and that when agencies negotiate these things, it should be subject to congressional oversight. We look forward to, I think, a robust uh, conversation about that today, and I'm sure the administrator uh, can tell you what her thought process was as the policymaker. As you know, IG's rules aren't to make policy, they're to make uh, audit recommendations. So you've, got to re you've got to remember that in government contracts, it's a little bit different than in the commercial uh, very sector. Different. That, uh, that the, the people who want to do business with the federal government have uh, responsibility to make more information available to the government. Uh, and, uh, and you would expect that any deal that the American government gets, be, if nothing more than reason because of quantity, uh, we get a better deal than the commercial, than they give to the co commercial well, side. Senator, I, uh, I'm not sure that's always true. For example, in Medicare prescription drug prices, I'm not sure that you get a government would get a better deal than you get off of some of these larger buying agencies. I think you would agree with me on that. But aside from that, let's look at this. I appreciate you bringing it to our attention. I just, what I think the evidence will show today is that you'd had an impasse that had been through three contracting officers. Yeah. And if they went off the schedule, the government was going to get its product somewhere. And I think we can, yeah. they can defend or, or, or not uh, uh, the merits of this. But I think the evidence will show that Mrs. Doan didn't negotiate a thing in this case. She simply yeah. said, we have an impasse. Let's try to get resolve it. And both sides at one point switched their contracting uh, negotiators. Thank yeah. you. Well, in regard to drugs, the government might get a better deal, but they'd only have, their senior citizens only have the choice of 25 percent of the drugs that they otherwise have under the plan we have Senator, right now. it's the same problem here. If you don't get a deal here and Sun Microsystems isn't on the GSA schedules and the government has a need for those products, you go out into the marketplace and you pay a lot more. Um, let's see if you can fix that thing. Did you? Are you done with me? Uh, no, I, Senator, I, I, I want to ask you a few questions. Yes, I'm it, glad it, to answer your it, question. It seems uh, that what GSA is supposed to do is go out and negotiate fair and reasonable prices for other government agencies to get the services or, or uh, products uh, that they might use in their government activities. And we're going to go into this issue more in detail. But from my understanding is GSA ha had a contract with Sun Microsystems. Sun Microsystems was giving a lower price to their commercial customers, and then we charge, was turn around and charge the government more for the same services, which was contrary to GSA rules. So when they negotiated the contract and renegotiated the contract, they said, you can't do that. And they went through a long period of time of extensions. What they needed to do, if, if they couldn't get uh, their contractor, Microsystem, to give the, the best price to the government, they needed to look for somebody else. But we'll go into that more in detail. What I want to ask you is you've been looking at this issue. And you asked Ms. Doan for her comments, and now you've seen what she had to say to you. Uh, you've looked at the documents and the emails from Ms. Doan. Do you think that you re you re uh, do you think that this raises any question after you reviewed all this matter about the accuracy of the assertions that Ms. Doan made to you in the letter to you? Uh, I think it's typical of too many letters I get back from various agencies of government, including this one, and this is an example of what I'm talking about, so I'm in agreement with you that we need more information and have not been entirely candid, but there is an institutional disease in bureaucracies under Republicans or Democrats that uh, you always got to pull teeth to get answers to your questions. That's true enough. That's why I think Congress has to do its oversight responsibilities. Do you think this is a worthwhile activity for an oversight committee? I, it's, listen, you wouldn't be doing your constitutional job upholding your oath if you weren't doing what you're doing today and do more of it. And let me ask you this question. Who appointed Ms. Doan and who appointed the Inspector General for her uh, agency? Uh, listen, the buck stops at the Oval Office. So both were appointed by the same president? Yes. And, and, and I want you. I and want they're you having a disagreement because the Inspector General, oh. in pursuing his job of watching over this agency, has pointed out that he thinks they were given contracts where the taxpayers are paying more money than they should. Yeah. Well, we'll go. We'll go into it with them because we'll have them both here. But uh, it just strikes me that when the Republicans say this is partisan and unnecessary, unfair. I'm pleased to have you here to say that this is the kind of thing that we ought to be doing, watching out yeah. for the taxpayers. Yeah. Uh, I want you to know that uh, inspector generals are in the first line. They should be very, very independent. Uh, they ought to probably have more independence than the present law gives them. Uh, I, I think I've been involved in the firing of, uh, of uh, and resignations of IGs that haven't been doing their job, at least five. 
uh, and uh, and and uh, you know they help us to do our constitutional job of oversight. Your job, my job, would be much more difficult if we didn't have inspector generals. Thank you. I, I certainly agree with you. Thank you very much for being here. And we know you have a busy schedule. I'd like to ask the members. Uh, uh, by unanimous consent, even though we were going to have opening statements only by the ranking member and myself, uh, that we uh, allow Mr. Micah to give an opening statement and then we'll proceed to the uh, witnesses. Does that uh, meet everybody's agreement? If so, uh, Mr. Micah, you are going to be treated with special courtesy today and we recognize you at this time for an opening statement. Well, thank you. And having served with uh, uh, Mr. Waxman over, I've uh, been 15 years, I know he's been a lot longer in Congress. I appreciate that courtesy. And as I did state that uh, I took over the responsibility of ranking member of transportation and infrastructure, and one of our subcommittees is uh, uh, economic development and public buildings of which we have legislative responsibility uh, for uh, GSA. Uh, quite frankly, I didn't know uh, the GSA administrator from Adams House Cat uh, um, several months ago, and uh, I might say that uh, just by way of information about myself, and we just heard from Senator uh, Grassley, uh, I started out some of my career going after. Uh, Review uh, with a responsibility of reviewing local government and then some state government operations. And uh, one of the first things I did was send a local Republican official, a county official, help send him to jail for uh, waste, fraud, and uh, ab abuse. Uh, so I, I don't I don't play those games. I, I, uh, if someone is abusing their office. Uh, uh, I'll go after them. Uh, Mr. Waxman and I and uh, Mr. Davis, we've been on the committee and we've done that uh, over the years and I think we, we have that responsibility in the future. That being said, I, I've met at least two times and questioned the uh, administrator uh, with some of my staff. Uh, when I first read some of the accounts in the Washington Post, I guess that uh, printed the story about uh, a no-bid contract, I too became a concern. And uh, so I started looking at this and, uh, and talked to her. Didn't know much about her and I found out she was a professional uh, business woman uh, who had great experience. I thought, my God, uh, she's giving some kind of a favor and a bid to um, a company she dealt with in the private sector. Uh, this looks like some sort of a payback. Then I was absolutely stunned when I found out that she had not received any money from the company, this uh, diversity company, that in fact uh, she had paid uh, $400,000 for contracts and then that this company in fact had a good reputation and looking at diversity issues and she had conducted some of that in the private sector. So I was sort of stunned by what, what I found then I found out that GSA, and not knowing much about GSA because I hadn't, done, uh, hadn't been responsible for oversight in this area, was actually about to get or had gotten uh, F grade in diversity. So here's an agency, and, and she's a minority Republican appointee who comes into an agency and finds an agency that's getting an F grade in its performance uh, relating to to uh, racial diversity in the uh, department. So she, of course, I think her biggest mistake at this point is trying to think she could do something like she did in the private sector, is move something forward to uh, correct the situation. Uh, having uh, already contracted in the private sector with, a, with someone who did a good job on diversity questions, uh, she tries to get a contract to, uh, to avoid uh, an upcoming, again, uh, analysis and, and review of, uh, of the agency's poor, poor performance. So I looked at that and I thought, there's nothing here. I mean, in fact, she should probably be applauded for trying to come into an agency that has a horrible reputation on, on diversity and, uh, and, and, and uh, racial questions uh, uh, of employment uh, in the agency and as a minority appointee trying to do something about it. So then I thought, well, then I, I heard a little bit about um, the, partisan, or the partisan politics possible violation of the Hatch Act. I thought, well, damn on me and Henry, we've got her on this one. 
And uh, then I find out uh, that actually she didn't even initiate the conference. I thought, well, maybe she did this before uh, the election. And then I, I went back to see, well, when was she appointed? She was appointed in June of last year. July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, Mar uh, February. Here we're in February. So she's been an eight-month appointee. Is she trying to, was she trying to influence the election uh, in, uh, in the fall? This actually took place on January 28th, I think the, the date was, the end of January in a, a, a conference call not initiated by her. So strikeout number two. Then we get to the Sun contract. Oh, we got her this time because she's really got, she, she was involved in knowing this, this, all about this Sun contract and probably let this. Here's the dates on the Sun contract. Uh, negotiations with Sun started. The first and second contract extensions were executed by Robert Overly over a period of seven months. A second contract extension was granted to expire February uh, 2005. Well, where the hell is uh, Ms. Doan in all? She didn't come in until June. Uh, and then the dates we just got, even from Senator Grassley, she'd been on the job for about 45 days, uh, trying to get something done on something that had been pending for, I understand, for five years. Uh, I've been involved in uh, investigations and reviews on this committee for 15 years, and I'm telling you, I, this, this is, uh, uh, unfor unfortunately, it looks like it's a targeted uh, attempt to go after a minority appointee, and I find that very offensive uh, at, 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 in, in this process. Gentlemen's thank time you for, expired. Uh, thank you for the time. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Micah. You can stay for the rest of the hearing if you want to hear the witnesses, but I know you've made up your mind. Uh, we'll now proceed to uh, listen to the two witnesses that involve the, the issues that have been put before us. And I'm very pleased to welcome the Honorable Loretta A. Doan. She's the 18th Administrator of the General Services Administration. Prior to becoming GSA Administrator in May 2006, Ms. Doan was the President of New Technology Management, Inc., a company she founded in 1990. Ms. Doan, we want to welcome you to our hearing today. <clears throat> I want to tell you that your uh, prepared statement will be in the record in full. We'd like to ask if you would to try to limit your uh, oral presentation to around five minutes, but we will not be strict on that <clears throat> because um, um, it's important that we hear from you. It's the practice of this committee to uh, put uh, all witnesses under oath, and I'd like to ask you to stand and please raise your right hand to take the oath of oath. Do you uh, promise, swear, and affirm that you will tell the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, the record will indicate the witness answered in the affirmative. We're uh, uh, pleased that you're here, and I'm going to uh, now recognize you for your comments. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the committee, I appreciate the invitation to appear before you today to address the matters raised in the March 6th invitation. This is my first time testifying as administrator of the General Services Administration. You know, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington is one of my favorite movies, but I have to admit that I never thought that I would be living the movie. And yet, here I am. Thank you for the opportunity to resolve a number of issues that have appeared in the media. I welcome this opportunity to set the record straight. I've submitted a detailed written testimony, but let me highlight the key elements. They are fiscal discipline, oversight, and results. First, the cost of imposing fiscal discipline. Within hours of assuming office this past June, I initiated a line-by-line -line review of the entire GSA budget. We had over a $100 million deficit for fiscal year 06. We had flunked our annual audit. The revenue from FY05 to FY06 had plunged by over $4 billion. Morale was low, and there was talk of mandatory buyouts. I had three goals. Eliminate sources of wasteful spending, apply oversight equally to all divisions within GSA, achieve results by encouraging GSA employees to innovate, 
improve GSA performance, and save taxpayer money. These were priorities I had identified in my confirmation hearing. We identified and eliminated non-performing programs. We hacked unnecessary travel to places like Australia and Kuala Lumpur. GSA divisions cut spending by 9%, and we didn't even have to touch employee salaries. It was with great pride that we submitted a budget to OMB with retroactive cuts for fiscal year 06, fiscal year 07, and even proposed cuts in fiscal year 08. GSA employees knew that sources of wasteful spending, and they were elated to know that under me there were no sacred cows. Today, through the hard work of our GSA team, our morale has improved, GSA was recently ranked as one of the top 10 best places to work in federal government. We have a balanced budget, and we got a clean audit. I am I'm really proud of the transformational changes made to the GSA schedule process, where we just awarded our first GSA schedule within 30 days of the application. Only 10 months ago, the average time was 157 days. The FAST reorganization is successfully underway, and GSA has turned around and created a positive relationship with the judiciary and the Department of Defense, and these are our two biggest customers. We did all of this in 10 months. Bold new leadership was what the President wanted, and that's exactly what he got at GSA. The early fiscal discipline is now yielding improved performance. But I'm going to tell you, change is difficult. And not everyone, not everyone wants to improve. Some cling to the old and refuse to cut spending and will do anything to protect bureaucratic turf. And this is what happened at GSA. And I believe the Office of the Inspector General may have been angered by any suggestion that their operations could be improved or that any spending could be cut. I probably should have predicted what followed. Investigations intended to intimidate were launched but never ended, and the old-fashioned squeeze was on. I refused to yield, and, and I still believe that my actions were right. But I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm not a perfect person. I make mistakes, and honestly, I'm probably going to make a few more. But there was no wrongdoing. In Washington, it seems to me that budgets are fiercely protected but that sometimes these legitimate policy disputes cross the line and become personal attacks, and I believe that this is what happened to me. But Mr. Chairman, you do not face the administrator of GSA, but the full fury of an absolutely angry mom when someone from this committee alleged that three years ago, there was some wrongdoing involving my then 14-year-old daughter who participated in a mandatory school-wide community service program as an intern to Senator Debbie Stabenow three years ago, long before I entered public office. I am sure you know Senator Stabenow, and I am sure you know that she would never do anything that's wrong. I know that this attack was probably inserted in the invitation by a too eager staffer who thought that blood sport involving children was acceptable. To that committee staffer who thought that attacking one of my kids would be fair game, let me tell you directly, shame on you. Shame on you for getting so caught up in the give and take of politics that you lost your sense of decency and fair play and let partisan passions overwhelm good judgment. Shame on you for not thinking through the terrible and unintended consequences on good people everywhere interested in public service. You know, like Jimmy Stewart and Mr. Smith, I stand here, I'm going to be honest, I'm facing a gazillion allegations. But the curious thing is that all of these allegations stem from a single source, and all of them became public as a direct result of my attempts to impose fiscal discipline throughout GSA. 
I knew that when I moved to restore fiscal discipline and bring some sunshine to poor managerial practices that I was going to be in for a lot of criticism. But I was surprised by the scandal mongering involving attacks on children that I now have hate mail sent to my home and am vilified in the national media. The time to focus on the facts has come and the political points that can be scored from trumped up charges put away. When you examine my testimony, and I hope that you will take the time to read it, I know it's, it's a little lengthy, I hope that you will see that each of these different allegations and attacks on my character are groundless, that I did not interfere, and that I was simply exercising my right as administrator to know what was going on at the General Services Administration. But I think that this hearing is important for two other far more important reasons. The first regards wasteful spending. I think that what we say and what we do here today could set the tone for how other federal agencies look at oversight and accountability and how aggressively they are to be in identifying and eliminating specific causes of wasteful spending. GSA, as far as I know, was the only federal agency that submitted a budget that voluntarily called for retroactive cuts to its budget. It took courage to do that. But I fear that if it becomes common practice for agency heads to face a never-ending barrage of personal attacks for doing so, that you can be sure that no such effort, it's never going to be made again. Second. This hearing could possibly, it seems to me, set the atmosphere for how we approach the issue of oversight. Much of my testimony deals with my determination to extend oversight and accountability equally throughout GSA divisions, including the Office of the Inspector General. Those of us in government, we have a great opportunity to begin an important dialogue that has at its core two questions. First. Is oversight something that applies equally to all spending decisions? Or should oversight and accountability only be applied to selective government organizations or programs? So I thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to answering your questions. And I hope that I'll give you a chance to get to know me just a little bit better. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stone, for your uh, statement to us. Uh, without objection, we'll now uh, proceed with the chairman and the ranking member controlling 15 minutes of time. And I yield, to my, I yield uh, five minutes uh, to the gentleman from Iowa. I was only going to yield him five minutes, but I'll yield 15 minutes uh, to the gentleman from Iowa, uh, Mr. Braley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Davis. Um, good morning. Good Let's morning. begin by reviewing what GSA does and what its mission is. GSA is a government agency that manages federal buildings, buys equipment and supplies, and works with other agencies to purchase goods and services. And as the chairman noted, the impact of this service is huge because the GSA helps manage nearly $500 billion in federal assets. According to GSA's website, its core mission is to help federal agencies better serve the public by offering at best value superior workplaces, expert solutions, acquisition services and management policies. I assume you would agree with the mission statement that's posted on the website. I do, although I will tell you we are improving it because we're just finishing our new strategic plan. But I assume that you would agree with it as it's currently stated. Yes. And do you also agree that the GSA's core mission does not include engaging in partisan political activity? I do not think that any government agency should be engaging in partisan political activity. Let's talk about the meeting that you referenced in your opening statement on January 26 of 2007. I believe most people rightly assume that the GSA's mission is not just making sure that government buildings are well built and well maintained and that federal employees have the resources and supplies they need to do their job. But on January 26 of 2007, you held a meeting at GSA headquarters that raised serious concerns about possible illegal political activity and I want to ask you about that meeting. It's our understanding that the meeting occurred at GSA headquarters on government property. We have been told that you were there as the highest ranking GSA official and your chief of staff, John Phelps, was there as well as dozens of other political appointees working at GSA. Overall, there were nearly 40 po Republican political appointees who joined the meeting either in person 
or through a video conference. The committee has been told that the reason for this meeting was to hear a presentation from Scott Jennings. Scott Jennings is Karl Rove's deputy at the White House. He is the deputy director of political affairs for President Bush. Is that correct so far? No, it is not. And what was not correct about that statement? John Phelps did not attend that meeting. And did not participate by phone? And did not participate by phone. And was not involved in any way in the meeting? To my knowledge, he was not in any way involved in the meeting. The committee has been informed that Mr. Jennings gave a PowerPoint presentation at the meeting. Were you aware of that? Yes. And we have been told that he discussed the 2006 elections during that presentation. Would you characterize his presentation as a purely factual presentation about the results of the 2006 election? I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit this, but I can say that I honestly don't have a recollection of the presentation at all. Well, I assume that given your past experience, you've sat through PowerPoint presentations before. I have said that. And that during PowerPoint presentations, information is projected in slides, and usually those slides are reviewed by the person making the presentation to reinforce verbally the visual images that are displayed on the slides. Oftentimes they Is are. that your general understanding of what took place on this date? Yes, I believe that is true. I believe there were PowerPoint slides, and I believe Scott Jennings did speak. The committee has obtained a copy of the presentation that Mr. Jennings gave at your office. And I'd like to ask you about the topics that he discussed with the staff. And at this time, I'd ask the staff to put up slide 555, which is the first cover slide for the PowerPoint presentation, uh, showing that this was prepared by the White House political office headed by Karl Rove. That's what the cover slide says. Is that correct? Yes, I'm looking at the one you gave me. And then let's look at slide 578. This is a slide that has at the top 2008 House targets, top 20. Do you see that? I do. And there can be no dispute from the content of this slide that this slide is depicting Republican targets that identify Democratic seats that are vulnerable in 2006. Isn't that what it says? I'm reading, it says House Targets Top 20. Top 2008, not 2000. Yes. Okay. And it shows district by district the individuals, what the percentage of that district was in the 2004 election, and what percentage that particular Democratic candidate received in the 2006 election. Correct? Yes, it, it, it appears. I, I honestly, I've not seen this chart until yesterday. I don't remember. I mean, I really, truly don't remember seeing this chart until yesterday when I tried to, to dig it up. And I have to say, I, I, I don't know what the explanation was that accompanied this. I, I truly do not remember this part of the presentation. Well, you're familiar with what the word target means, right? I, I think we could say that I'm one right now, yes. Yes, and what this means is that the Republicans are trying to target these seats to win them back in 2008. That was what was discussed at the presentation. I appreciate your interpretation of that. I'm in the yield for one minute. Yes. I just want to verify, uh, did you know that your office supplied this chart to us? Yes, I did, but I did not review the, sub the actual data. There was different groups that were involved in this. Since this was not my meeting, I did not convene it. I didn't run the agenda of it. Um, I didn't invite uh, uh, Speaker Jennings, uh, Scott Jennings, to the meeting. I, I actually didn't have any involvement in it. The group that was involved in that, they prepared that submission for you. You were just there, though. I attended the meeting. Yes, I was there. Okay. and I, I Well, I'm going to let right. Mr. Bailey continue. Yes. You would agree that a reasonable interpretation of this slide is that it was a political attempt to try to target the top 20 Democratic candidates for defeat in 2008? No, I would not say that. I would say that this is a slide that says 2008 House targets top 20. I, I do not want to try to speculate on what was intended by Mr. Jennings on the slide. I really think you have to ask him. Well, I think the reasonable pe people interpreting and viewing this material can probably get a pretty good understanding of what Mr. Jennings was doing there. The next slide I'd like to talk about is slide 579. This is a slide that has as a heading 2008 House GOP defense. Have you seen this slide before? 
I saw it yesterday is when I remember. I, I'm sure I probably possibly saw it during the meeting. I, I don't remember it during our meeting, but honestly, as I said before, I, I don't really remember the PowerPoint presentation very clearly during that meeting. And this slide lists a number of vulnerable Republican House seats that are being targeted for protection in the 2008 congressional elections. Isn't that a reasonable conclusion that you can draw from this slide? Congressman, I I, I, I'll accept your explanation of it. And then if we look at slide 581, this slide has the caption, Battle for the Senate 2008, and identifies potential pickup opportunities, one category described as Republican offense, listing six states, one category described as Republican defense, listing eight states, and then listing other non-competitive states. Do you agree that a reasonable per person interpreting what's contained on this slide could conclude that these are targeted Senate seats that the, that the Republican White House is trying to protect or pick up? Senator, I will accept your interpretation of this slide. I mean, sorry, Senator, I mean, sorry, Congressman. I, I am promotion, very though. proud of my title as Congressman, so thank you. Demotion. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not even going to get into that, guys. Can you tell us what, if anything, these slides have to do with the GSA's core purpose of procuring supplies and managing federal buildings? This brown bag luncheon, I believe, has been mischaracterized. This is a uh, meeting that is a team building meeting that is hosted by our White House um, liaison, a GSA employee, a non-career employee, and it's hosted every month. Uh, I try to attend whenever I can. I am occasionally I realize I'm late either coming in or leaving early, but, but I do try to be supportive. We look upon this as team building. We have had a variety of speakers who speak in whatever their particular area of expertise is. That's what we do in these luncheons. I'm trying to build a superior management team at GSA and any kind of team building activities that I can do. I, I With all do. due respect, Ms. Doan, I don't believe you answered my question, which was to ask what these slides had to do with the GSA's mission. I think the answer oh, to I'm my sorry. question is clear. This was a partisan political briefing. It occurred on GSA property during work hours and had nothing to do with the GSA mission. You identified team building as one of the purposes of this meeting. Can you explain to the taxpayers of this country how holding this partisan political briefing helped with team building? As I had said a little bit earlier, um, this is a, a brown bag lunch. It occurs on the lunch hour of our non-career employees. Um, this is not my slide presentation. And, and I really do ask you, if, if you need to have an accurate interpretation of what that PowerPoint slide presentation means, um, Please, uh, you know, I, I would ask you to ask Mr. Jennings. This is his product, and uh, he was a guest at our meeting. Well, when the presentation begins with the White House Office of Political Affairs on the cover slide, and the slide presentation has multiple references to the Republicans' vaunted 72-hour get-out-the-vote effort and its impact on a host of different congressional races, which is what's contained on the other slides that are in this presentation, I think the American taxpayers have a very good reason to wonder whether the only team that was being helped during this briefing was the Republican Party team. The Federal Hatch Act says you can't use the workplace to engage in team building for any political party. You've suggested that this wasn't intended to have a partisan purpose in your uh, presentations, and yet the committee has been informed by multiple sources that after Mr. Jennings finished his presentation, you took the floor, thanked him, and then posed a question to the entire group of participants. And according to those sources, you stated, how can we use GSA to help our candidates in the next election? Now, reminding you that you are under oath, can you tell the committee whether, in fact, you did make that statement? I do know that I'm under oath, and I will tell you that I honestly and absolutely, I do not have a recollection of actually saying that. The committee has interviewed and deposed witnesses who participated in the briefing, and these were not the type of off-the-record discussions the White House is currently recommending in the Attorney General's investigation. One of those, Justin Bush, is a 
Republican political appointee at GSA, and he was quoted as saying that you, your comment was, how can we use different GSA projects, building openings and the like to further aid other Republicans? Do you have any reason to doubt Mr. Bush's memory? I honestly, I have told you, I do not have any recollection of saying that. But I do know, I have been brought to understand that there is actually a difference of opinion among the attendees about what exactly was said. Well, another attendee, Jennifer Milliken, is the Deputy Director, Director of Communications at GSA and also a Republican appointee. She stated that you said, quote, how, can we, how we could help candidates. Do you remember saying that? I have no recollection of saying that. Do you disagree with your own press person that that comment was made by you? A comment about helping candidates, our candidates? Congressman, I, I, I don't know how many times I've said this fourth or fifth time, but I will repeat again that, that I, I cannot, I do not recollect this. I honestly and absolutely have no recollection, but I will tell you that the IG has requested an investigation from the Office of the Special Counsel into this matter. That investigation, to my knowledge, is still open. It's currently running. We at GSA, I in particular, we are cooperating fully, and, and I would actually ask you to please allow the investigation to run its course. Well, part of our function here is to perform congressional oversight, which by its very nature includes investigation. That is the purpose we're here today. Another uh, attendee, the chief acquisition officer of your agency, Emily Murphy, also a Republican political appointee, said that at the meeting you stated, quote, how can GSA help our candidates or help position our candidates. Her assistant, Christi Christiane Monica, backs up her account and said that you said, quote, how can we help our candidates in the next election? We also have a statement from Matthew Sisk, the special assistant to the regional administrator for Massachusetts, likewise a Republican political appointee, as well as Michael Burkholz, the senior advisor to the chief acquisition officer at GSA. These are not partisan Democrats attacking you, as you have alleged. These are statements from six different Republican appointees who work at GSA. And they all told us the same thing about your making express reference to political comments during this meeting. Do you think all of these people are lying? I cannot answer for what them. I can only answer for myself. And I will tell you that I honestly have no recollection of making that statement giving you one last chance to clarify the record, I'm going to ask, did you ever make the statement, how can we use GSA to help our candidates in the next election, or words to that effect? Congressman, I cannot recollect making that statement. The reason this is so important to me is because you directed comments to staff of this committee and you said, shame on you for getting so caught up in the game of politics that you let partisan politics affect your judgment. Turning that mirror around, Ms. Doan, I think there are people on this committee who wonder whether the same statement could apply to you in light of what these Republican political appointees have testified you said during this meeting on GSA property with GSA employees in attendance. Can you understand that concern? I do not believe that there were any 14-year-olds at that meeting. You don't believe that you could be perceived as having participated in a meeting where partisan political politics was the main subject with GSA employees in attendance on GSA property and asking a question which you cannot recall where you talk about helping our candidates, how that could be perceived as maybe being possibly clouded by partisan political judgment? I do not believe that this was an inappropriate meeting. I believe that all around government, there are non-career employees who meet to discuss different ways to advance policies and programs of the administration, but that is not the same as asking federal employees to engage in partisan political activities in the workplace. I, I simply do not have any recollection of ever saying that? Gentlemen's uh, time has expired, Thank and you. I'm now going to uh, uh, yield to Mr. Davis. But one quick question on this whole thing: It was a brown bag, brown bag lunch for those who were there, but this was a teleconference, and even people as far away as, as California were participating in this meeting. Isn't that correct? That is true. 
Okay, thank you. Mr. Davis. And the White House called this, right? Is this what they do on a regular basis where they like to get together with their, their schedule C's? Yes, it is. How often do these occur at GSA? Usually they occur monthly, and okay. they're uh, convened uh, and arranged by our White House liaison. So the White House liaison, basically, uh, the White House says we want to talk to our Schedule C's. These are employees who serve at the pleasure of the President. Right. We, we have a, a requirement to try to, to advance the policies of the administration and execute them and make these initiatives successful. Now, you didn't see these slides ahead of time, did you? No, I did not. You didn't help prepare these slides, did you? No, I did not. You had no idea what they were going to say, did you? No, I did not. Uh, in fact, you weren't even paying attention, it sounds like. This is embarrassing to yeah. admit, okay, but no, it's true. I, I think, I mean, I... I, I, it was, I, I if I could just say, it was a very busy week for me. I had received the letter from the committee. We were in the middle of preparing all of the documentation right. requests. Uh, but election. when the White House does these, they like the agency heads to be there. I, I, I try. I think it's important for my employees to see that I am in, I'm engaged in all aspects of GSA, and I do try, even if I have to leave early or come late. Um, now, we're told by some witnesses, uh, there are some witnesses that say you said something, some that say you didn't, and it was a long time ago, but uh, were, did anybody at any point say these were inappropriate subjects where somebody said we should move away from this? Do you remember any of that? I really do not remember anything about this meeting. Okay. But I'm you don't deny that what people are saying. You're not denying. No, no, I'm just not saying. denying what they're saying. I'm simply saying there were cookies on the table. I remember coming in late. I remember um, we had, it seemed like, you know, we had uh, quite a few people who were actually missing. Well, let me just ask you this. Uh, when there are building openings and the like, it is the policy, and is it your policy and the GSA policy, that incumbent members of Congress from both parties be invited to those Absolutely. events? Absolutely. GSA has an incredible record on this. We have federal buildings, we have courthouses, and we have traditionally and consistently invited all members of state congressional delegations. Um, was, there was no conversation about excluding Democrats or excluding one party from any of these openings, was there? Absolutely not. In fact, we try to get everyone to come. And if any of you have not been to a building opening, and I, I, I see Congressman Higgins, you'll have an opportunity, and certainly at the Buffalo Courthouse in a few years. But um, if you have an opportunity to come to one of our building openings, they're incredible things. You can see the truly splendid work that we do at GSA, and, and I think we're really proud of that. So we invite every everyone. And I think um, if you look at my actions, you will find that I have spent an enormous amount of time in outreach activities to and responding to, to Democrats uh, in the last Ms. 10 Ms. Stone, months. what I gather is this is a presentation that the White House was giving to Schedule C employees. You obviously had a lot of other things in your mind. You didn't call the meeting. You didn't approve the slides. You didn't even know what they were going to talk about no, in I a didn't. general sense. And you get them in the end, you say, well, what can we do? Is that basically the, the gist of what I understand the majority saying? You, you look and you say, and they're saying this is somehow a legal violation. They want to run you out of town. I, I honestly, I don't even remember that. Yeah. I, 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 I understand. I know, I know you're talking. I, I think this goes on every day. It happens in Republican and Democratic administrations. This was during during the people's lunch hours. Yes, it is. During now, generally, their lunch hours are free for people to do. Uh, uh, you don't regulate what people do during well, their lunch Well, we don't hour. even regulate what time your lunch hour is. Usually, you can take your lunch right. hour whenever you want. So members came during their lunch hour to do this. And the allegation, I think, from the other side is that somehow because there was a video conference to listen to the White House, that somehow you're to, to blame. You didn't arrange this. This came at the request of the White House. That is true. Thank you very much. Just for the record, in California, it's not lunch hour. So if somebody's video conferencing this in California, while well, it's a lunch hour here, it's early morning there. They might be having an early lunch, respect, Mr. Waxman. You could take your lunch whenever you choose. So if you wanted to arrange your day differently or if you were on. Well, I guess if they, I really, if they really want to pursue this, they can go back to the time slips and they can just yes. see if somebody took a not, an 8 a.m. lunch and a 12 o'clock lunch and maybe they can find some active genocide there that they can hang some but Schedule C on as well. But um, but let me, let me, on. let me go ahead to the Sun, sun Microsystems okay. because there's been a lot of allegations on And this is, I mean, this has happened, I've been in this town a long time. I worked in the Nixon White House. Uh, you know, I was, a, I was a, this is a political town and these are political appointees. And uh, there is no allegation here that there were any actions taken by GSA to retaliate against anybody. That we just finished one election, there weren't even candidates in these races. So it, it has to be put in perspective. Um, and it just shows how desperate they get to, to focus on some meeting that was called by the White House that you attended and some statement you, that there are very variations if everyone will read the record in terms of what people recollect you saying uh, and, and other people saying at that point. Now, did you know uh, on the Sun Microsystems issue, a lot was made with that, they marked Senator Grassley over here and it clearly wasn't that familiar 
uh, with the fact that this is basically a license to hunt. That all Sun Microsystems was trying to do, or you were trying to do, is keep them on the GSA schedule. Is that correct? That is true. Now, because you were on the GSA schedule with certain prices, that isn't necessarily the price the government pays, is it? No, in fact, um, we ask that any government agency also attempt to negotiate a lower price. And of course, then they would compete it probably with maybe two other, three other contracts. So that's a ceiling. Yes, that's a, a, the high end. And then you're trying to drive the price down from there. And in fact, often the prices that are negotiated, because once the Sun Microsystems or any company is on the schedule, they have to compete with that ceiling price against other companies to get the business. Is that correct? Yes, this is all about competition. And Sun Microsystems is a big company, isn't it? They're quite large. You know, I mean, less than 10 percent of their business is federal, as I understand it. That is true. So in, in the scheme of things, uh, their numbers don't rise or fall, and they're doing business with the government, unlike a lot of government contractors. Is that fair to say? That is true. So they could, in theory, just walk away from this, and uh, who wins then? Uh, give us your perspective about why you felt it was important to try to keep uh, Sun Microsystems within the government amber. And I just add, we've already heard Senator Grassley testify that on Medicare Part D, maybe the government can negotiate low prices in some areas, but there are other areas where people walk, where pharmaceuticals walk and don't offer their products and don't give the government the opportunity. Uh, it, that's similar to what could happen in this case. And just walk us through your thought process of why you wanted to bring this to a resolution one way or the other. Sun is a major IT vendor of um of really mammoth proportions. They are very important, especially connected to the internet. Obviously, at least at GSA, we use the internet quite a bit. Um, GSA is the premier procurement agency for the federal government. Our job is to make sure that all different types of technologies, the most innovative, the most um, bleeding edge types of products and services are available to our government community to purchase. And so I feel that as the administrator of GSA and certainly the commissioner, I believe, of um, Federal Acquisition Service would say, it, it's our obligation to make sure that we have the widest array of products and services available to our federal government customers. And for that reason, if nothing else, it, it's really important that we try to to work with all of our many vendors to get them on the schedule. What if a government agency wanted to use a, let's assume for a minute that we had gone the way of the IG and you just knocked them off the schedule. So you're not getting on the schedule. And you had a government agency that wanted to buy a Sun Microsystems product either for continuity of operations uh, or for some other reason that they had the product that met the government's particular need and they weren't on the schedule. How would that agency then go about buying the product and what is the likely cost in that case vis-a-vis -vis buying off a schedule? Well, I, I probably would have to ask you to have Jim Williams give you a lot more clarification on that. But I would tell you that I think that the government agency would probably just in a general way be scrambling a little bit because one of the neat things about the GSA schedule is it's very easy to use. The, it's very easy to get something immediately. And but they could go out for a procurement to try to. They could, but that would take a lot longer probably. Would it cost more probably? It would, uncertainly, it would certainly cost more because you'd also have to then um, add into the cost the procurement officials who'd have to be involved, the statement of works, the uh, source selection committees. So there are good policy reasons for trying to keep them within the government ambit on the schedules. Absolutely. Now, the IG, has, the IG has made a lot of the fact that you mentioned that they might go to NASA soup. Could you explain to us what the NASA soup is? I, I'm familiar with it, but I'm not sure other members are. And what this would mean not only to GSA, but to the costs to the American taxpayers. NASA Soup is another government-wide acquisition contract. It's called a GWAC. And this is a contract vehicle where um, other Similar to a schedule. It's similar, similar to, to a schedule. schedule. They can provide goods and services. However, usually the fee is, is quite a bit more that the government agency would pay on top of the cost of the product. So uh, as a general rule, it's your belief that NASA Soup is a more expensive vehicle for these than, than the that's Jesus. always been my belief, and I think I'm pretty well documented in the press for saying that. Okay. And uh, also, there is a fee involved, correct? If yes, you, there if, is a fee. If, if um, a, an agency were to buy off NASA soup instead of the GSA schedules, that fee would then go to NASA as opposed to your agency, which was suffering budgetary constraints. Is that correct? That is true. That's an additional reason to try to keep them within the ambit if you could. Yeah, that is true. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, did you personally appoint the contracting officers in this case? that would no, negotiate this? I did not even know who they were until I read their name in uh, Congressman Waxman's invitation. Well, what was your role? Was your role here just to try to get a decision that this had been boiling, bubbling for years? We were on extensions, which are generally more, uh, more expensive. 
uh, than uh, negotiating a new contract and you just wanted to get a, re a resolution. What were your instructions to Mr. Williams or whomever you delegated this to? Uh, it was Commissioner Williams, and it, it was very simple. I, I think I was actually at a, a much higher level, Congressman Davis. Uh, my job is simply to provide some managerial oversight into the different processes at GSA. What, what I was interested in is making sure that we were getting the very best value for the American taxpayer. I believe that having Sun Microsystems on a GSA schedule is an important aspect of that. I simply turned to Commissioner Williams and I said, could you look into this? Um, he then took it from there, and we have some very – very competent and incredibly qualified contracting personnel. But there had been an impasse before. I mean, we'd been looking they into this for months. They were at a terrible for, for impasse, and um, I, I think our contracting folks did just an extraordinary job of bringing this to conclusion. We are very proud of the work that they've done. I, I'm proud of my employees. Well, I, I understand that, and we can get into later. Obviously, the IG has a different perspective on this. Um, did you say cut a deal no matter what, or did you just say let's bring it to a conclusion? That's important for us to know. Yeah. I, I don't remember saying cut a deal no matter what. I do s remember saying let us look into this and see what can be done, something along those lines. And two, you're just trying to resolve a problem that had been ongoing for some time. Yeah, I I'm more about options. I'm more about saying what are our options? What can we do to try to make you know things better? Um, I understand that the Federal Acquisition Service Commissioner, Jim Williams, informed Mr. Miller uh, the IG that a contracting officer was being intimidated by an IG employee and asked him to look into it. Did you follow up with the IG about this complaint? Yes, I did. Um, at one of our monthly meetings, it was about a month after Commissioner Williams had brought that to the Inspector General's attention, I, I asked him in the meeting, I said, so, you know, whatever happened, I was hoping I'd hear from you on that. And then I was told uh, in what seemed to me a sort of lackadaisical manner, well, you know, I, I looked into it, nothing was there, or something along those lines. I, I don't want to try to do a direct right. quote because I, I don't remember directly. You don't have a good relationship with the IG, do you, in your, in your agency? Not, not in the agency, but I think that it has been um, wildly mischaracterized in the press. I think we have a budget dispute that has now spiraled into other areas. Um, I believe that uh, the Inspector General believes strongly in independence and oversight. And I think the challenge there is that I do too. It's just that I believe that all, even oversight, needs to have oversight. Okay, let's go to the suspension and debar. Oh, let me no. Let me go to the another issue that has been raised here, and that is on the, the diversity best practices and the contract with Mrs. Fraser. Can you characterize your relationship with Mrs. Fraser? Uh, she was a vendor of you. I mean, she <coughs> bought from you. Isn't isn't that correct? Isn't that how you knew her? Yes, that's true. And for diversity practices, did you feel she was uh, uh, that, that the services her company offered were some of the best in the field? The work that Diversity Best Practices does is almost unparalleled in the area of opening doors and providing opportunities for small, minority, women-owned, service-disabled veteran businesses. Uh, they have done extraordinary work over many, many years. Um, and you'd used them in your own big company, right? Yes, I did. She never hired you for anything, did she? No, she did not. You hired her? Yes. Okay, so, um, now the, uh, walk me through your thought process in terms of this $20,000 purchase order that's been alleged. Was this purchase order, um, was, did any money change hands? There was no money that changed hands, no con uh, government contract was issued, no uh, deliverables. Is that, a, that may be a technical term whether a yeah. contract was issued, but nothing was ever, as I understand it, no money change hands, no performance. This was nixed pretty early on, is that correct? What was yes. your thought process in moving forward with this? The IG in his report says you should have known the thresholds uh, that you were, it, it intimates that you were trying to give a sweetheart deal to a friend. Can no, you, what, why don't you give us an explanation of that from your perspective and your thought process? GSA is failing in opening doors to small and minority businesses. We got an F on our scorecard from the SBA, and uh, sadly, uh, it seems like there's a possibility it might have been well deserved. I thought that doing a study um, of what we're doing with our outreach to small, minority, women-owned, and service-disabled veteran businesses would reveal what are the things that we're doing well, what are the things that we're doing poorly, and the idea there is that once you understand this from an objective source, then you can make a decision to try to do more one and less of the other. Um, as I said in my statement, this is both a personal and a professional the, the, embarrassment. I, I, my time's running out, so I have to. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the question is, why didn't you compete this out and go to a number of firms? Uh, what was your thought process in just giving it to this one company that you knew could do could do the job? 
It's because they are the uh, unparalleled expert in the field of diversity studies. Um, I signed uh, that uh, what I thought was a, um, a draft outline of service confirmation order. I moved it on. I thought it was putting it through the processes. I thought it was going to be uh, turned into purchase order, whatever. But what my job was to do is to try to take action, to show that I wanted to turn this around and to, and to move it forward. This is what I was trying to do. The minute it was brought to my attention that this was done in error, um, and that was when my chief of staff called me and said it was not going to be able to happen, I said, fine. They said they issued a termination. They did. There was the whole time frame from start to finish was about 10 days. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, Mr. Chairman, a uh, point of uh, or I guess a parliamentary inquiry, what time will our official lunch be and when will it begin, 11.30 or 12? Well, we're going to continue on with our hearing. I okay. uh, will now proceed on, in regular order with each member being called uh, in order under the rules uh, for five minutes. And I want to recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Doan, welcome to our committee. And I must tell you oh. that when I heard your opening statement, I was very impressed. But as I, hope, as I listened to your answers to Mr. Braley, I became very concerned. Uh, one of the things I'm concerned about is your memory. Um, you just, in answer to Mr. Davis's question, went back to the Edie Frazier contract. You were able to tell us all kinds of things about that. Uh, that happened back in July of 2006. Uh, Mr. Braley uh, methodically and excellently uh, asked you about an incident that happened two months ago. And it's, uh, it's interesting to me that you don't remember uh, certain things during that. As a matter of fact, you seem like you didn't remember much of anything. But yet and still, you remembered quite well the Edie Frazier contract situation. And that concerns me. And I must tell you uh, that uh, you know this committee has serious questions about whether you violated the Hatch Act, uh, which prohibits federal employees from engaging in partisan politics at the office. Uh, you received training on the Hatch Act several months before the January 26, 2007 meeting, did you not? Yes, I did. And under your understanding of the Hatch Act, are you permitted to ask staff to help a particular candidate or a particular party? No, I'm not. Uh, Ms. Dunn, uh, we asked the Congressional Research Service, which is independent, about the incident at GSA headquarters on January 26. And CRS uh, told us uh, that, uh, well, CRS is, is a nonpartisan research arm of the Congress, so you'll be very clear. We asked CRS about both the White House presentation and about your comments, your alleged comments afterwards. You said you didn't remember that two months ago. I, I, I know that. Uh, in response, CRS issued a report which I would like to make a part of the official hearing record. Without objection, that will be the order. Thank you very much. This is what CRS said. First, on the White House slides that Mr. Braley uh, referred to, CRS said that this presentation raises concerns, quote, the sponsor or presenter is closely affiliated, identified with a partisan political campaign, invitations are directed only to a political, only to political employees of a department, and the objectives and the agenda of the program appear to have a partisan slant. Doesn't that describe what Mr. Jennings did to a T, do you, as much as you, as best you can recall? Could you do each one of those? Do I have to I answer it well, all at one time? Well, well, first of all, you said. Let me go back. Okay. You said you one said one. something very interesting. Okay. You said that these meetings, these brown bag lunches, were for the purpose of team building, uh, and I assume that you want your entire team to be built. Mm -hmm. But these team building lunches were only uh, Republican appointees. So help me with that. On the other hand, you then seem to take a position that oh, you just kind of moseyed in late and didn't remember the very essence of the presentation. Um, and so I, it's sort of hard for me to ask you questions when you don't have a memory from two months ago. And I'm trying to refresh your recollection. Okay. Thank you, Congressman. And I appreciate you giving me that opportunity. And I, I do want to try to make this clear to you. First, as far as what you're considering my memory lapse, I have to tell you, diversity opportunities for small and women-owned business, this is a passion for me. This is something I have dedicated years to. I, I love this. It's important. Of course, I'm going to remember it. I, I have to tell you, polls or, and stuff like that, this, this isn't what, what really motivates me or energizes me. I had a, 
incredible day on the 26th. I had the article in the paper. I had the letter from the committee. I had just gathered together the group of folks who are going to assemble. And you guys got some of these documents. It was a huge submission that we gave to y'all. This was our first time we'd ever done it as a team. Um, you know, I made a submission for, uh, for Congress. There was a lot going on. I came in just a little bit late at the beginning of the meeting. I apologized for coming in late. I didn't mean to, but, but frankly, I had a lot on my mind that day. Well, the question is, is that isn't team building important to you? Team building is important to me, but this was not my meeting, and happily, I didn't, this was one meeting where I did not have to take the lead. I could just sit back and, and coast on that. Do you and believe honestly, from what you've seen so far and heard from so far that this was a violation of the Hatch Act based upon what you learned uh, from your uh, lessons about the Hatch Act? Congressman Cummings, I'm not trying to be, um, uh, you know, snappy or something with you, but I will tell you this. I'm a businesswoman who is now in uh, a government job for her first time, and I will tell you that I cannot make a judgment on this, but I do know that the Office of Spe Special Counsel is looking into this. I know that they are experts on it. I know they're going to make a decision. Would you, would you do, knowing what you it. know now, would you do it again? I think I would. I think I would. Would have you invite to a White House? Oh, absolutely. Um, this, our White House liaison invites all sorts of people. We have people from and, personnel. And have we, charts that talks about targeting. You would uh, do that too. I think that um, we'll probably review charts in the future. There's no doubt about that. I think everything that you do, you try to be better every time you do it. And, and certainly, especially given the concerns of this committee, I do not want this committee to be focused on these issues. We have important things we got to do. But it's our job. Today. That is our job. I know. And that's why, as I said, we will, we will do what we have to to make sure that we have the confidence of this committee in the future because we do have important things we're trying to do at GSA. Gentlemen, and I want you all to be working with me on it to try to make things better. Gentlemen's time has expired. Thank you, Congressman did, did you Cummings. Need, uh, just one question. Did you give $200,000 to the order. GOP? I'm sorry, what? Did you give $200,000 in contributions to the GOP? Yes, I'm, I'm happy to say that Mr. I am Chairman, a are we gonna Republican have and a supporter of the party. I'm proud of it. I, I'm happy that we have President Bush as our president. I think he's a great man in very troubled times. Thank I'm not ashamed much. of this. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, the uh, chair would now recognize for five minutes Mr. Micah. Thank you. Let me yield just a moment. Uh, news flash, uh, the President appointed a Republican to head GSA. I mean, this shouldn't surprise anybody. <laughs> and let me just say, I, I assume that this chart was given all over town. It wasn't given to me, but that they probably gave this to all the different agencies. And that may or may not be a good thing, and this committee is welcome to look at it. But I think to lay it on Mrs. Doan, when you have every federal agency holding meetings with Schedule C, some of them weekly. Uh, monthly. She didn't call this meeting. I think we need to put it in perspective. What it tells me is that they're bankrupt. They're going after personal items where they're, they're bankrupt, so now they're going after a White House political presentation. Well, thank you. Um, well, it, it's kind of interesting to follow what the ranking member said, that uh, originally they went after her for this uh, contract. Uh, when she came in, she, uh, didn't you say that they were getting an F grade or about, they'd gotten an F grade or about to get another one? That's true. Felipe this Mendoza. This is on diversity. This is a uh, uh, some of the diversity of racial uh, employment uh, practices at GSA. Uh, Felipe Mendoza, who is our um, uh, Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization Administrator, came to me. It was probably my sixth, I don't know, I don't want to get an exact date, fifth or sixth day on yeah. the job. And he told me uh, that GSA was getting a failing score from, from um, from the SBA and what could we do? We were failing in our opportunities to provide outreach to small minority and business, business you know, service disabled veteran businesses, hub zone businesses. So, this, so you went at, you, that's the reason you <laughs> You tried. know it. I jumped on it right, you know, okay. I was on it. As a, as a, a Republican minority and, and uh, appointee, this was something important to you. And that's why the $20,000 contract, how much does GSA let in contract? 66 big? Uh, 60, uh, between yeah. 56 so and So this 66. is where they, and this is interesting, because I'm going to follow the IG, because I, I, don't, I don't like his performance. Gra Grassley talked about getting five fired. We may want to, I may want to work with him on six, because I'm not liking the picture that I see in some of the leaks and things that came out of the, I, the IG's office to go after you. And they targeted you. They targeted you, because you just told uh, us in fact, that uh, the day that this occurred was the day you got, you got the, the uh, polit so-called 
political action that was taken and this uh, call, uh, conference call was taken this uh, same day that you got the uh, the inquiry from the committee? Uh, no, no, it wasn't the same day. It was in that same time in the frame. Same we time were in the process in the same of time frame. Yes, it was. Okay. We were preparing the, our submission. That's the point I'm making. And this was a fishing ex uh, expedition to get you. And what they're doing to you, they're going to try to do to other appointees. So this is a good warning for folks. Someone who came out of, uh, uh, as a successful minority business person and took on GSA, she's been there eight months, and they've made this eight months hell for her. Uh, wouldn't you agree with that? It's been challenging. So look at the time, fr look at the time frame. Every, vi every part of the violations under the Sun contract, all of that took place before you ever got there. You came when? June? June 2006. June 1st was my we first day the, on the job. We have the record of, uh, of when that took place, and you were trying to... Sun was a very, you said it was a very important uh, uh, component to government services throughout the government. We have 27,000 vendors, and I want to say in case it's on TV or something, all of my vendors are important, and I'm grateful for your business. <laughs> just... All right. And again, uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the video conference, uh, which they're trying to make a big deal out of, that was the political office of the White House. Schedule C's are what? Political appointees serve at the pleasure. Is that correct? That is true. And what are you? I'm a proud political appointee. Okay. Approved by the, uh, approved oh, by by the, the President of the United States. Yes. And the Senate. And okay. I'm Senate confirmed, yes. Well, again, I, I, this, this is a fishing expedition that I, I've never seen anything like it in targeting. So they couldn't find anything on the $20,000, and it wasn't a contract. It was never a contract. Was it a contract? There's a lot of debate back and forth as to whether it was. But it was a contract ask, let. Um, Ed, was a you, contract let? Answer me. Uh, no, it was not. And I will okay, tell you. Okay, there was no contract. Could I say let. one thing, Congress? People always say, you know, you did a lot of business with the government. How come you really couldn't tell the difference? And one of the things I would like to show you, if you don't mind, is this is what I signed. It was a service order. Attached to it was a draft outline of the study, what we were going to do, try to open doors and opportunities. And this is what I'm used to seeing as a government contract. This is a standard form 33 that usually is the section A, the front page of every government contract. It requires a signature of a contracting officer. This is what I'm used to seeing. This is what I call a government contract. The service order to me, I'm trying to move this study forward. And some of this appears that this is where you rubbed, uh, initially rubbed uh, the wrong way with the uh, Inspector General's office. Is this where the edict came down? No, actually, I think it started um, pretty much in my first week or second week <laughs> on the job when he asked me for well, you all you added to the... Uh... No, no. It was a totally different thing. He asked me for basically additional SES slots, which would have taken all the ones that we had. And at the time... Um, at the time, we were trying to hold them for the fast reorganization, so I think we got off to a little bit of bad start there. Gentleman's time has expired. Recognize Ms. Watson, five minutes. Ms. John, I the... have one just a, additional question. Can I ask that, uh, or uh, does the minority... Our time. We'll do it on our time. <laughs> Retrieving my time. <clears throat> Ms. John, the political activities of GSA seem to be part of a much broader and more troubling trend <clears throat> throughout the entire federal government under this administration. We have learned, for example, how the White House and the Attorney General politicized the hiring and firing of U.S. attorneys. That's going on right now, that debate. And our nation's top law enforcement officers. In fact, we now know that Carl Rove's deputy, Scott Jennings, was involved in both scandals. And this is the only example, this is not the only example. There have been civil rights enforcement at the Justice Department, and they have been undermined by political appointees Drug approvals at the Food and Drug Administration have been based on political calculations, not the best science. Intelligence was twisted by White House officials to build a political case for war in Iraq. And not many people realize this, but there are now more political appointees working in this administration than in any time in our nation's 
history. Now, Ms. Dorn, I know of your political activities, and I know of your donations, and it's fine to be political active. It's your right and your obligation as a citizen, and we understand that. But we've got to maintain the rule of law. When you become a government employee, and when you become responsible for thousands of government employees, then you have a heavy new responsibility. You can't turn that agency into a political tool. And uh, when this was held up, and you said that you did not remember hardly anything in it, that you came late, and you had to leave, you have a heavy week, it's like turning your head away from political activities under your responsibility. And my concern is that what has happened at the GSA may be happening at other agencies throughout this government, and we surely see signs of that. So, Ms. Storn, do you know whether Ms. Jennings, Mr. Jennings gave this presentation at any other federal agencies? I, I don't know anything okay. about that. But he did give it at yours? Yes. Okay. Do you think he prepared this just for the GSA? Or is it more likely that he adapted something he already had? Congresswoman, I have no idea. I think okay. you really would have to ask Mr. Jennings that question. Okay. Do you yield to me? I'll yield, Mr. Jennings. Sounds like it's not just GSA, because the way the Republicans on our committee say it's just routine practice, it's done everywhere. Well, I think we ought to find out if that's the case, because it is a violation of the Hatch Act. Thank you. Yeah, I hope that he didn't just target your agency to hold you responsible for politicizing whatever goes on at GSA in your agency, and why did he choose you? So I have some suspicions there. I, I cannot possibly speculate on I, I know. I'm not asking okay. you to. I'm stating an opinion oh, okay. from sorry. what I heard. And uh, I don't think that this presentation is just tailored to GSA. <laughs> Instead, it reads like a presentation that might have been given to other agencies across the government. And I think that this committee has the authority and the right to have oversight. Why did they choose your agency to make this presentation? This is clearly targeting Democrats to take their seats. Clearly, that is the purpose of this. General Lady Yield. It, I will in, yield. In the Mr. last uh, few seconds she has. You said pa politics is not your passion. No, no, I did not say that. But you gave $200,000. No, no, I said polls, polls. I see, but politics is one of your passions. You gave politics 200 should be the passion of every American citizen. Yes. This is what makes our country run. Great. You gave $200,000 to the Republican Party, and you spoke at the Republican National Convention. Isn't that What's accurate? Wrong with that? Regular order. No, if Nothing. I could just, I'm just ask. I'd actually like I'm going to say reclaim that. my time. Regular order. You don't have I'm any. Going, I think I am uh, a sorry. I'm going to okay. reclaim my time. You the don't have red. any time. The light's red. Mr. Chairman, red. Uh, you cannot order. tell me that, and would you please Chairman, let me reclaim can we have my time? Order. How much time do I have? 15 seconds. Yeah, without objection, everybody is taking my time. Will be Without objection, we will extend a courtesy to the gentlelady uh, for one additional minute, and we'll do the same for other members. Thank you very much. I am trying to make a point here. And I thank Ms. Dorn, your agency has been targeted, and you have been used to spread White House politicizing in your department. I am so pleased that we are doing what we should do and that is to have these oversight hearings to hear where there are violations of our laws, rules, and regulations. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Thank uh, you, Ms. Watson. Just inquiry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, what is your inquiry? Parliamentary inquiry. Yeah, what is your well, parliamentary inquiry? Yes, please. Parliamentary inquiry is you just granted one additional minute to the majority side. 
uh, is, is this a new change in policy, and can I obtain one additional minute on the minority? Well, you have five additional minutes that other members didn't have, and I asked without objection, should be given another minute, and well, I would hope if a member... if it wouldn't be granted to me, could it be granted to another member? I will member now recognize... Five minutes, so we could have uh, equality Meeting, uh, in the regular uh, the order is Mr. Issa, who is now recognized. Responsible for investigations and oversight. Mr. Mr. Are we Chairman. going to be equal no, no, no. in conducting investigations you're, and oversight, or are we going to grant uh, the majority your point additional is, time and not the minority? Oh, I want that question answered. Oh, please. Oh, I want please. the question answered. If this someone is a question asks for of one of the most important committees in the Congress. You want the question answered or you want to speak? Investigations and oversight. And are you going to grant special consideration to their side of the aisle and not to this side of the aisle? Now, I chaired for, for 10 years. Does the gentleman uh, wish an answer uh, or does he wish to talk? Uh, and I chaired two of the committees well, the chair will in now this committee. Recognize Civil service and Mr. also Issa, criminal and justice using his time and drug he policy. And I never never uh, denied the opportunity for a minority member or cut them off in questioning. And I expect the same courtesy for my members. Are we going to have, what is the policy? Uh, this is a parliamentary inquiry and procedures of the, uh, the conduct of one of the most important investigative committees of the, of the uh, United States Congress that dates back its function to, to uh, the early 1800s. The gentleman has stated a parliamentary inquiry and the chair is prepared to answer his parliamentary inquiry. Under the rules, members are given five minutes for question. By unanimous consent, an additional minute may be given. Under the rules, we ask that uh, only opening statements today be given by Mr. Davis and myself. We ask unanimous consent for the gentleman that's complaining to have five minutes that other members didn't get. If a member on the Republican side or the Democratic side asks for additional time, it will be up to the members, and I would hope that members would be generous enough not to cut people off so uh, the time now is to uh, Mr. Issa, and I will start the five minutes uh, for him so he'll have his complete time. <clears throat> Mr. Issa, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And on my five minutes, I would like to ask that regular order be strictly adhered to <laughs> unless there's unanimous consent. And I, I trust in the future we can eliminate this problem by doing so. I think if we're going to ask the GSA and other organizations to strictly adhere to the rules, regulations, and laws, we should do no less. Uh, Administrator Doan, uh, Doan? Doan. Doan, thank you. Uh, I, I'm frustrated because I came out of the business world too. And I came to this committee to fight the bureaucracy that sits around us and behind us uh, throughout all of government. The people who are there when you arrive and will be there when you're gone. Now, I just want to concentrate on one simple thing. Your team, your team building. These are people chosen, some confirmed and some just straight appointments, but like yourself, many are confirmed by the Senate. They're chosen by the elected President of the United States to oversee and to provide policy guidance and control over the largest body of human beings that exist on the face of the earth working for a government, our U.S. bureaucracy. Isn't that right? That is true. And in your eight months, I think you probably found what I found in my nearly seven years now, that this is a bureaucracy that will resist you at every point, isn't it? You are absolutely right. So when you talk about team building, including a reminder that you work at the pleasure of the president, it is not inappropriate for you to understand, as this, the slides, the ones they don't tend to show you, show that this president was right in the middle in his last midterm of how, much he, how many seats he lost in the House. That's, that's informational, isn't it? Yes, it's public domain. And when you're looking at the president, presentation by the president, and how the president views his working relationship and how he views this, you're receiving a briefing from the man who appointed you and for whom the Senate confirmed you. That's true. So, you know, the amazing thing here, and I, I don't want to take a lot of time talking about the body up here, but would it shock you to find out that members of perhaps this committee's majority staff and certainly personal staff members of some of the people on that side and some of the people on this side, they go to, to either the Republican committee or the Democrat committee and they make fundraising calls on their lunch hour for members of Congress, these federal employees. Would that shock you to find out? Thank you for telling me. Would you be shocked to find out that, well, uh, chiefs of staff, chiefs of mission, if you will, to our districts come back here 
uh, to, uh, to be briefed on federal expense. Federal expense, we bring them back here, we put them up in housing, and guess what? They go to evening events either at the Democrat committee or the Republican committee's expense to find out how they can do a better job of keeping their member in office. Would that surprise you? I didn't know that before, but thank you. Well, the American people probably are surprised. And yet, in fact, that is a system that the chairman is well aware, uh, chairwoman and so on are all well aware of. But I want to go back to the team building. You've been building a team to take this incredibly large bureaucracy, one that was receiving Fs for how it dealt with disabled vets that had businesses, veterans that had businesses, African Americans that had businesses, women that had businesses, and for that matter, small businesses in general, it had an F for reaching out and providing opportunities for those contracts. That's one of the major things you're working on, isn't it? That is one of many initiatives, but it is a passion of mine, yes. And it's, a, it's something that this Congress and this Oversight Committee has wanted you to do, isn't it? That's very true because, you know, it's, it's hard enough as it is if you're a small or minority or woman-owned business or a service-disabled veteran. You know, I don't want working with the federal government to be yet another barrier or challenge for them. Well, I'll tell you, I, uh, I was recently given a small award by my university and I was honored with Ronnie Harris, the Golden Gloves champion of Mexico City. And he's an African-American small businessman in Ohio. And he finds it very frustrating uh, with a successful business doing business with the government. And you know what? It has nothing to do with the fact that it happens to be minority owned. It's just hard to do business with agencies, including the GSA. So I, I for one, commend you for concentrating on what's important, which is building a team that will break through the bureaucracy and will meet the objectives that the American people care about. And one of the most important is making your organization responsive to small and emerging businesses and giving them opportunities. And I'd like you just to tell us for a minute in the remaining time how you're doing that and, and, and how this committee should be helping you do more of that. We're doing, an, at least we're trying as hard as we can to do a much, much better job. The first thing we've done is we've finally, as I told you, been able to start awarding schedules in 30 days. This is the best and first opportunity for small and minority businesses to be a prime contractor, and that helps them with cash flow. The second thing we've done is we just made the largest award of a actual work, not just a, license, a hunting license, the get-go contract for IT infrastructure support to a service-disabled 8A company. We're really proud of that. It's the largest award of its kind. Um, we've just, uh, we have Alliance Small Business. We have a lot of small business opportunities that are going to be out there, and even our SATCOM, our satellite, a procurement that's ongoing, very unusual. It's going to have a professional services component that will be for small and minority businesses. We are trying really hard to carve out opportunities because, you know, everybody can talk a good story, but when you're in the small business community, you want efforts that have real meat to them. You want actual funding to go to your business. You don't want it to just be an open vehicle that has nothing, you know, behind it. This is what we're trying to change. Gentlemen's Thank time you. has expired. Sorry, I, I know so I, we, we allow full answer to okay. the questions, but the question period is limited. Uh, I want to recognize Mr. Higgins, and as I do, I want to inform all the members that it would be a violation of the law for them to make phone calls from their office soliciting contributions. We have to go elsewhere to do it. We don't use our offices, nor many of us think uh, government offices should be used. Mr. For Chairman, let me yes. just note, but the rules pertaining to fundraising are different than other items. <coughs> Members of politic in this building all the time, Democratic conferences, Republican, talk about politics within this building and within the Capitol and the conferences. You can't raise money. No one solicited money in this case. Uh, I accept your point. Uh, Mr. Higgins. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just let me, uh, before I uh, ask Ms. Stone several questions, let me just clarify this issue of, of <coughs> lunch hour and whenever this had occurred, that it doesn't matter under the Hatch Act whether it was during the lunch or whether she invited employees. Uh, under the Hatch Act, uh, the administrator is not allowed to be present at a political event uh, on or off federal property in which these activities happened uh, if her subordinates uh, were at the event, even if they came voluntarily, because it is considered inherently coercive. Uh, Ms. Stone, the committee has obtained internal emails between the White House and GSA regarding political presentation of Scott Jennings uh, that he gave at GSA. 
I want to ask you about those, uh, and they will appear up on screen here. Is that document? What, is that what this is? Uh, yes, it's oh, in yeah. your packet. I'm sorry. Let me uh, first direct your attention to the email dated January 19th, 2007, which on page which is in one, on page one of your documents. Um, this email is from Jocelyn Webster, who works for Mr. Jennings at the White House. And she is writing to Tessa Truesdale. I understand that Ms. Truesdale is your confidential assistant? Yes, yeah, she works at, with, at, um, in the administrator's office for me. In this email, uh, Mr. Jennings' assistant is sending a copy of Mr. Jennings' slides to GSA. And this is what Mr. Jennings' assistant says. Quote, please do not email this out or let people see it. It is a closed hold, and we're not supposed to be emailing it around, end of quote. My question is, uh, can, t can you tell me uh, why Mr. Jennings' assistant uh, says this is close hold and why you are not supposed to be emailing this around? I, I can't imagine since I'm not actually on this email. I think um, probably either Jocelyn or Joycelyn, I'm not sure who, what her name is, Joycelyn Weber maybe, Webster or maybe Tessa Tuesdale could answer that, but uh, this isn't my email. I would like you to look closely at the email from Mr. Jennings' assistant. Is that the same one? Yes. Oh, okay. An email, uh, an image of the email is up on the screen. Uh, if you look at the email address, you can see that Mr. Jennings' assistant is sending this from GWB43.com account. The GWB43.com domain is owned by the Republican National Committee. Do you know why Mr. Jennings' assistant emailed this from a Republican National Committee account instead of a White House account? No, I do not. This is not my email and it was not addressed to me. Do you know of any reason why Mr. Jennings' assistant would try to hide that she was communicating from the White House? No, I, I don't. I'm, I, I'm not familiar with her and this is not my email. Or Let me put up another email uh, on the screen. That's a document 2-432. This is uh, on page two of your packet. Yes, I've got it. This one is from Mr. Jennings himself. He is using the Republican National Committee email account too. In this email, Mr. Jennings is using his GWB43.com account to communicate GSA's with communicate to communicate with GSA's White House liaison, JB Horton. My question is, were you aware that your staff was communicating with the White House officials? who used email accounts controlled by the Republican National Committee? No, I was not. Let me show you another email on page three of your packet. This one is from your confidential assistant, Ms. Truesdale. She had apparently been contacted by GSA staff who wanted to do a trial run with a copy of the presentation on GSA's audiovisual equipment. Ms. Truesdale says that she can't share the document for use in a pre-meeting walkthrough. Here is what she says, quote, I just heard back from the presenter, and as much as the information is highly sensitive, he would prefer not to email it, end of quote. Ms. Stone, the emails show that Ms. Jen Jennings, Mr. Jennings regarded the briefing as, quote, highly sensitive, end of quote. His assistant also called them close hold, that other people should not see. Do you know why he would regard the briefing as highly sensitive? No, I don't. I think you would have to speak to the person whose email and all this attachments that it was. I think the answer, Mr. Chairman, uh, is obvious. Uh, the briefing is highly secretive because it contains partisan political analysis and strategy. The White House didn't want to share their target list with Democrats, and they didn't want Democrats to know whom they regarded as most vulnerable Republican members. It's perfectly appropriate for party leaders to compose these kinds of political hit lists and to hold discussions about political strategy among party officials. It is not appropriate to use government agencies to advance partisan political agendas. Yet that is exactly what happened here. GSA's top, top officials were assembled to hear a presentation about targeting Democratic members in the upcoming elections. And then they discussed how GSA could help Republican candidates. And they did this in a government building during a weekday where these officials should have been doing business with the American people. Mr. Chairman, I would like to make one other observation. 
Mr. Jennings and other White House officials appear to be using their Republican National Committee email accounts on a routine basis to discuss politically sensitive topics. We know from documents obtained by the Judiciary Committee, for example, that Mr. Jennings used the identical Republican National Committee account to discuss the U.S. Attorney firings that he was involved with. And we know this from the committee's work that the Abramoff investigation that the White House used Republican National Committee email accounts to communicate with Mr. Abramoff and his staff. I think this is a subject the committee should investigate and, I would, and it would be a serious abuse if White House officials were using these political email accounts to subvert the requirements of the Pre Presidential Records Act. It has expired. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. Uh, Mr. Burton? <clears throat> I used to be the chairman of this committee. My picture's here someplace. I know. I you I look just like it. I, I, I want to tell you, Mr. Uh, Doan, I really appreciate you coming here and being very open. And I want to thank you for the $200,000 for the Republican Party. I wish more <laughs> people would do that. Now, I have great respect for my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. I've worked with them on a lot of legislation. And Henry and I, the chairman, he was my ranking Democrat for six years. And I want to tell you a little, give you a little bit of history lesson, because this is pretty interesting. We had over 100, maybe 150 people that we had as witnesses that were dealing with the Clinton administration that either took the Fifth Amendment or left the country. <laughs> they wouldn't even talk to us. We had to issue over 1,200 subpoenas to get people to come up from the White House to talk to us. And every time we did that, Henry would say, this is a witch hunt, this is a witch hunt, this is a witch hunt. So I just want to say to my good friend Henry, you know, there's nothing as self-righteous as a reform lady of the evening. <laughs> now, let me go into a few things that happened during my tenure as chairman. We had two guys that were downloading FBI confidential files into home computers, which is illegal. These are top secret things. Two guys, Marcisa and Livingston. You know, when we had them before the committee, they could not remember who hired them at the White House. Now, the, Mr. Aldrich, who was the FBI agent to work down there, said that uh, he was told by the chief of staff that Hillary Clinton hired them. But of course, when we brought that up in a committee, my God, this is a witch hunt. You can't talk about that. But they were downloading FBI files into home computers so they could get stuff on Republicans to give us a hard time. We had a guy named Johnny Chung come before the committee who told us he got $300,000 from the head of the Communist Intelligence Agency in uh, Hong Kong uh, in, a, in a restaurant saying that he wanted to give it to the Clinton administration because he said he thought President Clinton was doing a good job and he wanted him reelected. This was illegal. But once again, this was just a, a witch hunt. We had a guy named John Johnny Hill, uh, John uh, uh, Wong, that was Johnny Chung, the first one. John Wong, who was a, a member of the Lippo Group, said that the Lippo Group of Indonesia gave the Clinton administration millions of dollars in the illegal campaign funds. But once again, this was a witch hunt. Uh, we had people come from the White House. I had the chief of staff at the White House, his assistant, the chief counsel at the White House, person after person at the White House come down here and testify about all these things, and they couldn't remember a thing. We had what we called an epidemic of selective memory loss. It was really a, a, a difficult time. And all the while that this was going on, my good friend, Mr. Waxman, kept saying, uh, in the media and all over the country, oh, Burton's on a witch hunt. This is terrible. These are horrible things that were going on. So I just want to tell you, Ms. Doan, you are here. You have not taken the Fifth Amendment. You have not fled the country. You're a patriotic American, and I appreciate what you are doing by testifying here today. And don't let these guys intimidate you, and you haven't, and I really appreciate that. Now, I have high res regard for my Democrat colleagues, and I see a lot of new members over there. But before you start pointing fingers about something that really can't be proven, this is all spurious uh, arguments that are being made, but before you start pointing a figure, a fingers, please do me a favor, do me a favor. Go back and look at six years of investigations that we conducted when I was chairman of this committee and find out how many people in the administration couldn't remember things, how many people wouldn't talk, how many fled the, the country or took the Fifth Amendment, and then come back and say to me, well, we want to be fair. And I yield the balance of my time to Mr. Davis. On the email. Before you, uh, 
yield to Mr. Davis. I just want to point out. Uh, Can we have make sure this time doesn't count, uh, Mr. Well, Watson? I don't know how to stop the clock, but you've got one minute left, and oh, we we are able to stop it. Uh, I just want to say, to Mr. Burton, his characterizations today are inaccurate, wrong. It, this is my time. Let me just say. Let's go and get all the newspapers and the reports from the committee and look at them. We'll, well find out how inaccurate they are. Look at the papers and look at the records. You did that for six years, and now you're going to have to eat it. Let me ask. If, uh, I, uh, if I might just speaker, conclude I just, very, very briefly. I just want to get. I would like to put in uh, the record a report that we did on Mr. Burton's investigation so people can see what we thought was going on. And we also heard what you had to say that you thought was going on. So without objection, that report will be made part of the record. As long as mine's in there, I don't object. Uh, Mr. Chairman, no, I, uh, Mr. Davis is, uh, I don't have an additional has the last minute. minute. Thank you. Um, you know, officials appointed by the President with the advice and the consent of the Senate who are in policy determining positions and certain presidential aides are have restrictions, uh, I mean, are exempt from restrictions in the no politics portion. So I don't think a lot of this applies to you. But in any way, the Office of Special Counsel is looking at this. They are. D despite members' individual opinions on this, I think what will be there will be. What I think is clear here is that this is now turning into an assault less on you. I think you have requited yourself well today than on the administration and raises other issues I, I suspect the committee will be uh, looking at over time. I just want to ask for the record, uh, the emails that came to your aid that were put up on the board uh, a couple of minutes ago, uh, did you ever see those? Do you recall seeing those? No, I did not. So a lot of uh, emails go to aides and stuff that never gets on your desk. Is that correct? That is very true. Okay. I just wa I wanted to clarify that for the record. Uh, once again, this was uh, n this is nothing that she did. This is something the White House evidently does on a fairly routine basis. And uh, I as far as you go, what the initial allegations against you have now turned into just a lot of political mud fighting. Unfortunately, thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. We will now uh, go to uh, Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, looking at the GSA mission statement again, um, it talks about respect for fellow associates, professionalism. Excuse me, Congresswoman, could, could you talk just a tad louder? Well, there's been so much yelling going on, I thought maybe a softer voice might be appreciated. Um, under the GSA uh, general admissions uh, missions, uh, your values are listed. Ethics. Ms. McCullum, would you speak right into the mic? I'm even having trouble I, hearing I you. I couldn't get much closer to it, Mr. Chair, so okay, maybe thanks. I don't have a good mic. Uh, ethics and integrity in everything we do, respect for fellow associates, teamwork. When uh, you received the briefing on the, on the Hatch Act, did you sign any off any information? Did they give you any booklets to get home? I worked in the private sector for a long time and on our ethics uh, in retail to make sure that my employees were doing things. They were handed a, a, a booklet. They, were, they signed off on something. And once you signed off on it, you became responsible for it. It was your responsibility to read it all. Do you recall if you were given anything? Uh, Congresswoman, I, I know I'm under oath, so I have to tell you. I, I can't remember, but what I can do is I can, uh, you know, we can check and then I can come back to you with this after the hearing with exactly. I do know that I have an, an ethics letter that I had signed when I became a, a presidential uh, appointee and that was done by the general counsel's office, you know, and, and I signed off on that and I know I did that. Uh, I did attend a Hatch Act briefing. But what, what I'm having a little trouble remembering is whether there was actually a document that at the time of the briefing I had to sign off. But I can check and follow up with you on that. Would well, you like me to do well, that? Well, once any one of us signs off on those things, we assume a responsibility, a very serious responsibility, especially when we're supervising individuals. Class C employees are not exempt from the Hatch Act. They're not exempt. So um, I want to go back very seriously. Um, to a letter on March 13th uh, to, that you sent to this committee, in which you stated that there were no improper political actions that occurred during or as a result of the January 26th teleconference. But your statement doesn't square with the facts because Class C employees are not exempt from the Hatch Act. You also uh, today 
and um, I believe you read it, so you might want to uh, find it, because I don't want to misquote you or misrepresent anything you've said. You talked about advancing the policy of the administration. Well, what happened at this lunch is you were advancing the policy of Karl Rove and Mr. Jennings, either with the best of intentions or with no intentions by what happened. So let's, let's, let's go back to the slides. These slides are clearly partisan. They're from the point of view of a Republican. They're not saying team Democrats, independents, and Republicans. They say us versus them, in fact. Slide um, 2566 is called Lost Ground with Swing Voters. And let's, uh, Which one are we I going? believe you have Do that you have in a front of you. have a number or something? Uh, 566. It's, 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 up, it's upside down. It's up there, but uh, it, 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 uh, it's right side up. Lost grounds with swing voters. Republicans or Democrats? This is the Republicans losing ground, is it not? Can I check with somebody? Well, it, uh, we'll go to another slide. Okay. Honestly, I am happy to um, get an official opinion. And, and if you say that it is, let's, we can just assume it is and let's go on. Sli uh, slide, uh, slide two. Five, six, seven. Okay. Bigger, bigger losses, losses among men. men. Who had the bigger losses, Republicans or Democrats? It's Republicans. Okay. The next slide. Five, six, eight. Long-term problems among Latinos in youth vote. Who has the long-term problem? Democrats? The, it's not. The us and all of these slides are referring to the Republicans. Can you tell? And here's the last one I'm going to show. Five, seven, six. Oh, okay. This one shows that Republicans' 72-hour get-out-the-vote effort made a difference in several races. You can see that this slide refers to our strategy, meaning the Republican strategy. They're not talking about the independent strategy or the Democratic strategy in 2008. So I'm asking you, your statement in writing, you regarded this briefing as team building among GSA appointees. What kind of team do you think this presentation was building? An independent, a Democrat, Gen or a Republican team? Gentle ladies, uh, time has expired, but the witness will be permitted to answer. I, I think she was just really probably trying to make a statement, so that's, that's fine. Obvious. Well, it sounded like a question to me. You don't want was to respond. Was it a question? What kind of team were you building? What kind of team were you building? Uh, I am building the most incredible team in all of government with incredible managers. Honestly, you guys, if we get past this and everything, you got, let me send you their bios. You have got to look at these people. You have never seen anyone like these managers that I've brought in. I've brought in people. These are not your regular government people. These are people from the outside. This is new blood. It's a great team. You got to give them a chance. You really do. Okay, gentle ladies, uh, time has expired. Mr. Shays, you're next uh, well, up for question. May I ask how many uh, members on the other side are still waiting to ask well, questions? Well, we got a lot of them over here. Could we well, reserve? Could we reserve time? Well, no, we this is my time, and I'd like to reserve it. Well, okay, you. the gentleman uh, will be called on later. So next in order uh, in the committee is um, Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my questions are really trying to go to the process inside of, of GSA, and so I'm particularly concerned about the questions are, that have been raised on the Sun Microsystems, Sun Microsystems. contract. Um, it appears that for two years the career contracting officials um, inside of GSA were refusing to renew the contract because Sun wasn't giving the kind of pricing that it was giving to its commercial customers, as I understand it. And then the government, which really means taxpayers, uh, pay tens of millions of dollars more than we should have paid because Sun concealed larger discounts that the company was giving to the private sector. And I'm curious as to your role in this. The committee interviewed uh, one of the career contracting officials on the Sun negotiation. 
a fellow named Mike Butterfield. And he was opposed to signing the contract, as I understand. And he told the committee that he had warned that signing a deal with Sun, quote, would mean getting discounts that would be inferior, end quote. But after he made his recommendation to end the negotiations, Jim Williams, who's your commissioner of the Federal Acquisition Service, told him that you wanted the Sun contract done anyway. And I believe his exact words to Mr. Butterfield were, quote, Loretta wants this contract awarded, end quote. So my question is, did you tell Mr. Williams that you wanted the Sun contract to be done in spite of all of these reservations that had been brought forward? I cannot give you an exact verbatim quote, but what I can tell you is the sense of it, and that is that I spoke with Commissioner Williams and told them that I needed him to use his best judgment, put his best people on the effort, and try to understand what is the sense of it. I think uh, if you could just possibly allow me to give you just a little bit of the context of all of this. It only came to my attention because I was uh, sort of abruptly told that uh, some microsystems had been referred for some kind of criminal uh, judgment, or that's probably not the legal word, but um, to the Department of Justice. And I was absolutely astounded, because this was the first I had ever heard of this, and yet I'd had, you know, multiple meetings with my inspector general, it had somehow never come up. And so that was sort of the entry point where I, I, I became engaged. But at no time uh, in either event have I ever intervened. Um, I do not believe that I have been intrusive in any way. I do believe that as the head of the agency, I have not just a right, but also an obligation to be informed, to understand what's going on, and to make um, some uh, actions uh, transparent to everyone within our community. So obviously Sun Microsystems is a technology vendor that falls under our Federal Acquisition Service, our Commissioner Jim Williams. We were all, all of senior management, um, totally, totally in the dark. We did not know any of these challenges were going on connected to the Department of Justice because we had not been apprised, we had not been kept informed, we would not been briefed. This was just completely mind-boggling to me that something of this scope could have happened with repercussions across the entire federal government and that nobody, not anybody, would have seen fit from the IG's office or the, you know, nowhere. They never came to me. They never came to my chief of staff. They never came to the commissioner who is directly affected and oftentimes meets with these people every day. Yeah, I'm, I'm, they never did thank that. Thank you. I'm, no, I'm no, not and, as interested. Actually, I'm not but, as but interested. But I thought, is, this in, isn't my time? I'm not as interested in that oh, particular. I'm oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I thought uh, that was my time to talk. I'm, I'm not as interested in sorry, that this is particular my first theory, issue. So, you know, what okay. what okay. I'm going to is, is that the, the people that were most familiar with the contract who were bringing forth their concerns. Now, it's interesting because you said the context you wanted to give me was that your message back was exercise your best judgment. But that directly contradicts um, the message that, that Mr. Butterfield feels he was receiving, what, which was, despite your concerns about this contract, we want this to be done. And when Mr. Butterfield held his ground and refused to sign the contract, what happened to him? I've never met Mr. Butterfield, and I didn't realize that he was the contracting officer. I do not know what happened to him, but I will tell you that what you're saying, I truly believe is what you're implying, rather, seems untrue. What I uh, know is that Jim Williams is a great commissioner for the Federal Acquisition Service. He has stellar judgment, and we have great contracting officers. I don't know what... Um, Butter, uh, Mike Butterfield said, I don't really know what Jim Williams says, but what I do know well, is Mr. that Butterfield, I have said what that he told the committee was that he was replaced by another contracting officer named Shana Budd, who then signed the contract. And the no, inspector excuse general me, who negotiated a great deal for the American people and in the process of doing that signed a contract. Yeah, well our information is that it wasn't a great deal for the for we the We must American beg to people. differ on this. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, just thirty thirty seconds. Without objection, quick. the gentleman will be given one additional minute. Thank you very much. Um, 
What I'm concerned about is the message that gets sent down from high levels to professionals in these, in these agencies. And this is adding sort of the third, the third leg to a three-legged stool I see in terms of an assault on, on federal employees. The first piece that we've seen in your hearings, Mr. Chairman, is cutting resources to people that are trying to do their job. The second piece is contracting services out without the oversight that ought to be with them. And the third piece, which is evidence here, is that when people try to do their job and they bring their best judgment to the table, they are overruled from above in a way that I think is demoralizing for people in that agency. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sarbanes. Uh, Mr. Chase. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate um, you recognizing me. And I, I want to say to you, Ms. Stowen, I, um, I, I think you have a remarkable history and you should be very proud of your accomplishments as a minority businesswoman who did something any American would be so grateful to do, create a business that you could be so proud of. Uh, and you did it, uh, and many of us have it. And I congratulate you for that. I also want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your service to our country, for your willingness to step in and basically make so much less than you make as, a, as in the private sector uh, and want to serve a president you believe in. And I appre particularly appreciate it because now the president isn't so popular. Uh, and the end thing is to say you hardly know the man. And uh, good for you. Um, you know, with hindsight, um, I would have recommended to the White House they not do this chart, and I would have recommended they should know to have probably said to you, you know, this shouldn't happen on a government site. But this wasn't about how you're going to raise money. It wasn't how you were going to undermine Democrats. Uh, it helped explain why we lost, and I, and I think we, Republicans. You know, we lost because of corruption issues. We lost because we weren't doing things as well as we should have. You know, a terrible thing for someone to have learned. Frankly, I'm happy that that, that would have been conveyed so it would tell you that, you know, if you want to help your country and you want to help someone you believe in, just do a good job. That's the message that I heard. And it's my understanding, and I want to say this, that when you've had events, that you make sure Republican and Democrats all know about it. And I fully understand if a Democrat administration is in power, you know, they might notify our two senators, or at least one of our senators first, um, before they notify me, but they're going to invite me. And they're not going to say I've done a great job. They'll say the senator has. I understand that, and I don't lose sleep yeah, about it. I feel like this committee is straining out gnats and swallowing camels at this particular <laughs> hearing. We've had a lot of very important hearings. This isn't one of them. With that, I'd like to yield time to my colleague. You never met Mr. Butterfield, to your recollection, isn't that correct? I still have not yet. But and I just refer the gentleman to uh, Ms. Buds, the, who did negotiate that, her comments that we put in the record earlier in the day. Sun Microsystems were referred to the Department of Justice, it's my understanding, from the IG. That is, is that what I believe. Did you do anything to stop them from being referred? Did you step in the way and say, we can't do this? No, I did not. You just let the ordinary process take its way and let well, the professionals. Well, apparently, it actually had already been done, but nobody bothered to inform me. It was had already happened two years before. And, I mean, two and, weeks before. And it would be helpful to know that, wouldn't it? It would have been nice to have at least had a courtesy memo dropped to me or something. And that's really part of the problem here, isn't it? Is well, the IG is, who's it, supposed it, to report to you just? Is and it, he doesn't. And it's it's hard because we sit with our vendors, and they feel in many ways that we're two-faced and we're not, you know, we're not understanding of their issues. And it's very hard when you're sitting in a meeting with someone and they know they've been referred to the Department of Justice and you're smiling and doing a meet and right. greet and you don't bring it up. And it looks like we're duplicitous when the truth of the matter is we were simply uninformed. Um, we don't debar companies for referrals to DOJ, do we? No, we do not. It's not in the rules, is it? No, I think there has to be a ruling and a finding and wrongdoing. Yeah, found, there has to be an nothing, adjudication. Nothing has happened in that area yet, to my understanding. But so if you were to debar them or throw them out for, for this and there had been no adjudication, you'd probably be in violation of the law, wouldn't you? Well, yes, but I don't think debarment would be happening even as a result. That's for Department of Justice to decide what has to happen. Exactly. I, um, I think. If, if they were convicted, Oh, can, you, can I just correct it? Because I don't you, know. There's you're someone, not an attorney, so the, the general counsel for GSA is making wild signals to me. Is that not quite right? Oh, okay. No, no, but I'm saying would de not the renewing Department the, of Justice not, has to decide first. Not renewing the contract would be de facto yes. department. Okay, right. That's my point. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, if, um, but if 
if uh, Sun Microsystems is adjudicated, if justice sees merit in this and moves forward, they could still debar be debarred, right? Yes, it would then come to our suspension and debarment official, and then he would take that action. And that has not happened, has it? No, that has not. And if that came up, then you would review it on its face and, and weigh all the other factors? Well, well I wouldn't be the, the we, I actually have delegated that authority to the suspension and debarment official at GSA. Well, that brings me up because there were some allegations earlier about uh, there was, uh, the, and you might say this worse, the big five accounting firms, or four, I don't want to slight anybody here, <laughs> were going to be debarred in mass, and you were told about that, and what would that have done to the government to not have been able to get the accounting from the biggest accounting firms and have them eligible to do audits? That would have crippled. It would have been devastating, especially since initially when the email came to me, it was two weeks before the end of the fiscal year. But you didn't do anything to interfere with that, did you? No, I, I simply, it was a Sunday. I, I just wanted to be informed. I, I was hoping people could wait till Monday to do it. Can you imagine what would have happened if a debarment official debarred the big four accounting firms with government audits coming on and we had to go to smaller companies that did not have the level of expertise to get this done, and uh, it, all of a sudden we were and, and at that point you didn't Mr. know Chairman, about Mr. Chairman, could I ask unanimous consent from my colleague? It's my time. I've got, this is your time. Um, it is my time, and could I ask for unanimous consent for additional minute? I'll let uh, Mr. Davis complete his sentence, Thank but you. we have a... Could I ask for any unanimous sense uh, uh, for there, an additional minute? The chair will object because we do want to get another member right. able to ask questions Well, let me, let me we just, I guess, I, I think my point is simply this. My understanding is that you just made an inquiry at that point and wanted to be informed. You did nothing to interfere with that decision. I did not. But had you not been informed and that, in fact, took place, uh, it, can you I imagine be coming up before this committee at that point and, and, and yes. saying you were out of the loop? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me ask you this question. Jim Williams, your uh, Commissioner of Could uh, I raise Federal point Acquisition of order. Service. Point of order, Mr. Speaker. The chair, chair has point taken, of order. the chair has not taken his time. And are you yielding yourself? I am, five I, I am asking a question. And that's, I that's my know answer to your point of order. Time. I'm uh, raising a point of order. I would like to know if your you're yielding yourself five minutes now. I am yielding myself one minute. Point of order. Point of order. Sure. Question again to the. The parliamentary the, uh, inquiry about the rules the, the, of the uh, Look, you've committee. carried on. You've carried on enough today. I would like to ask a question. I have a parliamentary Jim Williams, uh, uh, your I commissioner a of federal inquiry. acquisition services, told the inquiry. committee that he knew of the Department of Justice inquiry. referral in early August. Did he not inquiry. tell you that? And do you know why he didn't tell you if he did? Parliamentary didn't? inquiry. I, I don't know what uh, Jim Williams told y'all. Um, what I do know is that I was, I think it was, I think it was the, I don't want to go with the date, but it was like 26, 27, somewhere 29th, something like that. That was when I first heard about it. Okay. It is not, um, I believe, I, I don't know who heard about it first. I think you'd have to probably follow up with me afterwards. I could do something in writing and figure okay. out exactly that timeline. Okay, thank you. Um, parliamentary Mr. inquiry. Mr. Welch, it's time to be ready. What is your parliamentary inquiry? Uh, parliamentary inquiry uh, relates to yielding one additional minute to the minority member who requested it. He waited patiently for his time. Others. I, were I'm sorry, that is not a parliamentary inquiry. It's rather a complaint, and I think an unfounded one. I, Mr. I Welch? do have a parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chair Mr. Chairman, and it's a sincere one. I just want All to. All of your. Statements are sincere. What well, is I know, but I would like you to, to listen Chairman, to the, the request. Chairman, the bill has rung. And my request is this. Would you uh, think that your obligation is to yield yourself five minutes? Because what I see is you yielding yourself one minute in between our questioning, and then we never know when your time is. So wouldn't it be logical that I, you would let I your think, um, If the gentleman would permit. Yeah. Well, I don't think that's a, parliament, a parliamentary inquiry. I gave Mr. Davis additional time. Sure I didn't did. uh, cut him off when his time finished. It wasn't a great deal of time. My parliamentary But I, Chair, have the prerogative of asking a question that related to this matter. And I'll, uh, I said I yielded myself time for that. No, and but it my comes question, out of my time. But if you'll permit, maybe Mr. Just Welch. Just one question. Well, let me ask this of Mr. It, Welch. Do you want to take your time now? Because we're going to have to respond to votes. I, I just want to know how the process works. Well, you know how off. the process works. What the, is your question? The question is this. When you yield yourself time, isn't it appropriate to yield yourself five minutes and to use your five minutes and not choose a minute here and a minute there and a minute here? That's my question. Well, that's a good question, except a chair does have prerogatives, and I've seen other chairmen, including yourself, 
use the prerogatives of the chair to occasionally ask questions. I am not going to consider that in violation of the rules. So now, you Mr. can Welch, use yourself time any time you want. I'll proceed if uh, we have enough time for the vote. I think we, I think we have five minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Doan, thank you. Just one very simple question about this presentation, and it's this. You know what the content is. It identifies the 20 Democratic targets uh, to be defeated in the next election. Was that a proper topic of discussion and presentation uh, at a lunch uh, at your office? Congressman, there is an investigation open by the Office of Special Counsel. I am not even going to try to speculate on this. I'm just going to let the investigation take its course, let them make their decision. They're independent. I'll live with it. In your capacity as the head of that organization, was that a proper topic of discussion at a lunch? Congressman, I am going to let the Office of the Special Counsel's investigation move forward and let them make a judgment as to what they feel is appropriate or not. I heard you the first and the second time. Okay, great. And let me ask you my question the third time. In your capacity as the head of the organization, where you have responsibility about the administration of time within your office, was that a proper topic of discussion? I'm going to allow the Office of the Special Counsel to make a decision on this investigation. Since it is open and this is exactly what they do, I'm going to allow them to make a decision as to whether they thought it was appropriate or not. Yeah, but I'm asking you whether you thought it was appropriate. And Congressman, I'm going to allow the Office of Special Counsel, which has an open investigation, to proceed with the course of their investigation. I'm not going to try to murky the waters one way or the other, and I'm going to allow them to make their independent judgment, and I will live with it. Well, I'd be, I'd be glad to live with your answer if you'd give me an answer. I am happy to leave the investigation and the decision making to the office of the special counsel, Congressman. If uh, Nancy Pelosi called up and said that she wanted to come over, send somebody over uh, to identify the top 20 Republican targets, maybe some of our friends here, we have would that be a topic that you would invite? her or her representatives to discuss at lunch? We are very blessed to have Speaker Pelosi in our new San Francisco Federal Building, and I'll tell you, we I didn't uh, ask if she was going to come to oh. a ribbon cutting. You know, look, this is a very serious question. You have a very serious responsibility. Yes. The person who heads an agency has to make certain that there's integrity in how the time that is uh, of taxpayer money and work, people working for taxpayers is used, whether they're Schedule C employees or not, right? Um, yes, I have a responsibility. Right, so to it's a do very right simple now. question, right. and I uh, honestly, you know, I listen to you not remember, not remember, not remember, despite what is very clearly a very good memory and a very competent record uh, of accomplishment in your own career. So I found that a little frustrating. So does my husband, because I can never can remember you know our wedding anniversary. Actually, you, you want to know something? I'm, I, I'm deadly serious about this because it's a I very understand. simple question, and I find you being evasive on this in all candor. I am asking you very simply, as the chief operating officer of this very important organization, whether you think it was proper to allow a political appointee to come in on lunchtime and identify the 20 political targets in the House races. It's a simple question that I'm asking you. I'm asking you your opinion. I'm not asking you what I know to be the case that there's a, quote, investigation ongoing. I appreciate that, Congressman. And since there is an open investigation ongoing, and since this investigation involves me, I believe that I need to allow this independent investigation by the Office of Special Counsel to proceed without weighing in one way or the other and coloring their judgment. How does it adversely affect the investigation if you express an opinion about not yet been using interviewed. lunch to tar have a discussion targeting political uh, candidates. Congressman, I've not had an investigation before by an Office of Special Counsel. I've actually not testified in front of a, a committee before. But what I will That's tell fine. you is that I will allow what is another organization's responsibility, which is to make a decision on this matter, to proceed. And I, I will wait and live with their judgment. Let's, let's say an archbishop, I'm a Catholic. So am I. Wanted to come in and proselytize at lunch. Would that be a proper activity at lunch? 
I don't know. I might have to take the fifth on this. I don't Gen know the murkiness of gentleman that. Gentlemen, yield just. You're going to have to answer this question to the special counsel. Why can't you answer this question to us? when the special counsel asked me, this is their purview when they investigate. It's and also when, our purview I appreciate to ask that, you Chairman. whether you think it's appropriate. I think it's a violation of the law. Chairman, but do you think that, it's appropriate? Chairman, you are allowed to have an opinion. And this is a, I want a free your country. I'm allowed to have one, too. And my opinion is that I get to We're wait. We're asking your I, opinion. I'm telling you, my opinion is I get I to wait until the Office of Special Counsel makes a decision, and I will live with it. That's not an opinion. That's yes, a, it is. It's that's my a, opinion. That's a tactic. No, that's no, no. That's a tactic of Politicians evasion. Have tactics. Gentlemen's uh, time has expired. We have a uh, series Mr. of Mr. votes on the House floor. Mr. We Chairman. will recess to respond to those votes. Then members who have not been recognized will complete the questioning of Ms. Doan. Mr. Chairman. Then we will hear from the Inspector General. Yes. Mr. Chairman, um, if, if you might, please, um, if you could recognize me and allow me to yield my time to the ranking member uh, so that he might have my time when we return, I would greatly appreciate the favor. You want to do that now? If, if you would because allow we me. we do have to then, respond to the vote. And then he could take his five minutes when we return from voting. Well, I'll check the rules on that, but I would certainly want to be as generous as possible to uh, my colleagues. Uh, we no now adjourn uh, to respond to the votes. So how does it work? Do we, do we go to lunch or something? Or do we just hang? The meeting of the uh, committee will come back to order. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Let me just say at the outset, there's been, can we get the doors closed and get the, um, at the outset that I know some of my colleagues have expressed some consternation about your intertoning. When I was chairman, I would occasionally, as you know, tone in after a question for clarification. And we've always had an understanding. We don't try to abuse it. I know you're bending over backwards to be fair, but that is in tune with how I acted as well. I just want to to clarify that. This has been a rough hearing and we have some disagreements about this, but uh, you know, I appreciate your uh, you know, trying to answer some of the inquiries and just note for the record that I intoned uh, when I was chairman well, as well. I, I, I appreciate I mean, we're that. We're trying to get through this. I appreciate that. And I want to be fair to all, um, all the members on both sides of the uh, aisle on this committee. Um, Mr. Tierney, it's your turn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a minute, Mr. Tierney, uh, before the reappearance Ms. of Ms. Norton. There you go. Ms. Norton was yeah. ahead of you. I didn't see her walk in, but she is here, and I'm going to recognize her for, to take <clears> her time. Hold on. This may not be a welcome occasion. Uh, more than most members, I am saddened by this occasion, surprised even by it, because I, I, I've, I've gotten to know you since you've become administrator. I share jurisdiction with this subcommittee. I also know personally about your accomplishments. I'm proud of your accomplishments, particularly as an African-American businesswoman. I know how likable and bright you are. It's one of the reasons why I think for the administration people here, you have an obligation because you're not doing your job when these people are making their transition from the private sector. Anybody in the White House who had this, <laughs> this woman in on that call, you ought to be, that's who ought to be punished. Look, the most I'm not going to ask the political questions because the most uh, serious things that have happened here. As far as I'm concerned, uh, the political question is very embarrassing, very straightforward, will be understood by the public. I'm more concerned about the IG and the uh, SUN system. Um, SUN system, and I can't ask about both of them. Um, Ms. Doan, uh, I worked with uh, the appropriators when you combined uh, government uh, 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 policy and congressional affairs, because that again gave the impression of politicizing the office of government policy. Uh, maybe it wouldn't have looked that way in the private sector. That's an agency where GSA is the lead agency, but it, it controls travel and space use all around the government. And because of the CR, it, 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 it kept that from happening. But the, the IG, somebody should have told the administrator how sacred the IG was in your testimony, in your testimony, uh, and you've got to explain how you explain this. On page four, you describe uh, what amounts to your uh, attempt to audit the IG. 
even in black and white, here it looks like an administrator is having problems with the IG, the way he spends his money. Um, and you say uh, that uh, uh, the divisions were required to supplement the uh, uh, office of IG with an additional $5 million above and beyond the budget that Congress had approved and appropriated, and you quickly moved to address this imbalance. Administrator Doan, were you not aware um, that in removing this $5 million, uh, you were not removing money from the IG's budget? Each division has set aside funds that are indeed included in the budget of your agency so that pre-audits may occur. Pre-audits are what divisions do to make sure that they will not haul, be hauled before Congress uh, for violations or for not getting the best deal for the government. Your agency manages $56 billion in contracts for the Defense Department, Homeland Security, and other agencies. What, in, a, in effect, and by taking that $5 billion, which you, divisions request pre-audits be, be done of their work, very business-like uh, practice, to assure they were getting the best deal for the government, you left the impression that you did not want, uh, particularly in eliminating the entire amount, that you did not want pre-audits in order to assure that the best deal that what was being done. And far from what your testimony says, as if somehow the IG was overspending the money had been included, and you apparently had to restore it because the Hill went ballistic. This money was included so that this $56 billion in contracts could be pre-audited to catch the kinds of errors and bad deal deals that this committee has already heard uh, a great deal about last year and this year. Uh, why, why do you characterize in your testimony as uh, the IG spending beyond his budget? Were you aware that this money was already in the budget of your agency to do pre-audits and that you were defunding all pre-audits for $56 billion of contracts uh, when you did that? Do I yes, have time please. To respond? Okay. Please respond. Uh, Congresswoman Norton, thank you for your kind comments at the beginning. Uh, as I just to give you a very brief context, as I mentioned in my uh, my hearing uh, submission and in my oral presentation, when I came to GSA, this was an agency that was in distress, and when and I mentioned that there was over a hundred million dollar deficit that I had to immediately work to address. What I found was that the $120 million that was sort of in the red, if we're going to go from a business point of view, was actually in the division that ironically was now being tasked with paying the $5 million supplemental to the Inspector General. What I have, I am not undermining oversight. I am totally supportive of oversight. I'm just asking you a question. Did you know that that money was included in your budget precisely for pre-audits and that he was not overspending his budget? What I know is that this funding was coming from a failing division that was already $120 million in the red, and they were required to supplement it. What I have always said is I approve and of so oversight. And so you think, this gentle ladies, I want uh, time it to has occur expired. in the appropriated dollars from the Inspector General. That is all I've asked. Do as many as you want, be as independent as you want, but do it within your appropriated funding. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tierney? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Doan, I think today's hearing is, is pretty much about judgment. Uh, and yours in particular. And I know we're not going to go into the political slides again. I, I <laughs> accept the fact that you apparently want to give no opinion on that. Uh, but I, on the diversity issue, uh, before you decided to uh, give a contract to Edie Fraser, 
Had you ever personally reviewed the Small Business Administration report that granted an F to the agency? I'm sorry, what? Before you decided to look in the direction of E.D. Frazier, had you ever personally reviewed the SBA report that gave an F to your agency on the diversity issue? Um, I had spoken with Felipe Mendoza, our Ostabu. I trust him, and he at that time was warning me, giving me a heads up, it is coming. Okay. It did indeed. So had you looked at the report, the SBA report, I do not, before I you trust, went to the contract to E.D. I Frazier. believe that Felipe Mendoza tells the truth, and when he tells Damn, me that... this isn't rocket scientist. I'm asking you a question. I'm asking you to do it. The Ms. Washington, Ms. Smith goes to Washington stuff is old already, and it's not even over for this hearing. So just please answer the question. Did you personally look at the SBA report before you looked in the direction of E.D. Frazier for a contract? I appreciate what you're trying to No, you ask don't, me, because you're not answering it. Did you or did you not? Congressman? Ma'am, no, did you or did you not personally look at the SBA report? Congressman Turner. Ma'am, are you going to, Mr. Chairman, would you direct the witness to answer, be responsive, Would please? I be allowed to just? This is the time for members to ask you questions. Oh, okay. With a limited period limited of time. time. Okay, I'm sorry. If it's a yes or no question, answer it yes or no. If you say you don't know, that's fine. Okay, I appreciate but it. I'm answer sorry, Answer the Chairman. question directly. This is the first time I talked to him. I was trying to be respectful. The answer to that, Congressman, is no. Thank you. Now, had you looked, had you talked to the people of your own Office of Minority and Disadvantaged Matters about that report, about the F? Yes, I talked with Felipe Mendoza. And, and did you do it in detail to find out what that report and findings were, what the data was behind it? Yeah, we had, we had a pretty long talk. I think we spoke in our first meeting for So the answer is yes? Long. Yes, the answer is yes. Thank you very yes. much. Did you, if I direct your attention to page 16 of your packet, please. This packet, okay. That would be the one. I want to show you a fact sheet that the GSA career people put together during the Sun Microsoft's contract negotiations. It says in the post audit which covered 1999 to 2005, we have forfeited $70.4 million in reseller price reductions and $7.04 million in GSA contract price reductions for a total of $77.4 million. That was the last five years. The career audit has also discussed what would happen for the next three years if GSA signed the contract. And the fact sheet says about that, for the remaining three years on the extension option, if we accept Sun's proposed price reduction clause, we estimate we will lose a minimum of $13.1 million in reseller price reductions and $1.31 million in GSA contract price reductions for a total of $14.41 million. Had you read that and familiarized yourself with that part of the report before Shana Budd took over for Mr. Butterfield? No, I did not because okay. I did so not in any having way read get that, involved in this process. Without having read that, all right, Ms. Shana Budd comes on and she then, within nine days of the time she takes the job, for a matter that's been going on for a couple of years, within nine days, she then signs a contract which were terms highly unfavorable to the taxpayer. And when we asked her about it, the committee asked her about it, she said, well, she doesn't rely on auditors to determine contract prices. Her approach is just to do what the contractor wants. That's a serious judgment issue. You're her boss. You don't look into this report or even know what the projected losses are and what the past losses are. You hire a woman whose approach, apparently which you adopt, is that she just wants to do what the contractor wants to do. The Inspector General then goes on to say that with regard to your involvement in this, it's the first time we're aware of in which an administrator has personally intervened in this way. Now, you on the other hand tell Senator Grassley in his letter that you weren't involved. I wasn't briefed by FAS in August or at any other time on the Sun Microsystems contract deficiencies. I had no knowledge of the negotiations or the basis for decisions made regarding this contract. I direct your attention to page four of your packet. Right. On August 27, 2006, Marty Wagner, Jim Williams's deputy at FAS, the Federal Acquisition Service, sent an email to your chief of staff, John Phelps, explaining that the Sun contract was likely to be canceled because they couldn't meet contract requirements on pricing. Your chief of staff forwarded the email directly to you with this message. Lorita, wasn't sure you'd seen this or not. Looks like Jim's prediction came true. He's referring, of course, to Jim Williams, the commissioner of the FAS. Three minutes later, you wrote back to your Chief of Staff, Mr. Williams, saying, this is truly unfortunate. There will be serious consequences felt across the FAS. Less than an hour later, Mr. Williams writes back to you, stating that he scheduled a meeting with the President of Sun's Federal Sales to see what can be done to resurrect the partnership. Then, you have an email exchange between Washington Management Group, a fellow named Larry Allen. I look at page seven on your, uh, on your packet. Mr. Allen works for the Washington Management Group. That firm represents Sun in the negotiations. Mr. Allen also runs a group called the Coalition for Government Procurement that just happens 
to have Sun as a premium member. In that packet, you'll see an email dated September 7, 2006 from Mr. Allen that says, Mrs. Doan, I understand the new life has been breathed into the Sun situation. They are meeting with Mr. Williams today, among other things, and I understand that a new deal is indeed possible within the 30-day time frame you have envisioned. Gentlemen, Mr. Time Williams, has my, my question for you is, Ms. Doan, how can you tell Senator Grassley that you had no involvement in this at all and then look at that trail of emails? Because I was not directly involved in this matter at all. What I did do is exercise proper oversight that I should do as the administrator of GSA. Uh, Larry Allen is, to my knowledge, the head or president of something of the Coalition for Government Procurement. This is the capacity in which I know him and which I have met with him. Um, with all of our schedule holders and things of that nature. I think you are mischaracterizing this, and I think it's a little bit outrageous what you're trying to say. Well, you just read the email. I'm not mischaracterizing. Sure. I directed you to the email. Sure. Just read it, and I was reading literally from it. That's Gentlemen's, not a mischaracterization. Uh, That's a I quote. Think. Gentlemen's time has expired. Stone, let me uh, just, Mr. Davis, you're going to be recognized now. Thank you. Um, you were not directly in the negotiations with Sun Microsystems, correct? No, I was not. Basically, you were up there saying, we'd like to keep this going. What would have been the ramifications on the supply schedule if Sun Microsystems were not an option for government buyers? I think this would be very dire for the federal government. Can you explain why? Because Sun Microsystems has servers, it has software, it has JavaScript, it has um, that everyone in the federal government uses. They may not be aware of it, but it is one of the things that is the backbone of their internet and, and, and many other areas. And if you didn't offer in your supply schedule, is it likely it would have been offered on other supply schedules, perhaps at more, even more disadvantageous uh, rates? I think it would have been much more expensive for the federal government to purchase Sun products. You can't just measure it by what's on your schedule. Now, let me just ask you on the procedures on this. As I understand it, a, um, once on the schedule, Sun is not guaranteed any business at all, correct? No, they are not. Um, a government agency orders items off the schedule after it reviews the prices of at least three schedule holders. Isn't that, that is correct? True. So Sun would offer their prices if they weren't competitive. A government buyer could go somewhere else. Is that correct to some of the other schedule holders that offer same or similar uh, services. That's true. Uh, and that the chosen contractor would have to represent the best value. Now, throughout the process, ordering uh, agencies are encouraged to seek and often receive significant price reductions that are above and apart from the discounts that are encompassed in the schedule prices. So even if the schedule price is something, isn't it true, and we've been through this before, that very often the negotiated price is far lower than what's on the schedule? Yes, that's what we hope and anticipate. The gentleman yield? I'd be happy to. Thank you. If Sun Microsystems wasn't on the schedule, somebody else would be. Is that correct? No. There are still other firms. Sun Microsystems was the only one offering on that schedule, was it? No. No. Yeah. There, there were a lot of people exactly. on the schedule. Exactly. That's my point. And your staff well, that's my had point. filed a report that said it was going to cost $77 million plus if you sign the agreement with them to put them on the schedule. Let me. Uh, let me hard let pressed me. to see what you're losing you I know, can by not having it. them on. As someone spent their career on this, I can explain it very quickly. There are going to be some government servers that are Sun Systems. They're going to want to continue with Sun products. If they can't get it off the schedule, they would go to NASA Soup or a GWEX, or they may go off the schedule entirely and buy it on the market, which traditionally have been much higher prices. That's one of the concerns with this. Now, uh, let me just ask, the uh, contract that Mr. Butterfield was negotiating, and maybe this is to a detail you don't know, but maybe you've learned it after the fact. This was not that we didn't say yes to thing the contract he said no for. There were changes, wasn't it, after Mr. Williams negotiated it? That's true. It was a negotiation, which means there's give and take on both sides. And when Mr. Butterfield uh, was relieved, uh, and I don't, uh, at that point, and um, uh, uh, Shauna Budd came in and negotiated. Uh, she negotiated a different agreement than what Mr. Butterfield had offered. Isn't that right? Both parties moved? Uh, that's my understanding, is that both parties moved a little and bit. And maintenance closer. was one of the key elements of this, isn't it? Yes, that, I believe it was. Which is a very uh, uh, key element um, throughout there. So I, I think we can, it's, a, it's important for this committee to understand how schedules work, how these are negotiated. That is certainly uh, appropriate. But I think the key here is all you were doing as the administrator was to just keep the negotiations going. Because exactly you recognized right. what it could do to the schedules what it could do to government buying options if you didn't reach an agreement. You never dictated an agreement, did you? That's exactly correct. You didn't walk into a room and negotiate directly with Sun Microsystems, did you? No, I did not. You didn't appoint the contracting officers that negotiated it, did you? No, I did not. So I think if members have questions, we're, we're asking the wrong person. I, to, to my way of thinking, she did the appropriate thing to try to get a more inclusive schedule. Sun Microsystems' business, less than 10 percent of it is with the federal government. 
If we say no to them, they can walk around the world and sell their products, and they don't have to sell at discounts here that they can, when they can sell at a fuller price other uh, places. One of the difficulties, and we've held hearings on this before, is trying to get companies that traditionally don't sell to the government to sell to the government where we can get the variety of prices and the options and the technologies that are being developed in the private sector and apply them to government. But because government has a different set of regulations, a different set of accounting standards, a different set of rules, some companies just find it disadvantageous to redo all of these kind of things. And we tried to, to work through the procurement process to find uh, options to bring them in. So I don't know that there's anything necessarily improper about this. Time will tell if this was the right uh, approach or not. And it's hard to say if you save or lose money because we don't know how Sun Microsystem competes with other uh, products that are on the schedule right now once you have to go to three uh, for government buyers to choose whether they want Sun Microsystems or something else on the schedule and get the best deal in this case. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Mr. Clay? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ms. Doan, for being here today. Uh, Ms. Doan, it is my understanding that as administrator of the GSA, you manage over $56 billion uh, in contracts. What percentage of the GSA contracts is currently held by minority-owned businesses? I do not have that fact at this moment. Um, can you hold one minute? Sure. Can we just follow up after the record? Could we follow up with you after the record you for that precise can. number? You certainly can, I, and, and I'd appreciate a, a description of what GSA, what, what types of programs you have. Um, let me ask you, during your 10-month your, your tenure, how many contracts have you personally awarded to minority-owned businesses? Or well, I haven't personally that? awarded any contracts to minority or large businesses. Okay. All right. You stated uh, in your written testimony that it was outrageous for the committee to cite that as an example of the personal assistance Ms. Frazier provided to you, she assisted your high school-aged daughter in securing a congressional internship. You, you denied that Ms. Frazier assisted you a, and called the uh, suggestion despicable. Yet in her interview with the committee, Ms. Frazier was asked this very question and confirmed that she called a Senate office to seek an internship for your daughter. Here's what Ms. Frazier told the committee. I'm really glad you asked that question because I think it is a really uh, if, if, if there's any humor in this whole situation, you know, when she said to me, you know, Edie, I am so dedicated to the Republicans. You are so dedicated to the Democrats. My daughter needs to learn there, there is another side. And so I called the administrative assistant to Senator, to Senator Stabenow and said, uh, this high school kid, you know, all, all their high school has internships in government and in the Senate and would you take her on? So, Ms. Doan, it was Ms. Frazier who said who, uh, that, that she did this for you. Uh, by the way, no one has su suggested that your daughter did anything wrong by accepting Ms. Frazier's help, but perhaps you would like to reconsider your statement to Congress uh, that Ms. Frazier did not provide any assistance in light of Ms. Frazier's clear testimony that she did. But I believe I said, and, and if I'm incorrect, I can, maybe I'll check my letter that I wrote to the committee. What I said is that this is a 40-year program that is hosted by Madeira High School that has been uh, well documented. It provides 90 uh, interns non-paying throughout the entire federal government. Um, I'm happy to hear that she had support from so many different people, but this is a, they have interns in many, many offices in both the Democratic side and the Republican side, the House and the Senate. Every junior at this high school does this. It's a very well-recognized program. That is what I believe, something of that nature, I think I wrote in that. But and that you I did. still believe, and I will say this, this is the fact that you are willing to keep pushing this point absolutely indicates your willingness to drag whatever kind of extraneous things in. There is nothing wrong. I am not, I was not the administrator at the time. This is well, a high school to me. The gentleman yielded to me. It's his time. I, 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 I just want to read back this. to you uh, what you said in, in your statement. Oh, thank, you thank said, you. this is what you said, um, that um, over three years ago, 
Let's see. Uh, 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 three years ago, as a high school junior, my daughter participated in a mandatory school-sponsored community service program. School counselors work directly with members of the House and the Senate to arrange for entry-level non-paying positions. My innocent daughter was assigned to the staff of Senator Debbie Stabenow. Now, what, what uh, Mr. Clay is pointing out is that we know it wasn't uh, school counselors, but your good friend who was the one who recommended her. But I yield back to balance it. Am I allowed to comment at all? Because well, this is a question. There is nothing please on do. this that is incorrect. There is nothing on this that is incorrect. The high school counselors at Madeira work with the House and the Senate, and they absolutely have internships. We have uh, probably people on this committee who had these interns here. I'm sorry. Well, Ms. Doan, why would, why would Ms. Frazier make the statement? And could, do you have, can you shed any light on that? No, no, I can't shed any light on it. I can share with you that people often try to help when other people say there are things that are of interest or concern or things. This is, this is what we do. We care for one another. People do things like this. I, this is very kind well, of her to have done that. And, and, and that's all fine and well, but I think that the concern here is that uh, they, this is conflicting test testimony between Ms. Frazier and you and what you've told committee investigators. This is not conflicting testimony. It says here that high school counselors work directly with members of the House and Senate to arrange for entry-level non-paying positions. Well, well much time uh, has expired. This is I, a statement of fact. I, I'd ask unanimous Thank consent you. that I have an additional, uh, that I have an, a minute so I can just pursue this issue without objection. Uh, uh, without objection, but I'd like to also reserve just a clarification question at the end of that too. Absolutely. Uh, Ms. Doan, the only, I know you were outraged about this whole thing. You expressed it with a great deal of emotion. But uh, your statement was it was school counselors. We pointed out that uh, Edie Fraser claimed that she helped your daughter. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but it is oh, something. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that because the implication there was that there was something improper going on. I, I no, guess the implication of it was that she helped you. She was, you, you had a relationship with she helped you, and evidently you wanted to help her with that contract, and this was a, no. a give and Chairman, take in a relationship. With all due respect, Chairman, Congressman Clay prefaced it, if I, and I don't have the exact transcript, but he prefaced it with something like, in the process of her, of her performing personal services for you. That was improper, in my mind. That implied a certain amount of But impropriety. you don't deny that she helped. She apparently did help, and I'm very grateful that she did. Okay. Uh, that's fine. Mr. Let's Mr. just Mr. get the record complete. Yes, let Mr. Me, Davis. Let me make complete. I've had interns from the Madeira School. It's, it's not in my district. It is not uncommon for kids from Madeira to apply across the hill. And it's not uncommon, by the way, for people to recommend people that are applying. These are unpaid mm -hmm. internships during the school year when, frankly, many offices can use interns. Summertime, it's different. These are during school year. And we work directly with the counselors because we have to fill out forms telling exactly. how the kids do. And I don't see any conflict in this at all. And if, if this is the best you can do, I think we're wasting our time. Well, I certainly don't think it's a conflict. It's just I think people ought to understand the complete, uh, the complete picture. Uh, let's see. Mr. Lynch, it's your time now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having this hearing. I also thank the ranking member. Uh, we, we seem to be getting tied in knots about your testimony previous testimony, current testimony. Now, and, and I'm getting a little frustrated, just like you are, trying to figure out what you're exactly saying. Uh, you just told us a moment ago that you weren't involved with the Sun Microsystems uh, deal. You were just in, involved in the oversight of it. Uh, you weren't directly involved. You just did your job in an oversight uh, capacity. Now, I just want to compare what you said to Senator Grassley. And this is a quote. When asked about the Sun Microsystems contract, you said, quote, I had no knowledge of the negotiations or the basis of the decisions made regarding this contract. That is a very broad statement, and it is completely inconsistent what you have said here today. Just want to tell you, and this may go further, I know you, you know that you're under oath. This is, what's troubling to me is this, and there's a lot of peripheral stuff, but there's some central stuff about what's being testified to here today. You have testified to the facts that at the GSA headquarters, the headquarters of this agency, a government institution, that there was a, there was a 
meeting, a presentation, a teleconference at which you were present, the object of that meeting expressly was for influencing the election. More specifically, the object of the meeting was to target and, if successful, remove members of Congress who are charged with the oversight of your agency. This goes to the integrity of the electoral process that has been violated here, not just in the Hatch Act, but also embodied in the Voting Rights Act. There were members of this Congress that were targeted by a government agency, by a sitting government agency with the head of that agency present, and also special assistance to the White House present to influence the election. That is central to what you did. That is central. Now, we also, you haven't claimed the Fifth Amendment, which maybe you should have, but you've come here today and you've testified, you, you've really adopted the, the Sergeant Schultz defense, which you know, you know nothing, but, but I wanna just recount what you've testified to here today. And I'm, I came here in an objective fashion just to listen what you, what you had to say. <laughs> You testified that you remember the time you have arrived. You testified as you knew who was in the meeting, who was not in the meeting. You testified that you knew who called in and who did not call in. You testified as to what food was served. You testified, this is, you want to read the transcripts, go ahead. You, 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 you remember the folks that were telecommunicated in from, from California. You testified that you sat before a, a PowerPoint presentation, which is, an enhanced cognitive medium, but then you have a blank spot in your memory as to what you recall about the PowerPoint presentation targeting members of, of Congress. And we have the testimony of six Republican colleagues who have your own testimony as to what can we do to help the Republican members of Congress. And that, that, is, that is terribly troubling in, in, in my estimation. And uh, maybe this will be worked out in, in the subsequent investigations. I, I'm not sure. But uh, there is certainly uh, just the core facts that you've, you've helped establish here, uh, you know, leads me to believe that there's further action taking on, on necessary to be taken on this. And it's not good for you. I have to say, your own testimony has, has been very damning, I think, that you've had this very selective lapse of memory before members of Congress. And, uh, you know, I, I think the whole episode is utterly disgraceful, in, in, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe there are members here that, that think that you've helped yourself here today by, by testifying, but uh, I, I need to be quite honest with you um, the, the only thing that you've removed here is the, the, the original impression that was, it was incompetence. It was incompetence, because now it appears that your action was, was purposeful. And I just have to say, as a member of, of Congress, uh, trying to uphold the Constitution, try, trying to uphold the integrity of government, that I, I'm deeply disappointed in your testimony here today. And, and, uh, you know, I, I will do everything I possibly can to, uh, you know, to get to the bottom of this and, and to restore the integrity that I think has been diminished by your own actions. Thank you. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair um, wishes to recognize himself for five minutes just to uh, ask a few questions and maybe I won't even take the full five minutes. On this, there were two contracts that we've been discussing. One was on the micro, uh, Sun Microsystems contract. And in your March 13th letter, you said, quote, I was not briefed by FAS in August or at any other time on the Sun Microsystems contract deficiencies, end quote. FAS is the Federal right. Acquisition Service. Now, um, we interviewed Mr. Williams and we asked him whether he briefed you on the Sun contract, and he said he did. He told us directly that he updated you on the Sun situation several times during the 
contract negotiations. Was he lying to us? How do you explain this contradiction? Chairman, um, I, could you, if, well, I don't, I don't want to ask you to read it back to me again, but I, I think. You said that you weren't involved, August, but he says he briefed In you. the August time frame, I believe we talked about. Is that what we talked about? I think I, I, don't, I cannot, I'd much rather sit there and, cur, um, you know, add up the dates and stuff like that and organize it for you and provide it. Did he brief you? Um, after, sometime in early September. I'm not asking you when. Did he brief you on this, on this contract? Well, I thought the date was the issue we were discussing here. Well, it, it, your March 13th letter, you said he had not briefed you. Uh, I, I presume this is before uh, you yeah. agreed to the contract. Did he brief you or not? Well, no, he, he didn't brief me. He did not brief he, you. He just spoke, you know, once on the phone. I don't know. Only I once I, on the I, phone. I, honestly, so, I can't right there. Why don't she go yeah. Okay, that's what he said. He, we never sat down and actually um, had a briefing. We just had a brief discussion on the phone. Uh, how many occasions? He said one or two times. I'm, I'm just following. Twice. Maybe twice. Okay. And then on the... Um, I think the issue is uh, August versus September. But do you consider it a briefing it's a t if it's a telephone conversation when someone tells you about a contract? No, I, I consider a briefing when you're actually provided with substantive information related to a matter at hand. That's, that's what I consider a briefing. Well, I just point out that when you send a letter to Senator Grassley to say, I, quote, I was not briefed by FAS, the Federal Acquisition Service, in August or <coughs> at any other time on the Sun Microsystems contract deficiencies, uh, that's a pretty clear statement, but now it seems as if you're backing off that statement. You did have a couple phone conversations telling you about it. Yes, you did have a couple phone conversations. No, you I, didn't have a couple phone conversations. I, I, I don't consider that a briefing. Okay, that's, that's Clintonian. Now, um, on the uh, other... On the other contract, uh, you had a, um, you were directly involved in the contract for Edie Fraser, weren't you? I do not believe that that was a contract, but yes, I was directly involved in directing the action to try to start a study for minority and women-owned and diversity okay. You were directly businesses. involved in that, but these others you were indirectly involved. You are the head of GSA, and that's agency in charge of giving out these contracts. So other things were delegated to other people, but on the Edie Fraser contract, you were personally involved. Is that a fair statement? Yes, it was a fair statement at the beginning of the action. After I um, approved the draft outline, I then moved it on to be processed through the contracting shop and the, the office for the procurement. Okay, thank you. Well, I uh, want to thank you. Does the gentleman have any additional questions he wants to ask? Maybe. Uh, Make some comments could, about could the you, way uh, life is going. Could you yield? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. How much time? It left. I'd be glad to give oh, it to you. Okay. Well, again, uh, uh, let, let's just take it in reverse order. The the twenty thousand uh, dollar contract um, uh, that you attempt, and it wasn't a contract, was never awarded. It was not. Okay. Uh, the video conference, uh, this says the White House, it, uh, the first uh, chart there is the White House political office. Is that what that says? The White House political office? Uh, yes. White is that House. who conducted that? Did you initiate the uh, video conference? No, I did not. Okay. I and then Sun Microsoft, the third question, um, you were never fully uh, briefed. You never sat down and had a full briefing about the terms of the contract. And most of the problems had occurred before you got there. All of that is true. Uh, I, 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 15 years. You know, they tried to get you on this $20,000 and you're, this is embarrassing too, and what they're doing to your daughter. 2004 to intern with a Democrat senator. But uh, I've never seen uh, such an attempt to go after a, a minority appointee of any administration in this fashion. And the bad gentlemen's, thing about uh, this, it will discourage others from ever coming into the gentlemen's service, what time you're doing here today. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Dome, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, Chairman. We'll, thank uh, you, Ranking Member Davis. We'll probably thank ask you, you some members. further questions for the record. We're now uh, pleased to um, okay. call our call our next witness.
sorry. Uh, Mr. Brian D. Miller is the Inspector General of GSA. Before assuming this post in 2005, Mr. Miller worked as Federal Prosecutor in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of Virginia, where he helped prosecute Zacharias Mosawi and jo John Walker Lint. In this position, he also supervised numerous audits and investigations involving procurement, grant, and health care fraud. Mr. Miller, I thank you very much for being here. Uh, your prepared statement will be in the record in, in full. I'd like to ask you now to uh, proceed with your oral statement. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And thank you, Ranking Member, and thank you, members of this committee, for inviting me here to testify. I would also like to thank Senator Grassley for taking the time to testify here this morning about the importance of oversight and the role of an Inspector General. Indeed, it is a privilege uh, for me. Parliamentary uh, inquiry uh, and the procedure. Uh, was the witness sworn in? Oh. Gentleman is correct. It is our practice to uh, sure. swear in all witnesses, and uh, we want to put you under oath as well. Do you promise swear and affirm to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think, uh, thank you. Now let's uh, start all over again. Okay. Uh, it, it's a privilege to be here this afternoon. I have devoted uh, most of my professional life to public service for roughly a decade and a half before becoming Inspector General at GSA. I served as a career federal, uh, a federal attorney. As a United States Attorney in the Eastern District of Virginia, the ranking member's own district, I worked on a variety of uh, cases, including terrorism cases, as the Chairman has noted. In July 2005, the Senate confirmed me as Inspector General of GSA, and it is indeed an honor for me to lead the Office of Inspector General. Our audits and investigations safeguard the integrity of government operations and provide cost avoidance for taxpayers in the billions of dollars. For years, my office enjoyed a good working relations with GSA managers who appreciate our work. My relationships with former GSA Administrator Stephen Perry and Acting Administrator David Bibb were excellent. They recognized that independent oversight was a tool for good management. And I've been trying to establish a good working relationship with Administrator Doan and will continue to do so. It is important for me uh, to note here that it is my duty as Inspector General to investigate allegations of wrongdoing and to conduct audits. I would not be doing my job if I were to look the other way at credible allegations of wrongdoing or passed over an embarrassing audit, as Senator, Senator Grassley has noted this morning. The taxpayers and the Congress rely on IGs to do their job to ferret out fraud, waste, and abuse, and to help their agencies run more efficiently and effectively. At the end of the day, it is about accountability. Accountability to the President, to the Congress, and most important, importantly, to the American taxpayers. Now, this committee has asked me to address three issues in connection with the actions of the administrator. First, her intervention in a major contract negotiation, Sun Microsystems. Second, her sole source award of a contract to a friend. And third, her alleged role in encouraging use of GSA resources for partisan political purposes. Six months ago, uh, GSA awarded a contract extension to Sun Microsystems. Our auditor showed that, that it was a bad deal for the government. The contracting officer thought it was a bad deal. All of GSA's management, up to and including Commissioner Jim Williams, agreed it was a bad deal. And a notice was sent to Sun that the contract would, be, would end. But then Administrator Doan uh, found out and word went out that Sun was a strategically important vendor and that the administrator wanted the contract awarded. The contracting officer could not extend it, so a new contracting officer was assigned. Eight days later, the contract was renewed. Why is this such a bad deal? Well, the auditors warned that Sun's past charges looked fraudulent and told GSA management. 
And frankly, the deal should not it should have been terminated when allegations of potential fraud first surfaced. I agree with Senator Grassley that once the potential for serious fraud was identified, the deal should have been slowed down at the very least. Instead, it was speeded up. And none of this would have happened if Administrator Doan had not intervened and directed GSA to make the award. Now turning to the Public Affairs Group contract. Administrator Doan was wrong in attempting to award a sole source contract to the company of a personal friend, Edie Frazier. She was wrong to try to keep she was wrong to keep trying to get this project awarded to her friend even when told the first contract was improper. And she was wrong to try and cover up the extent of her improper efforts. Administrator Doan has tried to say that she did nothing improper and that anyway it wasn't a contract. But that is not what her own general counsel has told her. Administrator Doan has claimed that she did everything she could to clean up the mess. But that is not what her own general counsel told this committee. Turning to the Hatch Act issue, when my investigators received credible information about a potential Hatch Act violation, we referred the matter to the appropriate investigatory agency, the Office of Special Counsel. That is our duty. Now, in tandem with these events, the administrator has advocated for reduced oversight and has made many statements to that effect. Unfortunately, the administrator has demonstrated a disregard for the very contracting rules that oversight is meant to detect. And I notice my time is out. I'd like to thank the committee and I stand ready to answer questions. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Uh, Chairman, he'll be right back. Do you want us to begin? Uh, why don't you just finish your statement? Excellent. We did give Ms. Doan additional time and I think it'd be only fair to let you have additional time to complete your statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's, there's not much left. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, in fact, she may have violated uh, basic rules of conduct for an agency head while at the same time work to pare back the mechanisms for uncovering such violations. What may explain both is a lack of respect for law and law enforcement. I would be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Davis, I'm going to recognize you to control 15 minutes and we'll let you go first and then our side will control 15 minutes. Uh, Mr. Miller, I heard you say that you're accountable to the White House, uh, to the Congress, and to the, Ameri and to the American people. That's correct. Uh, Aren't you also, under the statute, um, accountable to the head of the agency to keep them, uh, the establishment and the Congress fully informed? Indeed. You didn't yes, mention sir. that. Yes, sir. You didn't mention that. But, well, I would be happy to mention it now. And um, you're not an accountant, is that correct? Pardon me? You're not an accountant, is that correct? That's correct. You're not a CPA, is that correct? You're, you're a prosecutor by career, right? Correct. Your prepared statement today takes credit for saving the government a lot of money. How much did the investigation of this diversity study cost in your own staff time and expense? Any idea? Um, Congressman, uh, I don't have that number right now, but let me tell you that when this complaint originally came in, it came in with uh, documentation to our office. It was a credible complaint. We looked at it. We decided that uh, it was credible. We had to interview the administrator. I personally went up and told the administrator that we had received this complaint and that uh, my agents would have to go up and inter interview her. You didn't save any money on this one, though, did you? Because it was canceled, uh, right? If I, Am I right? You didn't well, save part any of, money part on Part of this our one. job, uh, Congressman, is, Just to, yes or no. is to investigate. Yeah, is that a yes or no? Did you save any money on this investigation? The answer is no, isn't it? I, I believe it's the no. contract was never. Uh, uh, the, the, there's no money paid on the con, uh, contract. Now, let That's me ask you this. What obligation does the IG and his investigators and his staff have to prevent disclosure of investigative information to outside sources in ongoing investigations? Can you tell us what your responsibility is there under the statute? Well, well, I, I will, but I, I hadn't finished my answer. Well, I want to. I want to. I've got limited time, and I want to have the answer to this question. Okay. Uh, the question is, um, 
uh, responsibilities to safeguard uh, confidential information. We, we do uh, have a responsibility to do that, and we do take measures to safeguard confidential information. Now, do you think that the premature disclosure of investigative information, even when permitted by law, can cause substantial harm to an ongoing investigation? It's possible, Congressman. Do you think that the uh, GSA IG investigative information in the ongoing investigation of Administrator Doan was provided to the Washington Post reporters who authorized the January 19, 2007 article entitled GSA Chief Scrutinized for Deal with Friend? Uh, Congressman, uh, we did not disclose any part of the investigative file to anyone who is not authorized to see it. I don't know how the Post reporters got that information. Now, did you, I was uh, surprised to see it. Did uh, you uh, do any investigation to see how it might have gotten out of your office? I oh, think we, we, well, we did ask around. Um, in fact, we received a call in uh, January, uh, January 25, from Mr. Nardotti, uh, Administrator Dunn's private attorney. He called our uh, lead invest investigator and said that on January 19th, the Washington Post reporters had documents. They showed um, right. Administrator Doan documents that came out of the um, investigative file. I think it, they claimed it was her s supplemental statement correcting misstatements in the earlier That information interview. should, under the law, that shouldn't get out, isn't that correct? That's correct, uh, Congressman. And your office, had, you're, you're under oath, you had nothing to do with this? I, I'm confident that my office had nothing to do with it. If, if I may finish, um, the, um, we immediately looked into this. Um, Mr. Nar Nardotti said that the Post reporter showed the okay. information to uh, Administrator Doan and to the Acting General Counsel. When we heard this, we immediately interviewed the Acting General Counsel who said that he, that didn't happen that uh, the Post reporters did not show him any documents from the investigative file and that, uh, to his knowledge, they had not. All right. What did you do to investigate that, the leak at that point, though? It was clear that something had been leaked, correct? Well, at that point, the head of my investigation said that the allegation by um, uh, Administrator Doan's attorney was not credible. In fact, the lead agent called him back and told him that. So there was no documents he, that were leaked to, to the Post that shouldn't have been out there. Is that uh, Congressman, they didn't come from my office. Uh, now, I'm, did you investigate to make that sure my office did not right. disclose? What any did you part do to ensure that it didn't come? Did you do an investigation in your office to make sure that they didn't? Did well, you talk to employees, put anybody under oath, or anything? Well, well, Congressman, I'm trying to answer your question. I want you to answer uh, as best uh, as best I can. Um, it, it's a little involved, and I ask you to bear with me. Um, but um, at that point. Our lead agent called Mr. Nardotti back and he and told him that what the general counsel said. And he gave a nervous laugh and said, well, gee, I'll have to go talk to my client again. Well, then he calls back on February 1st with a changed story. And uh, the revised story said that uh, uh, Mrs. Doan saw the statement um, in the Post reporter's hands. And that he also talked to another party that indicated subpoenaed emails had been turned over to the press. And he then told us he was filing a PCIE complaint. Now, part of the mystery was, was solved two weeks later. On February 13th, the attorney for PAG, uh, Public Affairs Group, sent a letter to us saying they were producing an email for the first time to us because they had learned that it had been leaked to the press. And that is before it even got to our office. PAG tried to, um, PAG tried to characterize it as outside the scope of our request, but it, it was a September 6th email ending in, in 309. Well, at any, any rate, uh, so that second half of Mr. Nard okay. Nardotti's statement was clearly explained that it, it came from right. Let me the ask public this. affairs group. Okay. It, well, I'm, I'm trying to answer in, in the sense that uh, we did also learned that there was a, a complaint filed with the PCIE. And we did not want to interfere with the investigation of the PCIE. Okay. Now, the, in connection with, um, we also asked the administrator for copies of documents uh, that sh she was producing to this committee relating to the PAG investigation. And um, in connection with that, she, Mr. Nardotti wrote us a letter saying she would not produce them in light of the PCIE complaint. I responded to her, and in, in response, Preparing for that response, I did ask everyone who had access 
um, to those documents whether or not um, they had disclosed them to anyone except other governmental officials with a legitimate interest in the inve investigation. So we did make inquiries. We did not, um, if, if your question is, did we take uh, uh, sworn statements, the answer is no. Okay. The first public disclosure of the problems between you and the administrator were revealed in a Post article December 2nd. Do you remember that article? I do, generally. The Post stated that they had obtained notes from a private meeting you had with the administrator. One I of your assistants so. took notes in that meeting, and those notes found their way to the Post. The Post wrote that according to these notes, the administrator compared Miller and his staff to terrorists. Um, do you know anything about that leak? I don't know where the Post reporters got those notes. I do. You don't think they got them from Mrs. Doan, do you? I don't think that they got them from Mrs. Doan. Um, is it appropriate, not, is it appropriate the for the notes of one of your staff to appear in the Washington Post in a meeting like that? Uh, con Congressman, um, those notes, um, we did share some of those comments and those notes with congressional staff. Um, but and I, I don't know where the Post which, reporters which congressional got those staff? notes. Uh, wh when did you do that? Um, we shared them with congressional staff um, maybe in October. Okay. Um, um, which congressional have to go staff? Back and which check. congressional staff? Um, I did. I believe that I'm, I shared them with um, Representative Platt's staff. Okay. Um, I may have shared them with um, uh, other oversight staff. You think that they may have leaked it? But from your these private, of course, this meeting that we're talking about here, these notes that found their way, you're assuring me they didn't come from your office, uh, Congressman. As far as I know, those notes did not come from my office to the Post reporters. And you hadn't talked to the Post reporters prior to the article on December 2nd, is that correct? Well, uh, they did call me and ask me to confirm the, they, they read out of the notes and I said, oh, look, I'm not going to confirm or deny, I'm not going to comment on the relationship, my relationship with the administrator. And then I talked about the positive mission of my office. I did have one prior conversation with the Post reporters uh, several months before that um, about how GSA contracts operate. Did you initiate that conversation or did they initiate that conversation? I believe they did. Okay. And, and we talked about firm fixed price contracts versus time and material contracts. Um, I did not, there was not one word mentioned about my relationship with the administrator or any of the okay. issues going now, on between me and the administrator. Now, you say that Alan Swendeman, uh, general counsel, told this committee that he asked the administrator several times to terminate the contract and that she refused. That was your, uh, your briefings to the committee. Is that correct? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. That uh, Mr. Swendeman told this committee that he had asked the administrator several times to terminate the contract and that she refused. Talking about the the, the twenty thousand dollar contract. Yes, I believe that's on the website uh, in the, the chairman's letter. Um, but uh, the, the, he he never told the committee any such thing that we're aware of. Are you aware of him telling the committee that, or did you get that off the website? I, I got that off of the website and the chairman's letter. So you get in the information from the majority, in this case. Okay, have you given any information about the committee's investigation? Um, that you've included in your report and testimony today? Have you been given any information about the committee's investigation that you have included in your report and testimony today besides that? I'd have to go back and look at the report. Um, we did look at the chairman's letter, um, uh, and I'd have to go back and, and take a close look to see. How much of your testimony comes from what the majority has put on their website, and how much of it comes from your independent investigation? Because the information about Mr. Swendeman's discussion from our investigation is flat out false. So what does that say about your credibility? You don't have any independent investigation. You just took it off the majority website. That, that's not correct, Congressman. I mean, most what? of my testimony is taken from I our, asked about that particular issue. Most of, our, most of the report is based on the investigation that my office did. Most of it. Most of it but is. But not all of it. There, um, Thank you. The statements of um, Mr. Swendeman. It seems that a significant. Well, I, he's, he's answered it. He just took this off your website. Am I wrong? That's where you said you got the information? Well, the statements that I was referring to that Mr. Swendeman made, I, I actually said he, he said to this committee in my Correct. opening I statement. Correct. I guess that's why I was moving off. I'm not going to let him run the clock out on this. Let me just ask this. 
It seems that a significant area of disagreement between you and the administrator centers on the OIG's performance of contract support audits. Is that fair to say? Uh, I don't believe the so. The disagreement Congress. between you and the administrator is, 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 uh, is it your view that it's important that your office provide this audit assistance on contract support? Well, uh, Congressman, I, I think my disagreement with, with the administrator is more on oversight. She has made numerous statements that she would like to reduce oversight. But, but uh, you also, I mean, in your, in your own testimony, you went after the, uh, this uh, Moldemir, the Sun Microsystems, and that is contract support, correct? I mean, a, a significant part of your testimony sure, today sure. was focused on that. So uh, all I was saying, a significant area of disagreement is on contract support. Now, my understanding is that in most agencies, they either use DCAA or auditors that do acquisition support exclusively as opposed to auditors from the IG's office. Isn't that true in, in a lot of agencies? Um, I, I don't know what the practice is at other agencies. You don't? Um, I know that many of them do use DCAA. Thank you. The, um, th what's different about our agency is that uh, there was a GAO report, and the GAO recommendation was that, and it was agreed to by GSA, it was actually uh, an arrangement uh, developed and established by the Office of Management and Budget. It was a Bush administration initiative to set up this reimbursable agreement for us to do these pre-award price audits. But that, but it doesn't happen that way in a lot of agencies. It's my only, my only. Point. That's that's correct. Okay, is your office paid by the GSA contracting activities for this audit support? There is a reimbursable uh, arrangement uh, where they reimburse us for our audit activities. Um, how much per year does your office receive for these services, Ballpark? Um, ballpark, it's um, uh, between four and five million. So, what's your total budget? Total budget uh, for last year was around 40, I'd have to get back to you with the specific ballpark, number. 40 million. Uh, about 43, okay. maybe more, maybe less. Is it your understanding that the office of the independent, uh, of the uh, of your office role in providing pre and post award contract audit reports is to support the contracting officer? Uh, yes, generally. That's not an oversight role that, in that sense, correct? Uh, pardon, uh, I'm your, sorry. Your role is in, is in providing pre and post award contract audit reports is to support the contracting officer who makes the decision. You're not vested with making the decision. That, that's correct, Congressman. You were advisory, correct? That's correct. Do you often get, I mean, do they always take your advice? No, they don't always. Okay, so it's not odd for a contracting officer to say, thank you very much, but I'm going to settle it, correct? They have a warrant, and they're responsible to, make, correct. to exercise their own judgment. In our acquisition system, it's the contracting officer that makes the final decision to award a contract, exercise an option, or take any other contract action then, correct? As I understand it, one of the roles of the Office of Inspector General is to impartially evaluate the agency's programs and functions. Do you see any tension between the evaluation role and the role of advisor to the contracting officer in a particular acquisition? Do I see any conflict between? Any, con any, any tension, not conflict. Do you see any tension between your evaluative role and the role of advisor to the contracting officer in a particular acquisition? Uh, uh, on the, go ahead. I, I, I think I'd have to think about that question. That'd be fine. That'd be fine. Bit. You can get back to us on okay. that. Okay. I think my time's up now. We'll have more questions. Thank you. Uh, may, may I, Mr. Chairman, may I yes. explain, I guess, an answer a little more fully? Um, we, we did interview Mr. Swindem, and it's, 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 the report of his interview is in our investigative report. Uh, so we did rely on, on those statements of Mr. Swindem as well. Uh, so it's... I'd like to point that out. Let me Thank you. Um, wait a minute. He's, we got this. I'm looking at the list of witnesses and exhibits for today, and I don't see it. I have a number of others. I'm looking here at the report of investigation for official use only. Oh, this is page 26, if you want to move 26. That's your list of witnesses and exhibits. And I see a number of exhibits, but I do not see that. With the chair's indulgence, may I consult yeah. with? Uh, sure, please.
And maybe you could be confusing Lowentrip, who was the acting general counsel. Okay. Is that what uh, happened? Uh, yeah, I'll withdraw. No, that's fine. Okay. I, I just, for the record, we just, okay, thank you. Thank you, Congressman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair will recognize himself uh, to uh, pursue some questions. By, by the way, your investigation of the leak was more extensive than the White House investigation of the outing of a CIA agent which was involving national security. They did nothing. We had a hearing on that a couple of weeks ago. They, they did absolutely nothing. They didn't ask any of their employees. They didn't ask anybody who had access to this information how it got out, how it was being uh, marketed to different uh, press people, even though it affected uh, national security and might have threatened the life of a a, a covert CIA agent. Maybe they could transfer Mr. Miller to the White House and everybody would be happy here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then he could make uh, political presentations about the upcoming Republican campaigns. Uh, I want to ask you about a statement that you made regarding the Sun contract. You said that Ms. Doan's actions were a breach of GSA's fiduciary duty to U.S. taxpayers. Why did you say this? Well, because um, for the first Sun con the there were two uh, contracts with Sun prior to that that were consolidated into one Sun contract. We did a post-award audit. We did two post-award audits on that and, and learned that Sun had overcharged us by $27 million. Um, so the first Sun contract cost $27 um, million in defective pricing. To push through another contract with Sun on, uh, following that is what I was trying to express was uh, not in the best interest of the taxpayer, especially when we had done a pre-award audit indicating that uh, the um, rates, uh, the dis discounts that Sun was offering were not the best discounts to the government. They were offering commercial customers better discounts than they were to the U.S. taxpayers. And that was inconsistent with the rules, wasn't it? It was. Yes, sir. Now, you also said it's the first time we are aware of in which an administration has personally intervened in this way. Why did you say that? Our, my staff is not aware of a, an administrator becoming involved in any negotiation in the same way at any time in the past. Well, she said she wasn't involved. Our office has not been aware of any administrator being involved, even in the way that she says she was involved in um, uh, with, with the emails and uh, with uh, talking with the commissioner of F FAS and certainly with the word going out that this was a strategically important contract and needed to go through. Certainly when she talked to, on August 29th, she called an impromptu meeting with the head of audits of my uh, staff and with my counsel. And at that meeting, she told them how important the, the Sun contract was and that it needed to go through. They attempted to explain the problems with the Sun negotiation. And this was Miss Doan herself? With Miss Doan herself. Hmm. And Never would she have cut thought the, that. She cut them off um, when they tried to explain the problems with the Sun negotiation. Now, they were trying to explain to her what the, her own contracting officers had said, that if they go ahead with this um, contract, the, the, the taxpayers are going to have to pay millions of dollars in additional funds for a service um, that, that then otherwise would be the case. Is that right? That's right. That's right. So she, she said she acted as if she wasn't involved in this. Uh, um, I, guess, I guess the question is, what does involved mean? It's sort of like, what is a briefing? <laughs> a briefing seems to be, in her mind, only a sit-down meeting where charts and, and, uh, and uh, pointers are involved. But, uh, you actually had a sit-down with meeting with her, or was it a telephone conversation? Well, actually, it was the head of my audits, uh, Andy Patchett. Mm -hmm. He was the uh, assistant inspector general for auditing and the counsel for the inspector general uh, who went up and uh, briefed her on this um, at very short notice. Mm -hmm. um, well, if they didn't give this contract to Sun Microsystem, wouldn't they have had other bidders come in and... Uh, have some competition and see if somebody else would do the job at a cheaper amount? Mr. Chairman, that was our position. In fact, our Deputy, General, uh, D Deputy Inspector General suggested that one way to resolve the impasse was for GSA to team up with NASA, the NASA soup, to force Sun to, lower, to give the government better discounts. 
because um, by joining forces with NASA, we have more leverage on Sun, and we would be able to push the discounts uh, to, to get greater dis discounts and a better price for the taxpayer. Well, that would have been good, but Ms. Doan seemed to worry that uh, the NASA might uh, provide a contract in, with Sun Microsystems and then she wouldn't get the money that GSA gets for that contract. Is that right? Well, that, that's what I understand was her point to the head of my aud auditing and to the council. She did mention the NASA soup. Now, I wasn't there, so I can't say yeah. for sure what, what was said. But, well, the only uh, comment I'd make to that is her job is to protect the taxpayers, not to have the taxpayers more pay more just so she could get a percentage for her agency? Well, there, there is, um, at GSA, obviously, if the price goes up, um, the GSA gets a commission, so to speak, a fee. And so the, the revenues going into GSA actually increase. Um, but if the price goes down, the fee decreases. Um, and by our pre-award audits, we can actually push, if the contracting officer accepts our recommendations, the prices can actually go down and it may result in, in fewer uh, funds going into GSA. How do, how do NASA soup prices compared to GSAs? I'm, I'm told NASA's are often uh, better. Is that the case? Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't know personally. Okay. I understand that um, NASA soup <laughs> may actually adopt uh, GSA's price negotiations. Okay. Um, now, I, this I'm is on a sure. schedule that goes out to the government wide, and GSA is supposed to bargain tough, hard, to yes. negotiate the lowest prices because other, that's what everybody in the government assumes they've done when they go out and take advantage of that, a contract negotiated by GSA. Isn't that correct? That's correct, and okay. it does have an impact to uh, resellers as well. The, the price negotiation drives the price, the discount that resellers of the same product sell. Uh, to government agencies. So it can have a massive impact. Well, that involved money. Now let me ask you about a third statement you made uh, involving the E.D. Fraser contract. And yes, sir. In your testimony, and I gather that didn't go through, but in your testimony you said that the record paints quite a different picture than what Administrator Doan told the OIG investigators. This sounds like you're saying that she was not candid. Why did you say this? Well, I, as I was trying to explain to uh, the ranking member, um, but I, I didn't get a chance to explain, was the allegation came in. We thought the agent would simply interview the administrator and we would close the report, write a, a, a letter or report to the White House liaison. But instead, she told a story to our agents that could not possibly be true. And um, as a result, we had to go forward with our investiga investigation of the administrator. Um, now, several days later, her attorney sent a letter uh, trying to explain that, that the statements she made were incorrect, inaccurate. What did she say that was not true? Well, um, as I recall, she... Um, I wasn't actually at the um, interview, but what the agents told me about the interview was she uh, denied signing the contract and she actually folded up the paper to say that it wasn't this, it was something like, like something else and she'd folded it up. And when you put those pieces of paper together, you get two paragraphs uh, that, are, that have the same number. Mm -hmm. And it just was not a, a plausible uh, story. Mm. Other statements are, um, uh, statements that um, um, that that it wasn't a contract. That um, she also minimized her relationship with Miss um, Fraser. Well, what's the significance of? I know she said a lot uh, a lot today that it wasn't really a contract. What what is significant? Why does she keep on denying this is a contract? She said it was a draft outline of the work to be performed, but she has difficulty saying or that the document was a binding contract. And I find it surprising a person coming from a business background, as Ms. Doan does, would have so much trouble understanding whether or not she's entered into a contract. Was it a contract or was it not a contract? I believe it was a contract, Mr. Chairman. Also, the general counsel at the time, Alan Swendeman, uh, believed it was a contract, as did uh, the acting, now the acting general counsel, Lenny Lowentritt. In fact, uh, that was the reason why 
there had to be a letter of termination. Uh, and in fact, uh, when asked about the letter of termination, I believe Ms. Doan said that that was to correct the perception on the part of Ms. Frazier that there was a contract. When in fact we saw uh, emails back to um, back and forth between between her and John Feltz after the the termination letter went out, that that where John Feltz says, "Well, I'll have to tell Edie that um, we have more work to to do on our end." Um, and uh, the, to get this moving forward. You, you said, you started to say before that she minimized her relationship with Ms. Fraser. What, what's the significance of that? Well, um, it, over a three year period, um, uh, Ms. Doan has paid over a half million dollars to um, Edie Fraser's uh, public uh, affairs group, uh, to Ms. Fr Fraser, uh, for consulting um, and um, and uh, other. Well, that's interesting because I, under questioning from the Republicans, they made the statement that that uh, Ms. Doan. Uh, so Ms. Doan did pay money to her, so she was working for Ms. Doan. That 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 was. Uh, well, that's yeah. correct. It, it was for sponsorships and uh, consulting. The consulting services was mm -hmm. to promote uh, Ms. Doan uh, personally and as president of NTMI. Mm -hmm. And the fee for that was $20,000 a month. And it is interesting to note that the fee that Ms. Doan uh, fixed was uh, $20,000. And she said that she decided that on her second or third day at GSA. We're told over and over again, $20,000 is a small amount of money. And besides, it didn't happen. She didn't actually enter the con it, So why, do you think it's a big deal or not? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think what, what the problem is, as I explained, we thought that our agents would interview her, she would accept responsibility and, and admit the mistake. Instead, she did not. She told a story and it forced us to continue to investigate. It forced us to issue subpoenas. We had to wait for documents to come back on subpoenas. I think the issue is that of uh, candor, of um, uh, accepting responsibility, of um, being truthful with law enforcement, um, she, she mentioned that, uh, and I think she said publicly that she worked hard to terminate the uh, contract, the relationship, when in fact the emails and the documents that I believe are in the committee's possession show that she was still trying to get this going as late as um, I believe September, early September, September 4th or so. And I mentioned the August email where Phelps Well, that's, said, a, that's astounding. You're saying she wasn't candid with law enforcement. Are you saying law enforcement is your independent investigation? Oh, uh, yeah, I meant our agents. Your agents? Is, yes. Is, okay. And, now, and, and the statement from her attorney it admits that she made misstatements to our agents. And that's, that explains the, the need for the supplemental statement. Mm -hmm. Can you explain um, the leadership role the GSA administrator plays in the federal acquisition community and why it's important for her to demonstrate a familiarity with the federal acquisition regulations? Your investigation concluded that when she awarded this contract, uh, uh, she ignored several of the most basic rules of federal contracts, such as the principle that contracts should be awarded on a competitive basis. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, as head of the uh, premier civilian procurement agency, um, it's important that the, that the chief of that agency follow the procurement rules. As inspector general, our job is to make sure that everyone follows those rules and procedures. And, it's a basic uh, principle of government contracting that you award a contract based on what's best for the government, not based on your friendship with somebody. Isn't that a, st a, a correct statement? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, you know, at, at the time, um, Public Affairs Group was owned, I believe, ultimately by General Electric. So it was a subsidiary of General Electric at the time. Now, let me just conclude because I see the yellow lights on. Um, you raise these concerns. It sounds like you had a pretty acrimonious relationship with her. You didn't feel she was being candid with you and your agents, even, even though she has an obligation to be. Her response was to try to cut your budget, wasn't it? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, there, there were efforts on the part of the administrator to, uh, to try and cut our, our uh, actually prevent us from presenting our budget to OMB. And she actually stopped and said, 
I had a proposal to add in, uh, criminal investigators, and she simply well, would not. Well, you felt on. that was a recrimination against your criticism. Y yes or no, and I have one last question before okay. my time's uh, up. I, I don't want to go there. Okay. Um, the last question I want to ask you is, are you concerned about the slides of a, that involved a political presentation on the premises of GSA that was Republican, partisan from the political affairs person at the political person at the White House about how people ought to get involved or at least know what's happening for Republicans, um, and about her statement that a number of witnesses gave to us that she said, uh, how can we help our candidates in this next election? Right. As I have said, uh, a, a confidential source told our agents all that, and it was very concerning. We did our duty, which was to refer it to the appropriate investigatory agency, the Office of Special Counsel. Uh, so, Do you know whether inspector. everybody does this? It sounded to me from the def her defense, her defenders, was that everybody does, all the agencies do that, all administrations do that. Is, is, do you know that to be the case? And does that mean everybody violates I, the law? I certainly hope that's not the case, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman. Um, that, um, that uh, as Inspector General, I have t sworn an oath to follow the law. Um, as administrator, she has sworn an oath to follow the law. Okay. And Thank I hope that other officials follow the law. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now proceed Platts. to uh, Mr. Platts. For five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for, first, uh, um, Inspector General Miller, I appreciate your testimony and, and uh, also your service uh, at GSA. Um, and Thank you, Congressman. wanted to clarify, I apologize in, in being in three other places um, at the same time and having to run back out of here, uh, but I know the one issue was raised about the documents uh, that were shared with my committee staff uh, and then uh, 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 the same topic was addressed in a, a post story. Uh, one, I appreciate the Inspector General having met with my staff as we yeah. sought to, I would say, take a similar approach to Senator Grassley to try to diminish the, the problems that were between IG's office administrator and uh, my staff had conversations with OMB, uh, with uh, Clay Johnson's office to try to yes. resolve these issues. Um, but Thank I want to make clear that in the documents that were shared by you, and I appreciated your working with us, that um, neither prior to uh, the story being published or since have any of my staff that were part of that meeting or I shared any of those documents uh, with the, the Post or any other journalist uh, to address this issue through the media. Uh, I think it's important that we understand our efforts were in a similar vein to Senator Grassley of just trying to have a, uh, mm -hmm. a good government resolution sure. of the issue. Sure. So, but I do appreciate your service and, uh, and efforts in uh, taking your responsibilities uh, seriously. I apologize that I'm not able to stay. I'm going to uh, yield the balance of my time to, the, to the ranking member. So, um, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Congressman, I, I appreciate your help and your staff's help uh, on these issues. Um, okay, Mr. Miller, let me ask, uh, thank who you. else did you brief besides Mr. Platts? Because you threw his office out there. Did you brief Mr. Grassley's staff at that time? In, in I, I believe I, uh, it, it's hard for me to re reconstruct over over. Well, we're trying to and, reconstruct where the documents came from, and Mr. Platts has said he didn't. Um, did you brief Mr. Waxman's staff at that point? I don't believe I did. Okay. Um, uh, you're asking me to, to think back from July through. Um, Correct. Right, what, if you what don't did remember, the article you don't come remember. out uh, December. Um, Correct. And um, you know, I met with oversight. I met with Senate oversight staff, um, Homeland Security, and government government okay, affairs. To get to um, Let Senator me ask Collins. you this: You were on the invite list for the January 26th brown bag lunch. Did you attend? I did not. Uh, did anyone from your office attend? Were there any scheduled uh, no, who attended? Um, you made a referral to the Office of uh, Special Counsel, correct? That's correct. Um, did the referral include the, the White House for the slides, or did it just include uh, Administrator Dunn? The referral referred the allegations. Um, as I understand it, a confidential source talked to agents in my office. Uh, they. Con contacted agents at the Office of Special Counsel. Correct. Told I'm just what saying, the allegations were. in terms of the allegations, were the allegations directed at the administrator or were they uh, also to Mr. Jennings at the White House, who gave the political slide that has been the subject today? 
I, I'd have to go back and look at the file, Congressman. Um, I, I believe I, I gave a copy of the referral to, to the chairman uh, you have upon one his you? written request. Do we don't have a copy of the referral. We have not received a copy of the referral, uh, Mr. Waxman, from your staff. It would be helpful to it have that. I mean, my question here is, was this labeled just at, uh, at Administrator Doan or was it at the White House as well? And you don't remember? Uh, I, I don't know, Congressman. Would you ask your staff, would, they know, would anyone here know? Um, so you supplied I, I this to Chairman Waxman's staff, but you haven't it, provided it to us, basically. Well, the Chairman wrote a letter to me asking right. for it. And he copied me. I don't. I don't know if he copied you. you, you copy? Generally, you do. Uh, right? Yeah, we've always copied letters to you, and we always uh, share the information we get in response to those letters, so I can't explain it. Okay. Well, well I, we'd I'm like to know to, that. Uh, we'll check our files. I will provide a copy of the referral uh, to you. I just want to know if it's, if it's aimed at Administrator Doan or if it's also aimed at the White House, who, after all, called the meeting. It was not called by Administrator Doan, correct? Uh, Congressman Davis, I'm not, uh, I wouldn't say that it was directed at anyone person or another person. I, so you're not what, even saying here it was directed at the administrator? Uh, what, what we got were credible allegations that appeared to be a violation of the Hatch Act. We, uh, my investigations office referred it over to the Office of Special Counsel. Right, but the media reports and the other allegations seemed to direct it just at her and she didn't call the meeting. And um, at the same time, she didn't make the presentation, which is, if you've, if you've watched today, has really been the subject of some controversy, whether the administration was right to come in and, and make these presentations in a federal building. She wasn't the one who originated this. So my question would be, and I guess this goes hold to Mr. Waxman's, is, is there's a retaliation going on or anything? Was this directed at her or was it directed at the whole presentation? And you don't know the answer to that is what you're telling me. You made a, you made a referral to the Justice Department or just, or just the, uh, or not to Justice, uh, or did you just Office make it to the special counsel? Just to the special counsel on Hatch Act. Uh, yes, uh, as I explained earlier, I, you, I think you may have been out of the room. I have to do my duty as Inspector General. I agree with that. I'm just asking and if that included the get, White House or just the administration. When we get credible allegations in, um, we refer them to the appropriate investigatory agency. I understand, but my question okay. is the allegations, if you look at this, would have included both, would they not? Well, um, the as I understand it, the Hatch Act issue is within the uh, sole jurisdiction of the office of special counsel. Correct. So I. But the referral. And Mr. Jennings could well have been exempt from the Hatch Act. He may Act. or may not have. Do you know if Mr. Jennings was exempt from the Hatch Act or not? I'm not an expert in the Hatch Act. Exactly so. my point. But the office of special counsel. Actually, Mr. Stone has that. some exemptions under the Hatch Act the, as well as the, the administrator. Of, the office of special counsel is, and that's why when we. I, but you understand my point. My point is, was I'm this not inclusive? Sure that I do. Was this inclusive? of the entire presentation and the slides from the administration, or was this just about Mrs. Dunn? I, I, you, I don't think, know, you don't know I, the answer. I think what happened was someone told, told our agents that this happened, it looked like it was wrong, and that it but what may happened? violate what the What happened? I think the allegations, and again, I, <laughs> I wish I had the, the well, you knew this in front the of subject, me. You knew this was the subject when you came here today, so I'm OK, well, as I understand it, um, I also knew that my office was not very involved in this, that we handed it off to the Office of Special Counsel. But as I understand, the confidential source said that there was a presentation on some sort of uh, election um, results, maybe. I don't quite remember what uh, I'm trying to, and again, <laughs> I'd rather just go back and check the documents and and then respond. Well, we'll the record I, open to receive I, I, Well, I just wanted to get him why he was under oath, though, to get it, because when he sends them later, I don't know if that applies. And I just want to make sure you don't know the answers right now. You'll get back to us. Yeah, I'll get back to you. OK. Uh, Mr. Eisen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to continue a little bit along that line. When you were speaking to Chairman Waxman, uh, and you referred to law enforcement officers. Yes. Now, that term is really a term from your years as a U.S. attorney, with assistant U.S. attorney, is it? And in fact, that's really your career. You're a career prosecutor. You're not an accountant. No, sir. You don't understand how to deal with, uh, with bureaucracies, where the problems are. No, and I'm, 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 I know you're smiling, but, but I want to understand this. You're not just about the, whack, the Hatch Act. In fact, that's not within your jurisdiction. Your jurisdiction is supposed to be to find the waste, fraud, and abuse within the GSA, right? 
Uh, correct, and, and to, to investigate credible allegations of wrongdoing. Okay. And it, it seems like we're spending an awful lot of time on a $20,000 uh, non-contract, but let me just run you through a couple of questions here, because I want to understand it uh, related to Administrator Doan. She could have taken $200,000 worth of her employees' time and had them do research and prepare and try to consult, right? She has the ability to have those people work for her and do what she needs to do. Uh, Congressman, uh, first of all, I do believe it was a contract. I believe that's what the general counsel then concluded. Alan Swenderman and also the acting, well, I, acting I appreciate that, general that's, counsel, Lenny you know, Lone Tree. And that's right, why I, there I appreciate was a, that, but that's a, it, okay. is, it is a personal service contract if we're going to put the word contract on it. It was a, it was a request for a service that would cost $20,000, which she wanted done in order to further the, the office's ability to ex execute things. And I want to simply ask you, she could have, in fact, gone to her people and said, go study and read and spent $200,000 accomplishing the same thing. Wouldn't have been a problem at all, right? She has the ability to use her own resources, millions and millions of dollars worth of human beings' time to do that. As, as the IG, I, I'm assuming you can answer that with some credible uh, validity. Well, well Congressman, I, I would assume that she would also look at the in-house capability no. to do that um, right. so job she, as but well, I asked you and a that no. she would follow no. all the procurement rules. You know, the point is, I'm asking the questions, I'd like the answers to my okay, questions. Sure. I believe that you've been on a witch hunt and that this is, in fact, an IG who, instead of looking at the waste, fraud, and abuse, is, set, is going after one person, a big, a big prosecution, for, if you will, of one individual. And that's, from my, my opinion, we'll see in the long run how it pans out, but I do see $20,000 in an agency of $54 billion, and I'm going back to my questions. You're not really comfortable looking into the nuances of all the contracts. You picked this, this, this $20,000 service agreement in order to, to go after. Is that correct? That's not correct, Congressman. Um, I would really okay. like the opportunity to try and explain to you why well, no, it's I, not. My time is very I... short. It's five minutes. So when I ask a question that's a yes or no, I'll take a yes or no, and, and you're, you're welcome to it or a little beyond uh, that. Absolutely no. It's not a witch hunt. Okay. Uh, what other areas are you working on in the $54 billion that uh, is being spent by the GSA? Well, we recently settled a case with uh, Oracle and PeopleSoft for $98.5 million. That uh, was settled in October. I'm vice chair of the National Procurement Fraud Working Group. Uh, um, uh, is, that as a is that as a result of your position? Or is that something you had before you came to this position? Uh, it's a result of, uh, I was appointed to, to that. Um, okay. when it was formed in now, October. You know, I'm, look, I, I, I have no question you're, you're a fine prosecutor with a great history of being able to do those. I'm just trying to understand why a mistake which was corrected by the GSA itself, the contract, if you call it that, was canceled, even though there's nothing in that contract that says it could be canceled, it was canceled without a penny being spent. And my real question is, when you said earlier, if Ms. Doan had said, oh, I made a mistake, you implied that that would have been the end of it. Now, in your years as a prosecutor, do cases end if you think they're, uh, they're criminal or wrong? Do they end because somebody says, oh, I'm so sorry? And her, her belief that it wasn't a contract and that she didn't do anything wrong, does that somehow change the facts on the ground for you? Because that's what you said here under oath today, was that, uh, that in fact, if she just apologized, it would have been okay if she just uh, admitted that. Uh, well, Congressman, first of all, I, I didn't say if she just apologized. My point was that this was a credible allegation. We have a responsibility. I don't have a choice. I have a duty to follow up on credible allegations of, of wrongdoing. This was a credible allegation. It came complete with documents. Um, right. you know, I, okay. I, but because my yellow light is on, I just want to do one follow-up. She, in fact, said she didn't think it was a contract. As such, she wasn't apologetic for it. And that's what uh, that's, caused you to continue on with the prosecution, that, is what you said here today. Uh, Gentleman's I, I time has expired. You'll be given an opportunity now to answer uh, the question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think that you, that's not what I said, uh, Congressman. What, what I said and what I meant was that we, we have a duty to follow up on allegations. I went up to her personally and said, you know, I'm sorry, but our agents are going to have to come and interview you. Uh, we, we have this uh, complaint. Um, we fully expected 
that she would be uh, totally forthcoming with our agents and that that would explain the whole matter. There would not be any other leads to follow up on and that um, you know we would just close it out. And I was actually wondering who do I write the letter to? Uh, is it the White House liaison? Because it, this does not happen very often. And um, the agents come back and said no, she told um, a story that they did not believe was a cor correct story, an accurate story. And um, then um, we had to make a decision. We had to follow up to see, well, gee, uh, what, are, what are the facts here? I do have an obligation to follow the facts. Thank you. Uh, um, no thank no you. more, but no less. Thank you, Mr. Ice. Uh, uh, Mr. Micah, I think you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sorry I didn't get to hear all of the, I heard your testimony, but all of the uh, questions, I hope I don't repeat any. Um, Mr. Miller, one of your responsibilities as the Inspector General is to um, look at things that are, uh, aren't going right or problems with contracts uh, within GSA. Is that correct? Um, yeah, generally, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, were we, we, you aware of, uh, like, say, in an HR uh, uh, human resources uh, situation, uh, I may, may or may not have been important to you, but were you aware of some of the failings uh, as far as GSA and getting a, uh, I guess they were going to get a failing score. They got a failing score on some of the diversity issues uh, as in regard to GSA. Were you aware we, of that? We, we were aware of that issue and that problem, and yes, you, sir. And did you I investigate it, it or uh, was there any review by you? Did well, you ever see the memo that... Uh, was referred to that Ms. Dorn did not read, but uh, uh, she she was um, briefed on. But was it by Mendoza? Uh, Congress, and I, I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to, but there is an SBA scorecard. Yes. That um, I believe came out in December 2006 that gave an F rating to the GSA. But again, this wouldn't be of concern, but you, you are not aware of it. Well, uh, to the extent that we're part of the agency, we are concerned mm -hmm. about that. It doesn't fall but within the mission of Ms. the Dorn, Office of Inspector General. Well, again, I think one of the things that uh, Administrator Dorn, uh, her concern, and pr probably rightfully so, an African-American female administrator uh, uh, agency, one of her concerns was to as to come in here uh, in this position from the private sector and see the public sector uh, getting a failing uh, score or about to get a failing score uh, maybe for a second time. And uh, I guess she was really trying to push this contract to get a review uh, through this group. Was it diversity, best practices, uh, Ms. Frazier? She was really pushing that, wasn't she? Um, uh, Congressman, I. To, for her to be involved in those issues is, is perfectly fine. I understand that. Uh -huh. Our concern was we got an but, allegation. But she was trying Gentlemen, to push. Gentlemen, you just a, a one point for the record. Yes. That, that failing score wasn't something that mo motivated her. That failing score was after this contract had fallen through. Uh, that's what I understand, yeah. Mr. Chairman. Well, I, I, it's it, my it understanding that GSA already had a reputation for a failing uh, score, that this isn't a like a, uh, a new revelation, or, and she was briefed that they were going to get a failing score and was trying to do something about it, uh, but it wasn't very important to, uh, to you. But she was really pushing this because uh, I think uh, even the general counsel had uh, advised her to turn, uh, she had signed off on, on this contract, but was the co contract executed, uh, fully executed? I, I believe it was, Congressman. Um, and she, but she was really pushing this to get this diversity study, and you advised her, uh, you you advised her not to, or was that the, uh, uh, was that the general counsel, I believe the Mr. General, Alan Swen, is it Swendeman? I believe Alan Swendeman count, strongly. You did not her. advise her. It was that uh, Mr. That would, that would have been the general counsel's role. Okay, and. Uh, Mr. Swindeman, uh, uh, the general counsel allegedly told the committee that they had uh, uh, evidence that he repeatedly advised that the contract be terminated. Uh, is it, that 
That's my understanding. But you never advised that. Did he advise you that something was wrong? Mr. Swenderman? Yes, the, the, the general counsel. It, it, it I don't would, think Dorn was going to call you. Well, it, it, it would not have been his role. I, he did not advise well, us. Well, how did you find out then? We, got, we received a, a complaint, a, an anonymous complaint w with documents of the contract that and we that, had. And was that before or after? Um, but I'm, I, I guess it would be after the contract was signed. I don't recall the, the precise date. But did, I can Swen look it did up. the uh, general counsel contact you? Pardon me? Did, did the general counsel contact you? It was, it was no, a, an anonymous. The general Okay. It was then did you contact him? Um, the general our, counsel. You get a complaint. Agents. Did you call the first thing I would have done is call the general counsel and said, I've got a complaint here that she's trying to push this contract that's been uh, signed, did, and you advised her against it. Did you talk to him? Gentlemen's time has expired, but please answer the question. But my, my agents did interview Mr. Swendeman. Um, they also interviewed Mr. Lowentritt of the general counsel's office. Um, you know, our, our obligation was to follow up on the contract, we, uh, on the allegation. We had the allegation, the complaint, and the contract. We then, our agents interviewed the administrator. Mr. Shays. Thank you, um, Mr. Miller. Mr. Miller, I believe the inspector generals have a vital role to play. Thank you. I get uncomfortable when I think they focus on minutia and then ignore big pictures. And frankly, you know, this is a his. Could you yield for just 30? Uh, Let me just make my points. Uh, so I, I have a problem with that. And the second issue I have a problem with is I, I have a problem if I feel like an inspector general is just doing something to gotcha. And so when I look at this meeting that I think never should have happened, and I know that you were invited, what, what I find curious is why someone didn't go to, to the, the chief of staff uh, of the secretary or the administrator and say, you know, this is a really dumb idea. I think it borders on a bad meeting. And was it, was it just that you knew there was a meeting, but you didn't know what was going to happen in the meeting? That, that's correct. I, I get emails for these brown bag lunches all the time because I'm a presidential appointee appointed by President Bush, and I'm copied on all the. Did you know what the, brown, the, the purpose of the meeting was? I, I looked at the email briefly um, and went on to my other email, emails. So the answer is like other people have come before it. You looked at the, but did it, did, did it make clear in the email what, the, what it was about? I think it, what, what I read was that it was Mr. Jennings coming over for a brown bag. That's it? That, that's all I recall. Okay. Um, the next issue I just want to ask you with, with Mr. Swintendale, excuse me, with the issue of the contract, um, the diversity contract, basically I look at it and said no contract, no service performed, no, no money transferred, end of story. What am I missing in this? Thank, thank you for asking that. Well, I think what you're missing is that when our agents interviewed the administrator, they, they received a story that couldn't possibly be true, which forced us to continue to investigate to find out what happened. Well, um, um, to me, no contract, no money spent, uh, no service performed. That's the way I look at it. But let me yield to my well, colleague, uh, the ranking member. Mr. Uh, did you want to quickly get something? Uh, I, I, we don't it, have it. The maybe doesn't have to. The it, general uh, counsel's uh, any memorandum statement. Yeah, um, do you have notes from the interview with Mr. Swindeman? I believe we do. Could you I make can, those available? And, and here's those. why I ask, is, is that our information, we interviewed him, is that he wrote one memo uh, to the administrator. Uh, there are no phone calls and no emails. And that uh, is at a, a variance with what you're representing. We just need to see if we can get that squared. Okay. Let me ask a couple other questions. Um, you assumed your duties as the GSA IG in July 2005. Correct. In, in June 2006, Administrator Doan assumed her duties. The GSA at that point was experiencing serious fiscal challenges with the possibility of anti-deficiency act violations. Is that correct? Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Congressman, I, I don't believe that's correct. I believe they okay. were running a surplus of okay. over, you know, I'd have to check into it, but I believe they have always run a surplus and last year it was over 400 million. Okay. 
So you don't think there were fiscal uh, that there were serious fiscal challenges? No, there, there are always serious fiscal challenges, and I applaud administrators Doan's, Doan's um, attempts to exercise fiscal discipline. Did you take any actions in your office um, to address the fiscal challenges, or did you feel that wasn't your problem? That was part of the rest of GSA. No, I guess it goes to the nub of it. No, we we. We obviously had a very serious fiscal problem uh, because Administrator Doan informed us that our 07 money was going to be terminated. And so all of a sudden we had uh, five million or two and a half million well, dollars taken out of our current operating but had budget. But had you done anything else to streamline your budget in response to her requests to tighten the budget? To tighten. Well, we, we, we tightened all around. We had to tighten. What did you do to tighten? Uh, pardon me? What did you do in your office to tighten the belt? Well, um, we reduced hiring. We, we actually looked at... Um, did you put a freeze two, on? Two dozen auditors were in danger of a, a RIF, a reduction in right. force. So we were looking at those well, that issues. was under her rules, not under yours. What did you do? What did no, that, you do? That, was a, that was my... I mean, the, I was looking at how to manage the office without the reimbursable um, um, monies. And but so aside from the reimbursable monies, notwithstanding that, if the, if the agency was undergoing uh, fiscal constraints, did you come forward and say, look, I don't think you need to take away that money. I'll do these to reduce operations. That, that's what I'm asking as a, as uh, a loyal member of the team. Okay. Uh, I, I understand your question now. Um, and I believe that I'm duty bound as an inspector general to make sure that we have the resources to do our job. Okay, is, doesn't the, everybody the, feel, did you, so the answer is you didn't well, do anything. May, may I explain? Yeah. I mean, I, but I, my red light's on, I just want to make sure you can answer that, but also do this. I think every agency head feels it's their job to do that, and if everybody does that, when the administrator comes down and says, can you tighten up, can you let this go, right. they're all going to say no, and they're all going to complain. Well, I, I believe what, what the point you're missing here is that we have a separate appropriation. Right. The money that goes to our office is a separate appropriation. Our, our requests, our, our budget requests are attached to the GSA budget and never before has any administrator um, said, no, we're not going to pass it on to OMB and to the Congress or extensively edited what we said, taking out phrases like fraud, waste and abuse. Um, so it's not coming out of the GSA budget. Um, it's, a, it's a separate budget. Um, Are you the only separate line in GSA? Pardon Are there me? other agencies that have separate lines in the budget as That'll well? That will have to be the last question. Would you answer it? And then I think we have to conclude this hearing. Uh, I believe other IGs have separate appropriations, No, yes. but within GSA, are there other separate lines of appropriation? I do not know the answer to that, oh, Congressman. Okay. One, one very last point is that the $5 million that the administrator was taking was still going to be spent. It was not a budget-cutting issue at all. It was going to be spent. It was simply going to be spent on uh, small contractors. So it was not a budget issue. Let me thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Let me just ask if we could keep the record open on that, just to clarify some uh, some questions and inconsistencies. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Mr. Miller. We appreciate your testimony, and we may have further questions uh, that we'll submit in writing to you, and we would appreciate a response in writing for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you. you, Ranking Member. Thank you, members. Let, let me just conclude, and I'll give Mr. Davis a chance if he wants to say anything to conclude. But I, I think that the uh, the basic rules of government is that federal agencies uh, are not to be used for government, uh, for government politicking. The, the rules for anybody heading up an agency is that they have to follow the rules that say the government resources uh, are not to be used for partisan politics. They can't give no-bid contracts to their friends, and they should listen to their career staff and auditors when it involves millions of dollars out of taxpayers' pockets. And I just want to uh, cl close by pointing out what Senator Grassley said. This investigation is not only worthwhile, but that we would be ignoring our constitutional oversight responsibilities if we would, didn't hold these hearings. And I think that, uh, I think that uh, it's clear in my mind that Senator Grassley was correct. Uh, GSA involves billions of dollars, and if we're seeing millions of dollars squandered, uh, I think we ought to speak up about it because if money's being squandered, it comes out of the taxpayers' pockets, 
And uh, it may be millions today, but it could be billions tomorrow if people just don't follow the rules. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Davis, any concluding no, statement? Mr. Waxman, let me just say, of course, it's appropriate oversight for this committee to look at how all of our agencies, including GSA, operate. Um, I would have basically favored a uh, hearing today that would have been more programmatic in terms of looking at the issues in GSA. There are a lot of issues there. Uh, we've got the merger of FTS and, and the FSS and how that has operated. Uh, I think the issue in terms of Sun Microsystems could be an interesting exercise, but I think it's become way too personalized in this particular case. And Mr. Miller, I hope that, that uh, you and the Administrator can patch it up and work together. We count on everybody working as a team. That clearly hasn't happened in this case. And I'm not going to throw brick brats in terms of who's to blame, but as we leave here today, if we can focus and recognize you have a reporting responsibility to her and you also have independence, and balancing that appropriate is something we rely on you all to do. And when it gets to this stage, uh, I think it becomes a way too personal. Let me just finally say in terms of government politicking, uh, I don't know how you take politics out of government, uh, but there, we, we will look at these issues as we move forward. Mr. Waxman and I have talked about uh, some issues raised today that are not personal to the administrator. Uh, but I can tell you that cabinet officers are all the time out campaigning for and against members. I'm sure their staffs are, are part of that. I had a cabinet secretary come in and campaign against me in my reelect in 1996. Uh, not sure what the appropriate balance is. We'll explore this in future hearings, but I thank you for being well, here. We do have laws. Yes, we and do. the laws say that you can't, on government time, on government uh, resources, well, this go out and campaign. When cabinet secretaries go out and campaign, they do it at the expense of the campaigns. And it may be personal to Ms. Doan because she's the one heading this agency, but we've had a senator and her inspector general, and I must say my own conclusion is that she's not always being very candid and telling us the truth, and that makes her problems much worse because she well, has to be honest. There is no evidence here that she campaigned at all on government time. She was, uh, you know, a, a, a sitting here uh, at a hearing that was called, or at a meeting that was called by the White House. Mr. Chairman, uh, in that. As, as you summarize, just a, uh, I do think some positive things could come out of this. I did not know that you could, that the White House could video conference uh, in this fashion. We might want to look at that because I'm now learning that this went on. And even uh, Mr. Miller uh, said he participated or was invited to participate. That's one thing. I did not, not know the GSA, GSA administrator didn't have discretion to do uh, a, a contract, uh, say, for $20,000 well, uh, and was, was prohibited from doing that. The third thing I think we Mr. should Mr. Micah, ignorance of the law is no excuse. The law is Diversity. there. The rules are there. She has to follow it. Absolutely. Would you make your concluding statement so we can adjourn? A absolutely. But uh, another thing I'd like to look at is diversity in some of these agencies. Great. Th this agency we will do that. Thank you very much. Failed. Meetings adjourned. They failed. And you failed, too. <laughs>This morning, the former Chief of Staff to Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez testifies on Capitol Hill about his role in the firing of federal attorneys. Live coverage at 10 a.m. Eastern 